Okay, let's see if this is working. Uh, can you just give me one the, in the private chat or in the comments to see if you can actually hear me? So if the audio is on, because we are experiencing the usual fun uh, technical difficulties. But that's the good thing if you have like an army of volunteers all running these things in pajamas from their bedrooms. Uh, you will not get this anywhere else. Okay, so uh, we are already uh, at the correct time to start uh, the second block. And I can see that the first speaker of this afternoon is already waiting in the matchbox size preview window. So uh, we'd better get started with this. I'd like to welcome Mark Smith. He's a, a working as a full-time developer advocate at MongoDB and is a very experienced speaker. You may already have seen him at various Python conferences. His EuroPython talks are legendary and hard to get in room fillers. And um, when he's not presenting, he's, a ver he's very active on Twitter. Uh, which is where I think he is right now, because his little preview window just dropped. And on the Discord, I saw, uh-oh, internet has just gone down. Should be back in a moment. So, as I said, it, it's a fun, challenging thing to have these um, conferences running. And as I have a little more time now to do things, uh, what would you do if you were alone and you didn't have the speaker? Of course, you would thank our sponsors who help us um, making sure that something works here. And uh, so I will just run the 30 seconds uh, Microsoft ad and hope that Mark will be back after that. <laughs> I think the gods of the internet have been um, well. How you? How would you call that? They've been nice to us because Mark is back, and I'll uh, welcome him again. Hey, Mark. <laughs> Hi, Martin. Good to see you. I'm uh, so sorry about that. Just as you well, were about actually, to introduce me, my internet went down. <laughs> uh, actually, so then you missed out all the good things I told I said about you. You will have to watch that on YouTube then. <laughs> But as you, as you've you you, you you know you're an experienced speaker, so you've had all kinds of mishaps before, haven't you? Uh, so. Pretty much everything has gone wrong at some point or another. Um, yeah, and, I had and actually the conference. Yeah, sorry, the conference today is running pretty smoothly. We've done the EuroPython uh, as a virtual event, and uh, that was chaotic as well. So I'm kind of happy with this. Um, we'll have you later on as a panel discussion right after this. So for all of you watching this, if you have questions to Mark, put them in the chat. We will be able to uh, talk about these later. But for now, uh, let's try if we can get your screen on uh, this video as well. Excellent. And there it is. Wow, it worked. So are you ready to uh, start your presentation? Ready to go. OK. Um, um, enjoy and good luck, and I'll see you at the end of this. See you at the end. Hello, everybody. Um, so my name is Mark Smith, although I'm generally known as GG2K online. Um, I am a developer advocate for a database company called MongoDB that you may have heard of. And I've been asked to make something very clear. MongoDB, my employer, does not use or endorse any of the techniques demonstrated in this presentation. Furthermore, I do not use or endorse any of the techniques demonstrated in this presentation. Any harm you cause to your physical person or your career by using these techniques are entirely at your own discretion. On every computer I've had for the past 20 years, I've created a folder called Stupid Python Tricks. I use it to try out features of Python in ways that wouldn't get past a code review because they're too silly or just weird. I've lost some of this code over the years as I've moved from computer to computer, which makes me sad. But these days I store at least some of it in a GitHub project called Stupid Python Tricks that I will link to at the end. And every so often I like to take some of the code out, brush it off and show it to people to see how they respond. 
This talk is in two halves. There are essentially two stupid tricks here, but this uses a handful of techniques. And in each half, I'll try to describe the stupid thing that I'm trying to do, and then the thought process I took to actually getting it to work. So first, in a moment, I'll introduce you to a library I wrote called Ish. I wrote it for a lightning talk at Europython five years ago, and it was just purely a joke, but it was quite popular and has now had multiple contributors, and I think it's actually my most popular GitHub project. Um, which is, in, in many ways, says a lot about me. So, let's talk about types in Python. I like types, and Python's very forgiving with them, generally. For example, here's how you compare two Boolean values. As you'd expect, true is the same as true, and false is not equal to true, so comparing them gives false. And for historical reasons, one is also equal to true, and zero is considered equal to false. This is because early versions of Python didn't have a Boolean type, and so developers were forced to use an integer instead. Now here's where it starts to get interesting. If I compare a string containing the word true to the Boolean value true, that also works. Yes! The only problem is the word false also equals true. Uh, because because essentially any string with any content is true and an empty string is false. Oh, this is not ideal. Ideally, what we want is a value that's a bit like true or false, but a bit more understanding when you try and compare it to other values. Something that's not necessarily true, but true-ish. And this is the end result I want. I want to be able to suffix the word ish to either true or false or potentially some other values. And I want to be able to compare that to different values and get something sensible. Now, you may be sitting there wondering, why would I want to do this thing? And if you're asking that question, then you may be in the wrong talk. So, back to what I want. But first, let's take a small step backwards. So. Let's ignore the hyphen between true and ish for the moment, and let's just try to create a value called trueish that compares the way that we want it to. So, the first question is, how do I change the way the equals operator works? Let me show you what happens when you compare two values. So, behind the scenes, um, when you compare this string true to a trueish value that I haven't yet defined, first, it will call this, this dunder eq, this special method called eq, on the left-hand value, and it passes it, the right-hand value, as an argument. Now, if this eq method returns not implemented, which it will do because a string has never seen my imaginary true-ish type, it means that the string doesn't know how to compare itself to whatever true-ish is. So then, Python will have another go, but this time it will reverse the arguments and call uh, it will it will call it on the right-hand argument, but with the left-hand argument um, as, as an argument to the eq function. And if you're relatively new to Python, you may be thinking, how do I know this? Well, uh, oh, there's some arrows. How do I know this? Well, it's because it's described in this amazing document in the core Python documentation called the Python Data Model. It's quite a long document, but it's extremely well written, and it describes so much cool stuff that you can do with classes and different special methods and values in Python. So many of my stupid Python tricks ultimately come from something that I learned from this one document. I, I go back to it for silly reasons and sensible reasons frequently. So, here's the class I came up with. Um, there are definitely better ways to write this, and the real version is a bit longer, but it's at its heart, it's relatively simple. If the value that's been provided to this eq method looks truthy, so it's in this set of values that I've provided, then return true, because it's true-ish. If the value's falsy, so it's in the set of kind of false values that I've defined, then return false, because it's not true-ish. And finally, if you get a value that you isn't in either of these sets, then we don't really know what it is, so I'm going to raise a maybe error, because honestly, I thought that was funny. So, let's try it out. Um, because most special methods only work on instances, the first thing I have to do is create an instance of my true-ish class. And then I can check it against the true boolean, and yes, it works. And now I can compare it against the, a string containing word true. And again, it works. But to, to be honest, this works with true as well, as I demonstrated before. So let's check it, check it with some false values. So we we'll compare it against the false boolean, and it says false. And then finally, the thing that didn't work with, with true, and does work with true-ish, if you compare it against the string false, you get a false value back, because this is falsy and not true-ish. True and so comparing this is false. 
And finally, to compare it against some nonsense, I compare it against the string lemons, and it raises a maybe. So, okay, I'm kind of done, but, but not quite. The way I wanted to use this was hyphenated, as I showed you at the beginning, like this. So here's the syntax I sent out, set out at the beginning. And you can see that this expression looks like a hyphen, but actually it's a minus. It's a subtraction operator. Subtraction works in a similar way to equality behind the scenes, but it's slightly different. So, when I attempt to subtract this ish variable from the value true, first it calls the sub special variable, special method, on the true value and passes it the right-hand side uh, of the expression as its argument. And if that returns not implemented, which it will because the Python core developers never expected to subtract an ish from true, then it tries it the other way around, only this time it calls rsub instead of sub. rsub is the, is the subtraction method, but with the arguments reversed. So this time it's being called on the right-hand argument, again with the left-hand argument as, its, as the method argument. Um, so I need to implement this for my ish class. It's a new class called ish. Um, and again, it's relatively straightforward. Basically, if ish is being subtracted from true, then I return a true-ish, which I showed you before, and if it's false, I return a false-ish. Now, I haven't defined false-ish, but it's just the same as the true-ish that I showed you before. It just returns the opposite results. And then again, because I need an instance, I've um, instantiated ish class and assigned it to my ish variable, which is the suffix that we will be using later on in the code. So let's put this to work. So first, I'll subtract ish from true, and the result is a true-ish instance, so this is looking pretty good. If you were paying attention, then you know that true-ish can be compared to the string true, um, and that will return true. And if we compare true-ish to false, we get false, and finally, if we compare our false-ish to false, we get true. So this is now working. And this code um, has been extracted and simplified from this stupid library I wrote, which is on GitHub. Um, so if you enjoyed this, I recommend you check it out. It's uh, called Ish. Um, it was separate. It was originally my stupid Python tricks repo, but it was separated out because I kept getting submissions for it and it kept getting bigger. Um, for example, it does a few things that this code doesn't. For example, it supports slang and some words from different languages. That's relatively straightforward. Those words were just added to the um, to the data structure that stores the true or false values. But it can also do fuzzy numeric comparisons. So you can compare numbers, uh, especially floating point numbers, that are slightly different, and it'll just assume that they're the same value if they're within a margin of error. And finally, although I've removed this code to simplify things, if you go back through the Git history, you'll find some code that my friend Jeffrey French added that added a neural network to the library that allowed you com to compare images data to emotions like happy and sad and it would tell you if the person in the photo roughly matched the emotion that you uh, specified. So that was kind of cool but it also added um, megabytes of data and a whole bunch of dependencies to the library so I took it out to kind of simplify what was really going on. So the core thing that I've been getting at for this part of the talk is that these special or dunder methods uh, and things like that are ways of changing the way Python behaves in subtle ways. In this case we were changing the way that operators behave in Python in ways that weren't necessarily um, planned by the language designers. They're a way of opening a hatch into the Python language and just kind of changing things. So what have we covered in this half? Well, I've shown you how you can change the way equality works with your objects by implementing dunder eq. I've also shown how you can overload subtraction, so you can use the minus as a hyphen. Pathlib does the same thing with the division operator to allow you to join paths together, so this is uh, very much a blessed Python technique in the core library. And finally, you know about the Python data model document which describes much of the magic you can do with Python. And now, moving on to the second part of the talk, which I call Fun with Math. If you want a reasonably accurate version of Pi, you can access it through the math module, and here's what it looks like. Now, unfortunately, you probably know that that's not an exact value of pi. Because everybody knows the correct value of pi is 3. And fortunately, because of the way that Python works, we can fix it. So we can fix the math module's behavior. If you import math, then you can just assign a new value to math.pi. And that means that in other parts of your code base, after this point, if you import math and then print out the value of pi, you will get the correct value of pi, which is 3. Now, unfortunately, I've discovered in code bases where I've done this that for some reason my fellow developers can get upset. So, 
it's better to sneak in the correct value of pi over time in a way that other developers won't notice. So this is what I want. What I want is to be able to import math and then every time I access math.py, I want to get a different value from the previous time. The idea is that value is different every time you access math.py and this way I can program it so that math.py gets closer and closer to the true value of 3 over time. And again, you may be asking yourself, why? Why do you want to do this thing? And I would say, don't worry about it. Just, let's, just, let's just go along with it. So the code could look a bit like this. So the code to implement my, my pi, uh, my different values of pi, I could import the math module just so I can get the initial value of pi and store that away. And then each time I call my pi function, it'll return a slightly different value of pi. Now I'm not currently calculating a value that will get closer to three just to kind of simplify um, the function here. This is just adding a very small number to pi each time. And um, so what does it look like to use this code? Well, um, I would import my math module, and my math module has a function called pi, so I just execute pi a few times, and I get a different value each time. But So it's kind of close to what I described, but what are those? Um, those aren't supposed to be there. That's not in the real math module. Um, I have to call this function, and math.py isn't a function, like the original math.py. So I need it to be a function like this, but I don't want it to look like a function when it's called. Just accessing pi should cause it to be executed. And fortunately, Python, wonderful language that it, that it is, has a construct for that. It's the property decorator. Now, the only problem here is that the property decorator doesn't work on functions. It works on methods that are attached to a class. Um, so let's go with this. What I need is to put this function inside a class. So let's move it into a class called new math and it's still got the property decorator. So let's see what it's like to use this class. So first I instantiate the class to get my math object and then you can see that it behaves the way that I want. Every time I access pi behind the scenes it's calling the function, calculating a new value and returning me um, a slightly different value of pi. Result. This looks very close to what I want but this is wrong. Um, in order to get this math object, I have to create um, an instance of the new math class, whereas I should be getting it by just importing the math module. So let me introduce the modules dictionary in the sys package. Now, every time you import some Python code, that package that you've just imported, that module is added to the sys.modules dictionary. Um, let me demonstrate how that works. So if I look up math in the sys.modules um, dictionary at the start of my Python script, then it fails because this code, no code in this program has, add, has imported math yet. Um, this is a separate program to what I've been showing you before. So now um, if I import math um, and then when I do the same thing, look up math in the modules dictionary, it's there. It returns this module type. Um, and I can check that that is the same thing as I just imported by, by literally doing an equality check against it. And yes, that thing that's returned by sys.modulesmath is my math module that I imported. So they're the same thing. And here is an introduction to a secret in Python that makes it so wonderful for writing stupid code. Is that almost everything in Python is mutable. And because it's mutable, you can change it. So. Let's manually modify the contents of sys.modules. So here I've just, I'm just accessing it like the dictionary that it is, and I'm inserting an instance of my new math class. Um, instead of giving it a module, it, I'm just giving it this instance that I defined before. It doesn't care. It's just a dictionary of stuff. Um, I can put anything I want into this dictionary. Duck typing, baby! So. Now, I can import math, but because it's already in sys.modules, it's got something in there. Python thinks that math has already been loaded, so it doesn't go looking for a math.py file anywhere. It just returns what's in sys.modules. It's my new math object. So now I've replaced math in my Python program. Um, and this, this code to, to add new math uh, to the modules doesn't have to be in the client code. The code using new math, it can be in the module itself. So you can just add it at the end here after you defined your class and this swap can be done like basically on importing this module and once it's swapped in the real math module will never be um, imported by any code it would this object that I've defined here will be returned so now as long as my math helper module that I just showed you is imported somewhere in the code base anything that imports math after that will get the wrong or 
maybe the right thing. And so when they access pi, each time they'll get a gradually more correct value. So now we're done. But wait, there's more. I have a problem. It turns out that math doesn't just contain a value for pi. It contains a bunch of mathematical functions, including, say, the seal function for providing a ceiling um, on a floating point number. Now, if ceiling is missing, then my colleagues may notice that I've corrected the value of pi uh, across the whole code base. Um, so it's probably important to add ceiling to my math object. So I can go back to my new math class and I can implement ceiling. Um, I can just get it to call the real ceiling method in the math module, which I've got here with an underscore at the front. So um, that solved this problem. So now I'm done. Unfortunately, not quite. So I had a look at the documentation for the math module, and um, it turns out it's really big. Uh, did you know that mathematicians had learned so much stuff? It was a surprise to me. I was, I was never really paying attention in math class. So at this point, I realized I was going to have to implement a stub for every single thing in the math module. And it, I mean, to be honest, this was done as a joke originally, so this started to get quite boring. And then I started to think maybe I could loop through everything in the math module and automatically add each of those things to my new math class. But that also was a bit fiddly to add a loop to my code. So I decided to take a step back and think about what's really going on here. Let's go back and have a look at my call to ceiling. There are actually two operations in this piece of code. Uh, the first is to look up the ceiling attribute on the math object. And the second, once you have a reference to the ceiling attribute, is to call that attribute, because the attribute is a method. So what I need to do is change what happens in the first step here, when I look something up on my new math object, so that it passes those attribute lookups through to the real math module. Let me introduce you to getAtter if you haven't come across it before. It's a special method that you can implement on a class, and behind the scenes, Python will call it if you attempt to access an attribute which isn't, does, isn't actually available on that type. So if I try to access lemons on an object that doesn't have a lemons attribute, then behind the scenes, Python will call the getAtterDunder method with the string lemons, which is the name of the thing that it's looking up. So I need to implement this method on my new math class and tell it that it should look up each item on the real math module when it's called. So that way, if I try to access pi, I get my mo new modified pi because that is defined on the new math type, but everything else is just passed on to the real math module behind the scenes. And this is really a one-line function. So this is how I implemented it. It's uh, internally, it's using the getAtter function, which is not the same thing as the dunder getAtter method. Um, getAtter is just a utility function that looks up things on whatever you pass it. So here I'm passing it math and asking it to look up whatever's called name. So whatever the value of name is. Um, so there's some other stuff I should do to this class to make it look more like the original math module. Some of this is done in the stupid Python tricks code um, that I don't have here. Um, I should, for example, get it to reuse the docs attribute of the uh, underlying math module. I should probably implement repr to make it look more like the real thing if I print math out on the screen, or if one of my colleagues does to try and find out why they're not getting the value of pi that they expect. Feel free to take this code as a starting point and see how far you get. So what have I covered in this half? Well, firstly, modules and objects are basically interchangeable. You have to modify sys.modules dict to insert an object into it but instead of using import, but that's basically it. There's nothing particularly difficult about it. Modules can't use the property decorator, but objects can. And if you put an object where people expect a module to be, then you can get behavior that's um, unexpected in fun ways. Almost everything in Python is mutable, except some things that it turns out behind the scenes are implemented in C, for performance reasons mainly. Uh, it can be a struggle to change those types that are mostly immutable, but it's just another challenge in your sort of um, your stupid Python learning experience. There are often ways around it in one way or another. And finally, you discovered how to magically create any attribute you like when it's requested. It could be, for example, quite fun to implement this in a way that allows you to misspell method names when calling code and have everything still work by looking up the nearest method name um, to, the, to the misspelling.
This code is, or something like it, is also on GitHub in a project that I call Stupid Python Tricks. There's a bunch of stuff in there, including some more advanced tricks using things like meta classes and directly implementing the descriptor protocol, but most of it takes advantage of things I've covered here today, modifying things you're not supposed to modify and using dunder values in way they weren't, ways they weren't designed for. You don't have to be a Python expert to write weird and wonderful code, um, you just have to have some time and the urge to be creative. There are some other opportunities, but because of the technical problems at the start, I don't really have time to kind of flick through these, but the, you should check out the descriptor protocol, which is another kind of core thing about Python. Eval is fun, you can build up strings and execute them. Um, as code. Meta classes are super fun, um, but I really don't have time to cover them in a 25 minute talk. I did give a 70 minute talk on classes and meta classes at PyCon Australia last year that I think provides a pretty good introduction to how they work if you really want to get started with messing with these. Uh, the dis package allows you to disassemble Python bytecode, modify it, and then recompile it again and insert it into your code base. Um, a friend of mine, Sebastian Nowak, has used that to implement GoTo um, in Python, uh, which was like super cool, but also so complicated I find it difficult to understand what's going on. And finally, um, check out import lib for changing the way that Python finds and loads code at runtime. Um, this is also reasonably complex, but would allow you to, for example, just directly import code that isn't even written in Python into a Python program. There are so many opportunities to write terrible Python code on purpose. So let me uh, answer why I try to do this sort of thing. For me, it's an opportunity to try out a feature of the language that I may not have a use case for yet. It's a puzzle. Um, you can work out what you want to achieve and try and work towards it, or you can learn a new feature and see if inspiration strikes for weird and, weird and wonderful ways for misusing that feature. Um, I've made friends online who I swap weird techniques with, so it can be a good way to meet new, smart, and interesting people. But mainly, I do it for the reaction I get when I show someone the code or post it on Twitter, because I just love to hear someone say, but why? Thank you very much for listening, and I'm sorry for wasting your time. For more stupid Python tricks, please follow me on Twitter. Yeah, not only for stupid Python tricks, but for any many other insights as well. <laughs> like for example, Sometimes the, useful. yeah, well, you had this great thing about MongoDB about everything that was wrong with it, or like what people thought about it. And I read the thing, and uh, yep, I thought some of these things as well, and so that was highly educational. I like that. Uh, sh we have uh, like some comments, people, for example, uh, Richard here, let's see if this works, uh, says that Eve was a great way to introduce security evil, of course. It, it, and it, it uh, is if you don't trust the strings that are being compiled. So if you generate your own strings, then they can be relatively secure. A uh, named tuple used to be implemented using eval in the core Python code base. It was written by Raymond Hettinger, I believe. Um, yeah. It now doesn't use that technique, but yeah, it's uh, they're, they're useful. But it's, it. it's fun that the word evil is so close to evil. <laughs> so <laughs> That is very true. Yeah, and of course we have the other comment like... Uh, like so, we have, we have a math conspiracy theory. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so actually, actually, I, I'm tempted to do a, a pull request on your ish code because uh, I think uh, you're counting pi up by zero dot dot one every time it's read, so it will never reach three. So the code's not working. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I just simplified that equation because I didn't want to have to explain the math. Even though it's relatively straightforward, it's just more code to put on the screen. And I'm quite aware that when somebody puts up like a big block of code on the screen, just trying to even work out what you're supposed to be looking at can be tricky. So, yeah. Um, so anyway, that, that was a lot of fun. And uh, I think uh, like if you want to take like a little break, you can. But uh, if not, we will just slide over to the next scheduled item and welcome our two other speakers um, because this is going to be um, like a de developer advocate power meeting because uh, as a second uh, developer advocate uh, let's welcome uh, Tanya Allard she was already talking uh, today and she's a senior developer advocate at Microsoft and uh, let's see can I add it to the screen yeah. Hey. Hello. So I have you on the screen. You did you did this great talk about getting started with JupyterLab extensions. So 
I, I'm looking, I love JupyterLab and I'm looking forward to being able to do my own extensions as well at some point. So let's, let's see how that works out. I'll, I will follow that <laughs> and w watch it again to see that I um, understand everything. And as a third person for today, uh, we have another uh, developer advocate and uh, that's, that's our own Lace uh, Cavalho. She is a newbie developer advocate. She She's a final year IT student. Her background is on civil and environment engineering. She's a board member at Python Island uh, who are helping us uh, with this conference. And she was uh, part of the organization of EuroPython and PyData Data Dublin. So let's welcome our presenter as a panelist. Hey. Hello. And there she is. Hello there. Can you hear me? Is everything okay? Yep. Yeah, I think so we can. Hey all and uh, Lace, you're gonna host this panel, so yes. go ahead. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Martin. Thank you for the introduction as well. Uh, hello, Mark. Hello, Tanya. It's awesome to have you here. Hi, Lace. Great to see you. Hi. Great to see you too. I, I speak to you a lot on Twitter, both of you. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> finally put a face on the name and hear your voices as well. It's really good. Uh, cool. So for everyone that is watching us, uh, we have a channel. If you have questions, if you're in Discord and you'd like to post your questions, we have a channel uh, on discussions called Developer Advocacy. Uh, you're welcome to go there and leave your questions and tag Tanya and Mark as well. Um, so with no further ado, let's start then. So uh, this is the a deep dive into the Python community discussion panel. So I'm going to start then asking you, uh, since you're both very engaged on the Python community, um, I would like to start asking, how did your Python journey start? Who should go first? Uh, I'll let Mark go for his first <laughs> one. <laughs> oh, no, I'm old. It's going to go on for ages. <laughs> Um, I was originally a Java programmer, um, so I, I did. Uh, I went to university to study uh, computer science. I found it incredibly tedious, and the dot com boom started, um, sort of in the mid to late nineties. And so I dropped out of university and then um, tried to get a job, which was harder than I expected. But, I mean, I was pretty naive at the time. I eventually, found myself a job, and those, I mean, it helps a lot when you've got your first job to get a second job. Um, but yeah, this was all Java programming, and then. I started uh, working for a company in London called E Street, um, which was actually the biggest website in London for a while. Uh, and there was a lot of data management. And Java is not great for writing scripts to sort of manipulate data. And so I taught myself Perl. Um, and uh, Perl was great. I mean, it was just amazing. I hadn't realized it could be so easy to just kind of open up files, rip data apart, put it, to back, put it back together in different ways, and then load it up into a database. Um, but over time, that code can become quite difficult to maintain. I mean, that is nowadays Perl's real reputation. It's slightly crazy, but and, and your code can only be read once. Um, so I started looking around for another language. I found Ruby. Um, unfortunately, Ruby at the time only had one book in the English language that was Ruby in a Nutshell by O'Reilly, and everything else was in Japanese, and I didn't read Japanese. And also, it was really slow. It was actually great. I kind of preferred it at the time to, to Python. I had had a quick look at Python, seen it had significant indentation, and then thought, no, I'm going back to another language. Um, but because Ruby was so slow, I, I gave Python another look, and I've never really looked back. Like It was just incredible. I, 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 after one day of using it, I didn't care about the significant indentation anymore. And over the, I mean, this was back in 2000, over the last um, 20 years, the amount of libraries out there to make it easy to use stu stuff, like for even everything from database drivers to file formats to Jupyter, for example, it, it, it's just, it's the, the best glue language that there is. Um, so yeah, that's that's how I. Oh, and, but, but I didn't get a job doing Python really until about ten years ago, um, because there weren't any jobs doing Python <laughs> until about ten years ago, um, and I realised that I need. You talked about the community. It's like I realised that if I was going to contract as a Python developer, I needed to be able to find new contracts, and there was no real Python community in Edinburgh, so I set up the Python Edinburgh user group um, just so I could meet other Python developers, just as an opportunity to get more work, and that totally changed my life really in terms of like, especially the move to developer advocacy which I, I guess we'll be talking about for later on in this talk um 
But uh, yeah, so I, Python and the community thing sort of really went together as a career, just naturally. Yeah, it is the best part of the Python community. Is the, the, of Python is the community. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, cool, and Tanya, how was it for you? Um, yeah, well, I don't. I didn't come from a computer science background. I'm actually a mechatronics engineer from formation, um, which is like a mixture of all the engineers, all the engineering there. So like mechanics, uh, mechanical engineering, electronics, automation, uh, computer science, and like everything together. Um, but I started doing a lot of, well, back then we were using a lot of MATLAB, uh, C, um, I even learned like assembly or assembly. Um, it, it, it was, yeah, it's not my favorite, but it did open up like a new world of things that I could start doing with microprocessors and, and like assembling stuff. Um, but then I just carried on doing a lot of automation. I got into very interested in like optimization, uh, which is like a weird, like, Thing to, to be interested in. Um, and then when I was doing my PhD, a lot of my work was still like uh, on MATLAB, uh, Fortran. I did a lot of coding in Fortran. And I'm going to say for like modern Fortran is actually nice. It, it's actually good. Um, but then I eventually came, I think it was like during my PhD that I just bumped into the Python, the scientific Python ecosystem. Um, and all of these amazing libraries, it, it was fascinating to me, like being able to have uh, everything automated, like all my data analysis, generate all my outputs, uh, like all my plots, and then be able to just like link that to my LaTeX um, PhD thesis. So, like I just became like an automation nerd, like try to, as soon as I would upload new data, I generate like whole, the whole new analysis, all the outputs, recompile my thesis, have like an up-to-date version of that. Um, and like the same with my papers. So that was um, basically how I fell in love with scientific, with the scientific Python ecosystem. Um, and also because Something that I was lacking during my PhD was a sense of community because um, I was the one in my lab doing computational work. A lot of like my other lab peers were mostly doing experimental work, but mine was much more on the optimization and modeling side of things. Um, so I came up, well, I just found the software carpentry folks, uh, joined that community and then realized that there was like a whole Python community out there. Um, so I just started joining meetups, user groups, uh, going to conferences, talking to just like random Pythonistas on Twitter. Um, and since then, I've, I've never, never looked back. Um, and I think one of the, the reason why is because I did feel like I belonged, although I was doing like scientific stuff and doing like PhD using Python, um, I found like people that were like, oh yeah, that's actually cool. Then like willing to help me. And that is something that I never had in my PhD because I was the weird one doing other stuff. Um, yeah, and since then I've been involved in the Python community in so many different ways, many different levels within the UK and like globally as well. Um, yeah, I think that that's how I came to be part of of the Python community. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, like I, I feel the absolute same. It's like it's a permission to be the weirdo in the room and no one is judgmental about it. <laughs> so like you have authorization to spend, I don't know, a week just having a look at some Dunder methods and then just come up with like, look what I found. And then you can make a talk out of it. <laughs> That's very that much my experience. <laughs> that was my life last week, so I kind of understand it. Cool. Thank you very much for your answers. The thing I love about the Python community is you can reach out to some of the most senior people in this community, the absolute core of the core Python team, and ask them questions, sometimes dumb questions, and they will usually find time to help you. Um, and I always try to pay that back if people contact me with, with questions, even if they're not my speciality. It's like, if I can't solve it, then maybe I can put people in touch with somebody else that can. It's like, it's important to pass that on. Yes, build, helping other people build their network as well, because that's how they learn. And we kind of learn with that as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, 
What's the hardest thing you've ever done on Python? Oh, what's the hardest thing I've ever done in Python? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if, if, if it's the hardest thing in Python, but it's like converting an inner source project into open source. And it's like a whole, uh, it's a Python uh, project that is held, well, it's all on medical imaging processing and using deep learning uh, to do predictions based on, for example, CT scans or MRIs. I think the most challenging was like making that shift from inner source to open source uh, and convince folks and work with the team that it was worth making it like right from the start, making sure that it was inclusive for other folks in the community to start jumping in and contributing and raising issues. Um, we had a lot of talks like um, our documentation is not excellent our documentation is far from perfect so we're just gonna wait until it's better it's like no put it out there um because one of the nicest things things of the python community is like their willingness to help each other so they're of course they're gonna go and look at, at our documentation and they're gonna say like this is far from complete or or like from far from good um but they all help us find those holes and even fix them um and it, it's a pretty heavy uh, package, like technically I'm putting, the, doing the technical work together. Uh, well, doing the technical work of it is, is really, really hard. Um, but for me, that was the hardest part, playing the open source advocate um, when moving from inner source. Making it accessible was the hardest part. Okay, yeah, and best practice as well. And well, it, documentation. Okay. It's a kind of, it's a repeated thing, isn't it? That internal code is always worse than the stuff you publish as open source. I mean, I've learned so much for the way you package projects and document projects from the open source community and then tried to bring it internally. And, you know, I mean, it takes so much time. It's difficult to justify it when you've got a limited number of developers or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's the opposite thing. I don't know that I have, uh, I, it's really difficult. Like every Python project I've ever worked on has been challenging in its own way. And I think kind of um, user interfaces and user experience is probably the hardest bit just of the apps that I've built from a technical perspective. Um, but the thing that I, I can't get my head away from at the moment, so I can't give you a good answer for this, is I've got a stupid answer, which is I've, uh, I have I did this lightning talk five years ago that I've just given a talk based, just, just like half an hour ago, given a talk based on that lightning talk from five years ago. And I've had a sequel in my head for five years that I've been gradually working on. It's only going to be a page of code, but it's a page of code that basically is a changes to the Python language that make it look like Java, but it has to execute in Python. It's like a bunch of sort of clever tricks in Python code. Um, and it's so difficult that I've been kind of working at this, like I've got three major pieces to it and I've just been, I want, I want to make it validate the types as they go in and out of functions and things. And that's kind of fine. There's already libraries out there that will do that. I want to get rid of the self variable when you call a method or in, implement a method. And I've got a way to do that as well. Um, and uh, private methods and things like that. Just implementing a whole load of things that Java developers expect to have in Python that I expected to have when I learned Python. Um, and it's really fun. And it's, yeah, as I say, it's not a lot of code, but it's a lot of learning to get these things working. And I think one day I might be able to actually give this SQL lightning talk sort of this, this really stupid. <laughs> We're looking forward for that. Really, I, mean, I am really, really looking forward to that because, like, I've tried my first, um, my first proper Python application that wasn't even proper. Uh, I was trying; it was a college assignment. I was trying to get. Um, I, I learned Java beforehand, so the assignment was uh, build this application and make sure you use design patterns. So I was trying to use design patterns in Python, uh, but with a background in Java. <laughs> and a lot of them don't make sense in Python, do they? I did exactly the same thing. Is I would open up an empty Python file and implement a class from like the first, <laughs> first thing that I would do because that was just what I was used to. It took me, I think, probably five years until I was really writing what I now consider to be Pythonic code. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an ongoing. It's not easy, you know? It's an ongoing yeah. learning process to learn how to take advantage of a new language. Yeah, I'm on year two, so I, I'll tell you when I get there. <laughs> You'll get there. <laughs> Eventually, yes. Uh, yeah, so what about when you're trying to do, so that, that I'm gonna go for Tanya with this one. So Tanya, when you're trying to develop that 
application and putting through open source and like being the open source developer and the, the open source advocate for the project. And uh, did you get a lot of help from the community? Um, or like, did you get a lot of help from the Python, from the Python people you know that were not necessarily from the community? Um, how, how did you make that work? Uh, yeah, definitely. So I've, I have experience contributing to and maintaining open source packages. Um, but a lot of that experience has come from mentoring from others. Um, just like getting other folks that have been walking me through on how to make my project more inclusive, more accessible, friendlier, and, and like more approachable by fo uh, to folks. Um, but also, I think something, this is the first time that I actually tried to do something that was in source and then make it open source. So there were a lot of nuances and even just like basic licensing questions, I would say basic, uh, or just like implication, um, uh, some implications of going from inner source to open source that I is not aware. So it's just reaching out to other folks that I knew that had done something similar or had experience working in like company, like industry led or corporate led open source and um, to see how they go about it, what's their best, best practices, how do they encourage um, people from their own company, not only to contribute to just the company's open source projects, but further down into the, the open source community as a whole. Um, so yeah, I think, and I, it's always been my experience that folks are very, very willing to help and very willing to share their experiences, um, or pointing you to the, to, to the right person as well. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, now I have a few questions from the audience, but before I go for the, for the, to the questions from the audience, I want to ask you another question. And uh, there's actually my question. Um, how do you how do you folks contribute to open source having like a full time job? And uh, yeah, so do you get any is this MongoDB or Microsoft help you give any kind of support for you to uh, contribute to open source? How does that work being a developer advocate as well? Who is that aimed at? Let's start. Let's start with Mark this time. Sorry, <laughs> hang on <the> office. <laughs> um, so I don't contribute very much to open source. If I'm being honest, everything I develop um, for work is pretty much open source. Uh, if I'm developing tools on top of, for example, MongoDB, um, th those would usually be published as open source. Um, and I consider like my contribution to the community to be mostly through kind of education and documentation. So I my uh, the talks that I give, maybe the last one I gave just isn't a very good example, but normally I give talks about kind of how classes or functions or meta classes work in Python and things like that. And those are all essentially sponsored by the company. You know, I'm allowed to give talks that aren't about MongoDB at Python conferences because that's just, I mean, it's good for the company in terms of awareness of, of us being good people and having good people working for us. Um, but in other terms, I, 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 have, I have a kid and some pets and hobbies, so, so I don't actually have that much time to properly dedicate to submitting code to open source projects unless it's kind of a bug fix or something like that because I feel like there's a commitment there when you commit code to an open source project to as well as submitting it it's got to be maintained right and I think you're kind of giving a little bit of yourself to that project which I, it's absolutely incredible I really appreciate the people who can do that but I don't really have the spare space for it Cool. And then Tanya, how do you do it? Um, do you so I think it, uh, on one side, it's very similar to, to Mark's experience where uh, like educational content, outreach content, like uh, speaking at different conferences, uh, working on, I don't know, podcasts or Twitch streams, those fall within the remit of my core job as a developer advocate. Um, but I still kind of can justify doing some open source contributions in the sense, not always code, uh, but for example, I do, I sit in the global council for PyLadies and that also helps with the community. Um, I have some initiatives that I'm trying to, to work on uh, with Microsoft as a partner. So that like sits in both my roles as well. Um, and then I do a lot of, well, I, 
I organize mentor sprints, uh, which I've paused for a while now because I don't have time and it's coming to the holidays and stuff. Uh, but I try to balance whenever I have time, because um, I also have hobbies. I also have a dog and, and my dog is a lot of work. Um, but I try to to balance whenever I feel like I'm burned out, like burning out or I'm so tired or I just feel like doing something that makes me happy outside so, uh, open source I listen to myself and, and didn't just take that time to myself um, if I feel like I have all the spoons and like resources and I can dedicate times and, and and days to mentor others or be involved in governance or you know, organizing community things or contributing code um, I just like fit that into spare hours that I find throughout the week or weekends Okay, perfect. Well, it's been working. I know you're very, very active in the community. So thank you as well. Thank you for your hard work. Uh, now let's let's jump into questions from the audience. So Martin, hello, Martin. Uh, not the one that introduced us, another one that is also on EuroPython. Uh, so he is asking, how do you keep local Python communities together during this special time? now so there are so many online events does it make sense to add even more events to it let's start with that whoever wants to start come on okay i'm unmuted so i'll go <laughs> um i well i i i think we're so lucky in a way that this is happening now rather than 10 years ago when video conferencing didn't really work uh you know we we actually still can keep these communities alive rather than everybody being completely isolated um, and I think, I mean, as I say, I run the Edinburgh Python user group, not very efficiently at the best of times. Um, and we haven't met up since, uh, everything went virtual, partly just because it's very difficult to be motivated to do anything when we're all kind of stuck in our homes. But I do plan to run an event just to get that group of people together at some point in the near future so that they can kind of see what, what each other is up to, um, before, before we eventually hopefully get the chance to go and go back to being in person again. Um, but I think the, the thing that's, you, that's really important to remember is these video conferences are actually much more accessible than what we had before. You know, the idea of running an Edinburgh user group was simply because like, people from Edinburgh can't travel to London to go to the London user group every month. Um, whereas we can run an online user group here for everyone in our time zone and the time zones around it, you know, and this has been amazing for people, for example, in Africa who are able to attend events um, that they've never been able to attend before. Which, I mean, I hadn't initially thought about it until some of the people I, I follow on Twitter from that community are like, this is the first time I'm going to get to go to Europe, I think. This is the first time I'm going get to get to go to this conference because like, the price of flights is um, untenable, whereas um, some internet access for a few hours is 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 okay. So it's like, you know it's not so much that we have um, more or less opportunity now. Or rather, it's not that we should have more events. It's just that we should open those events wider. I think to incorporate some people that maybe weren't included before. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think I've been very very conscious, especially as. The year has come is coming to an end. I've been very, very conscious that also folks are coming to video conference or video call fatigue. I personally feel super fatigued. I don't know what it is about, um, but you like being constantly on calls all time, and then video conference, like having a whole four day conference all online, is just so much more exhausting than if I were there. Even though when I'm like in person, I spend so much time talking to people, running from one place to another, uh, drinking insane amounts of coffee. Um, probably the coffee. Probably I need more coffee. Um, <laughs> that's it. But I think it is. It is. It has been very interesting to see how shifting from in person to online has made all of these conferences much more accessible. Um, so I said, I've been very, very aware and conscious of not adding more uh, because also a lot of folks have been having to educate ho uh, kids at school. They had like people are sharing the same room. Sometimes people are working from the kitchen table or, or the floor or whatever. Um, so although they're also more accessible, we also have a complete 
chaotic life uh, living arrangement at the time. Uh, so I've been trying to be very, very mindful and not overburden neither my, my community organizers or, or my community. Um, I think. Wow, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I, I do have the feeling that we're being, although we are being more inclusive, they're, they're different and more diverse. The, well, pajamas was initially thought as that. So we're going to have, we're going to be able to get people from all over the world. And the idea came way before COVID actually got here. And uh, there was the idea of uniting everyone around the world, um, around the world and be able to like create this atmosphere where everyone just loves Python and we're able to share stuff and uh, we're able to meet as well. But well, uh, COVID got here before we did, but it's fine. <laughs> we're here now. Uh, so uh, Honey in the Developer Adequacy channel actually has three questions. I'm going to start with the most obvious one. Uh, and I would love if Tanya could start with this, uh, could start answering this one. So actually, what is a developer advocate? What are the roles and the technical responsibilities? And how can a person be skilled to that career level? Ooh, um, that is a deeply philosophical question because I think developer advocate or developer advocacy also changes a lot depending on where you're being a developer advocate. Um, and where within the organization you sit. Um, for example, I sit within engineering, but I know other folks that are developer advocates and they fall in marketing. Um, so the responsibilities and like how they measure success and impact is very different to the way we do it in engineering. Um, so I would say that my role is advocating on behalf of my community and my users, um, not advocating on behalf of my company, but I'm trying to understand what my users are doing, what the blockers are doing, how we are serving them or how we're not serving them. Um, and then help them with all of that experience. Some of that is help working very, very closely with our engineering teams on product and product roadmaps, implementing new features, all based on customer or community feedback, uh, understanding what tools we should prioritize or what programming languages we should prioritize to provide a better support. Uh, another big component is writing educational content. Um, either touching Azure products or just pure Python or data science or machine learning. Um, and then uh, another another part of that is like actual technical work, uh, taking issues, uh, working on demos. I do a lot of dog feeding, which is whenever we are releasing a new, uh, a new tool or a new feature or like a, a, a big version of a product. I do a lot of testing uh, compare with other tools that are out there to do something similar. Um, then report report back to engineering teams, work on scorecarding, uh, fixing bugs, and then rinse and repeat. Um, so it's, it's very technical, but still uh, a lot of that is on communication, like communicating with people, communicating with my communities, communicating with my engineering teams, uh, even with, with the marketing teams when we are, for example, sponsoring conferences, uh, making sure that we're not just, you know, giving money or, or slapping our logo in a conference, but actually bringing something to the community, making sure that we are we understand the community, that we have, I don't know, tutorials or it, talks that are relevant to them, um, enhancing their enhancing our presence and the value that we bring to the to the conference as much as possible i'd add to every not add i i agree with everything that tanya says that is that, that and it's so much clearer than the way i would have fumbled my way through answering that question um the only i mean the 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 thing I really liked about the way you answered that question was you started off with essentially uh, you're the one that understands your users and kind of feeds that back internally. I think um, many people think of developer advocacy as being a thing that's outward facing. Hey, I build toy projects and I, I try and try and make them go viral or I write blog posts and stuff like that. Whereas um, at the very least, half the role is really to be the user or to talk to the users and feed their their 
that information back internally. Um, and that's actually made the job really, really difficult this year because in the past, I used to go to these conferences and drink too much coffee and talk to people who either wanted to use MongoDB or are using MongoDB or don't want to use MongoDB and find out why and what they're having trouble with um, and things they might want to do. Um, there and then feed that back internally or just build that in as, as something that we understand internally. And it's very difficult to just have those conversations with, you know, random people <laughs> at the moment. It's I can schedule talks with people if I know them. Um, but you don't get that serendipity that you get when you're at a conference or something like that. It's, um, and it's, it, yeah, it's making the job really hard. Um, The trips as well, right? The traveling part of the job that also changed a lot with COVID. Oh, that bit's um, easier. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that jet lag is the one thing I don't miss. Yeah. Uh, yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, like I was reading, someone was saying one of these days that like the whole thing about the, the three pillars of developer advocacy seem to be, co um, it's the three C's. So it's code, content, and community. Um, and then as long as we can, figure out a way of contributing to those three core pillars, then we're on the good track. And then adding to that is the communication as well. That is not really trivial. It's not really fundamental for it. I mean, it's discussable, but uh, apparently it's not really fundamental as a developer advocate, but it helps a lot. So I love the what how wide ranging the role is because I mean, I started as an engineer, but now I have to know a little bit of marketing sales support you know, it's it's like it's such a wide ranging role. And so it's very difficult to get bored because there's so much to it. Of course, uh, the flip side is it's very easy to get burned out because there's just so much stuff going on at the same time. So, yeah, it's, it's yeah. It, but if you do, if you like people and you're a developer and you like communication, then it's it's an absolutely fantastic role. Yeah. And also I have to to add here, you don't have to be an extroverted to be a developer advocate like also, you, there are many, there is so many ways in which you can reach out to communities and folks out there, um, and you just need to find the content strategies that work for you. Um, I know some folks are like written content machines. For example, in my team, I have a a colleague, and like he just writes, creates like blog posts and and, and tutorials, like left to right all day, all year long. Um, but th that is a workflow that doesn't work for me. Uh, I tend to to change and vary the kind of content that I produce depending on how I feel and I, what I'm working on. Um, but also when it comes to like the, the public perception of developer advocacy, I think a lot of folks think, oh, well, they just travel around, they just spend the time talking to people, drinking insane amounts of coffee, um, and it's so glamorous. But I think th those for, those are the smallest portions of a developer advocate role. They're probably the most visible, um, but I would say that is, I don't know, 20, 30% of the actual role. Um, and it's definitely not the hardest. Except for the jet lag. Yeah, except for the jet lag. <laughs> <laughs> but like, jet lag is probably, yeah, you, you can sometimes like trick jet lag. Um, I remember one time that I was on Twitter and GitHub, it must have been like, I don't know what time it was, um, like four o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, but I was so awake. I was in Americas. So I was just working. Um, and someone's like, isn't it like ridiculous early where you are? Like, yeah, but my buddy doesn't know that. So <laughs> I'll just make the most of this time. <laughs> yeah, that, sounds, that sounds something we can all relate to. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> working in the middle of the night. Uh, and do you have any any suggestions maybe or any tips for someone that is studying and would like to become a developer advocate? Let you decide the order. I'm not the <laughs> Go for it. I, I find that a really difficult question to answer because I kind of fell into developer advocacy. There was a job post um, on an, a Scottish mailing list um, from somebody who'd really tried to hire an advocate and really struggled to get any decent candidates at all. Uh, apparently I was that person, which was a surprise to me. Um, and they listed, it was a terrible job out of it. They listed so many things that they required in the list. Um, 
uh, and they were, it said at the top, you know, any of these, we don't, we don't want all of them, but I did have all of them, like every single one in this sort of 20 item bullet, bullet list. And so I just sort of had to apply for the role. It was everything I enjoy doing. Um, but having said that, everybody comes to it from a, a different place, right? Um, as Tanya said, there are people who don't like public speaking and there are still advocacy roles for them. Um, everyone in my team has a different speciality, just naturally. There are some people who love video. There's one guy who's actually a TikTok star. Um, and uh, there's, there's, uh, there's people who like writing. Um, and then there's the community people, the people who just live for, for helping people get answers to their problems or introducing them to other people or um, starting up meetup groups and whatever. And we have specialisms for all of those places, um, which is, so it's really, if you think you overlap in any way with that role of advocacy of being a user and feeding that back internally or representing the company to developers outside, then, you know, there's, there's probably a good fit there. The difficulty is when it comes to finding the right company to work for, like the company that's actually doing something that you care about, like essentially promoting or making better as a product. Um, and so, you know, it can take a while. Um, and I know some people who come from it from not a huge amount of engineering experience either. You know, there are very experienced engineers. And then there are people who have come straight out of a boot camp into successfully into advocacy roles. You know, that there's no fixed route into this. Um, it's it's more like if you want to if you want to do it, talk, find some advocate, advocates, especially ones you admire or you think have a similar skill set to yourself and talk to them about how they got into it and maybe get some recommendations as well, because it's not actually a big discipline. There's, there's not that many people doing it. And so everybody knows everybody um yeah so it was a bit rambling but that was my answer <laughs> <laughs> okay so it's basically apply and find a mentor yes cool. good it's, gosh you're so good at this <laughs> the three c's <laughs> yeah. and now it's just summarizing my entire my <laughs> waffle into two words <laughs> that, that is like like lace superpower just like concise summarizing all of our rambling <laughs> Come on, it, it, it is like perfect communicate. Like it's a perfect communication skill as well. So, yeah, Jerry there. Um, but yeah, I think a lot is also understanding um, why you want to do developer advocacy. Um, like like having a, a deep understanding on what of developer advocacy actually drives you to that. Um, for me, I don't know. Like I. I don't think I ever had the thought, oh, I want to become a developer advocate. Um, it just fell into, I started seeing these folks like developer advocates at conferences and places. Um, I got to talk to a, a couple of them. It's like, so what do you do? Um, and it's like, oh yeah, that sounds like something I could do. I like I like coding. I like community. I like organizing stuff. I, I wear way too many hats at all time. That sounds like it's something I could do. Um, and it just so happened, actually, it was on Twitter. I found that Microsoft was hiring developer advocates in, in the UK. And it's like, oh yeah, um, I'll just give it a shot and see what, what's going. But I already knew also developer advocates at Microsoft. So I was also were, well aware of what they were doing, uh, what the focus of advocacy was. Um, so I was kind of in the safe route there as well. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and your thoughts on developer advocacy. Uh, I think we should switch a little bit more right now because we're having a few questions about, uh, well, C, Someone mentioned C, so there is always C Python in the middle, <laughs> in the middle of the questions. Then there is a few people asking as well about um, advice for starting with Python. So let's jump right, super quick into that. Uh, so Honey is also saying that he loves the simplicity and re human readability of Python um, when it comes to system programming. Regarding the deterministic nature of Python. Um, you read somewhere that Python is not much popular for doing deterministic tasks like C. And do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I'm assuming, given Honey's embedded software backgrounds, that this is a question really about MicroPython and CircuitPython and the way they behave. Um, so it's true that like, it's not as deterministic it's um yeah you know, because it runs in a virtual machine with some sort of garbage collector um and so yeah you you can't necessarily predict its exact behavior but the thing you have to 
um, ask yourself is, does that matter to you? It's, like, it's going to take a lot longer to write that software in C. And if you're prototyping, or if you just don't care about the deterministic behavior of your code running on a, um, a microcontroller, then actually that's probably not a problem for you. Um, there's lots of projects out there now where the chips are being programmed in MicroPython and then being produced commercially and distributed. It's not a toy uh, language for embedded programming. So um, yeah, it's 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 about whether it matches your needs, not necessarily, it's, it's not a be all and end all. It's not like this is the only way to do it. It's, is this the right way to do it for you? Cool, thank you. And Tanya, would you like to compliment on that or are you good? Um, no, I am good. I think that was, a very nice uh, response by Mark. <laughs> I'm just hoping I'm answering the right question. <laughs> uh, well, honey, if it is not, um, yeah, no, so, no, not really. <laughs> Embedded people have moved core systems now. Uh, he works in four core, but I'm not sure. I think maybe you should just have a chat, uh, Mark and honey, on Discord later on. So yeah, think we can have yeah let's do that. Yes. And we, we can bring in the circuit Python folks as well. <laughs> <laughs> and Tanya, there's also people saying that they would love to be part of the mentored sprints. Yes. Um, yes. yes. <laughs> Join <laughs> the mentored sprints. Yes. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that, actually? Yeah. So um, I started mentored sprints because I've been to a lot of conferences um, and it's very common in the Python community that after the core conference days, there is a developer sprint. So folks just stay around for a couple more days and like contribute to open source, pro uh, to open source projects. But it's also a very good opportunity for maintainers to get together and discuss uh, projects. Um, but when you are brand new to contributing to open source or never had a chance to do it, uh, or even if you're very very new to the Python community, sometimes it's very hard to justify having an extra two or three days after a conference to your employer or even to afford like extra accommodation or stuff. Um, so it all started about, I was thinking how we can make this sprints more accessible and more suitable for beginners. Um, so I started running them during the core days of conferences. Um, and because maintainers and uh, frequent contributors to projects were already attending the conferences, um, it was a good way to get folks that were already experienced with the projects, with the language to come in, share some of their expertise and mentor folks like have mentored contribution, like live one-to-one or, I don't know, five-to-one um, guided contributions. So they not only learned more about the code base and the development experience and the contributing experience, uh, but actually had a supporting environment uh, that would help them to make meaningful contributions. Um, and I also wanted to kind of demystify, dem yeah, demystify? Yeah, uh, or, or change the perception that the most important contribution you can make to an open source project is code. Um, so whenever I talk to the projects that are interested in being involved in mentor sprints, I do highlight that uh, they have to bring a wide range of uh, issues or tasks to work in. Um, not everything has to be code. Uh, we've had folks that were asking for a tutorial to be written. Uh, we had folks from CircuitPython when we were uh, doing in-person events and they brought like little, well, just like little items and people were just having a blast trying these new products or trying the new library or tutorials. Uh, we've also had some folks that wanted design specific uh, stuff or UX uh, advice. So we've had just like all sorts of contributions um, and the idea is, is that, that we're going to give beginners have never had the, uh, the opportunity to contribute to open source, uh, to have a mentor, uh, to get started in the world, familiarize with the project, uh, and then we also provide support to those mentors on an advice on how to make their, their project much more accessible uh, for new contributors as well. 
Thank you. And uh, do you have any plans? Do you know when the next edition is going to happen or if it's going to be in person or um, online? So the last mentor experience have been online um, and I want to continue doing that online. Actually, we were working on a community handbook on how to run your own virtual mentor sprints um, that's open source and anyone can contribute to that. And I hope that in January uh, we're going to resume. We had plans for November, but that just went out the window. Um, so January, we'll have more online mentor sprints. Perfect. Thank you. Um, then uh, let me ask you. So I'm going to ask Mark this time then. So Mark, since you started with uh, Java and then you jumped into Python, what was what were the best like the, the best the best ways to learn Python? And is there any projects you recommend for people there that for folks they're like starting now or they want to learn a little bit more? And then Tanya, if you want to compliment anything on that, please feel free. Okay. So, um Obviously, it was quite a long time ago that I learned. Um, I, it was difficult at the time because Python 2 had just been released and all the books were for Python 1. <laughs> um, so I had to kind of translate what was in the book into what actually worked in the modern Python interpreter. Um, I, I learned from Learn Python, um, which uh, is a, a much thicker book these days. Um, and I, I don't I don't know if the new edition's any good, if I'm being being honest, there are a lot of books out there that are really good. I It, it depends on your learning style, right? I really like to read books. Um, I don't particularly like watching videos to learn stuff, which is ironic given that that's part of my job to go to conferences and speak. Um, but uh, the, I think the second part of your question is the most important thing, like, that you have to have a project. You can't just read a book. You have to be building something. Um, and it doesn't have to be original. It probably shouldn't be a to-do list because that doesn't actually teach you very much um, about what you're learning. Um, but try and find, especially if you want to do web development, find a site that you like, whether it's, I don't know, Facebook, Instagram, um, something like Trello, and try and try and build something similar to that. It doesn't have to be like hugely complex to start off with, but you'll find that as you solve the initial problems, like just to get something working, you'll start to find new problems that need to be solved until you've got something quite rich. Um, they can be toy projects over a long period of time if you want to, if, that, if, if that's something that keeps you going. But um, if you can also find a project that, I mean, potentially might make you money, um, it's worked, worked out for my wife when she was learning to program um, in that she found a dance studio that needed a booking site. And so she built one um, and that's still being maintained six years later, like very much maintained, whole new versions being released with whole new features. Um, and it involved kind of integration with payment systems and things like that that are totally non-trivial. Um, and unless you, you won't attempt the difficult stuff unless it kind of comes into your path. So attempting something kind of non-trivial is, you know, it, it, I, I think it's a good way to learn. Um, Yeah, I totally agree. I've, I've tried in the past going through like reading, well, learning from books or, or blog posts or tutorials. Um, but I have always found that I learned the most by doing like learning with a purpose. Um, when I was doing my PhD, of course, my, my ultimate goal was getting my analysis done and have a reproducible automated PhD thesis. Um, so I had to find a way to achieve that. That was my ultimate goal. That was the purpose of me learning Python. Um, so I'd say like, find why you want to, what, what you want to do with Python. There are so many things that you can do. Um, but I still, whenever I need to learn something quick, I, I still go to, to sites like Real Python. Um, I do a lot of like, um, just like quick Google Foo or, or what Foo, uh, I look at a lot of work that other developer advocates do as well. Um, so like, oh, they, they have like this approach, um, like to building this app. I'm like, oh, what about we do it like this other way or like build things using another approach. Um, so that's also very helpful, looking at how others are writing code and are doing things. I guess that's the other thing. If you can find a network of other beginners and hopefully like more advanced people as well, but especially other people struggling with learning, you can solve each other's problems and just support each other in that learning process. I think that's important too. 
the Discord, the Python Discord uh, helped me a lot on the like beginning, beginning, because not only they can they can help you with questions um, with the bots, but they, there's also a beginner's channel where you can ask your stupid questions and not really be that afraid of not getting an answer. Perfect. Now, um, well, we we all know that you are both amazing speakers. We love your talks. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Oh no! Actually, before that, I have a comment because David Jones is saying on the comments that he still has a soft spot for Python one point five point two. And yeah, I knew you would like that. <laughs> It was much smaller, like as a language and a core library, there was less to learn, which was quite nice. Um, oh, okay. I, I have to admit, I never use Python one point anything. <laughs> to be honest, most people haven't. When you think about how much has grown over the last two decades, it's like, you know, there's only a fraction, a tiny fraction of people who have ever touched Python one. Um, and people move. Pe Sorry, Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Go but ahead. people moved to Python 2 very willingly. It was like, it was much less difficult to get people to move to Python 3, 2 than it was to 3, even though there were some breaking changes in there. And that's just because it was much better in, in almost every way. Um, hey, that, like when you said, when I started asking my question and you said, oh, I learned a long time ago. I was like, oh, you're not that old. And then you're like, yeah, so I learned with Python 1. I was like, <laughs> OK. <laughs> It's fine. You are that old. It's. <laughs> I've got the filter on and everything. It's. <laughs> okay. And now I know the secret. Okay. I need a few of those actually. Anyway. Uh, cool. So yes, going back to the fact that you're great speakers. Um, how does one pick up that skill? I'm going to start with Tanya this time. Practice. <laughs> there is no, there, there is no other way than just like, Practicing and practicing and practicing. Um, if you want to become, um, I don't know, like an international conference speaker, um, the best places to start practicing are meetups because it's very small scale. People are super friendly. They're usually like quite informal. Um, I still sometimes use meetups to do um, initial runs of new talks uh, or talks on new topics that I'm not like, oh, I'm a master in this. Um, and, and I always get like incredible feedback or uh, questions that make my presentation and my delivery better. Um, but yeah, you, I think you only get better by practicing. Uh, the, the only thing I, I uh, want to add something to that, which is that it's not just practice by going and giving talks more often. It's also before you give each talk, rehearse a few times. It's something for one, for some bizarre reason, when I first started doing public speaking, I wouldn't rehearse. Like I would read through my notes and everything beforehand, but I wouldn't actually stand up and speak in, for example, in front of a mirror or in front of Zoom or something before actually giving the talk live the first time. Nowadays, I tend to, it's probably an average of about five rehearsals before I'll actually give a talk in front of other people. Um, and you know, it sounds like a lot. Like I've said, given this advice to people before, and they're like five times. Wow, that's impressive. But it isn't. It's it's if it's a half an hour talk, that's two and a half hours work. That's half an afternoon. Um, it usually takes a little bit longer because you have to go back through and revise slides and notes and things the first couple of times. But it's just that keep doing it until you feel comfortable. And then when you're in front of Zoom or whatever, your nerves will be much less because you just kind of know what you're doing. You don't have to think about it so much. Yep. But yeah, rehearsal practice absolutely. That's. That's the only thing. Yeah. And I also want to um, add like a point that it's not probably on the delivery, but a lot of folks are a bit intimidated about talking about a topic that they don't feel like they master or are experts in. Uh, that doesn't matter. That absolutely doesn't matter. Uh, a lot of my talks are inspired by problems or barriers that I face when trying to do something or learning something. Um, and how I actually overcame those barriers or helping others to overcome those barriers. So that doesn't mean that you have to be an expert. Um, I think that if, if I had waited to be an expert in anything, I would have never given a talk. Never. <laughs> if you've only just learned something, you're currently the best person to teach that to someone else. If you know it off the back of your hand and you can't even remember how you learned it, you're the worst person to teach other people because because you don't understand their perspective. It's like if you've only just learned it, you still remember what it's like to not know that thing. So 
get up on a stage and and tell people what you know i that would be my advice that's awesome advice thank you uh well i have one follow-up to that question and then the last question for t for today uh the follow-up to that question is okay so since you have so much experience i know that you've been through uh, everything <laughs> uh, from internet um going out when you're about to come onto stage uh i don't know falling on stage maybe um things like that so what's your advice to do with the, the, when those things happen what do you do don't panic <laughs> i was uh giving a talk in australia a couple of years ago and the lectern started to collapse as I, I was speaking, I was five minutes in and I had to hold bits of the lectern together until I could work out how to click two pieces into place to stop it from falling apart. Um, and all, the audience, especially in the Python community, are wonderful. They're the most forgiving, welcoming, encouraging people. You know, they want you to succeed as a speaker. So if you have some technical problems, whatever you can do to work past them you know the audience will will uh, will allow you to have many minutes without actually speaking and things like that when you you know if, if your slides aren't showing up on the screen or something like that when you eventually get things to work you'll get a big round of applause i mean obviously the stuff i'm saying now is like all stuff that happened in person rather than over a zoom call but in you know uh, pe people are great um and yeah that's yeah i think it's just roll with it uh, it's not a big deal you're if you're giving talks or if you're giving a lot of online conference things uh, it's bound to happen we are all not exempt um one of the trickiest things to do actually is doing live coding demos um so if you're planning to do that always have a backup plan um because i've had Awful experiences were literally the night before I absolutely destroyed my development environment. Uh, next morning, nine o'clock in the morning, I was trying to rerun, nothing worked. So having a video or something for those cases is always a good idea. Uh, but if you have problems like your battery died or uh, your slides are not displaying or hopefully not a building is collapsing on top of you, um, you can pretty much roll with it and yeah, laugh about it. I, I try just to laugh about it um probably because it has happened way too much to me but uh, to just yeah the, the community understands people understand that that's how it happens i think it was the day that i met you actually uh, tanya you were about to give a talk and the adapter for the computer didn't work although it was an adapter for the mac uh, the previous speaker ran the, all the time, so you're like extra time on the building already, and everyone like ooh, the organizers are like, I have no idea what's going on, and you're like, no, this is grand. I'm gonna go to the car and get my adapter. I come back and see you in like ten minutes. It's okay. So and, yeah, that was the day I met you. So that was quite impressive as well because I was like literally ripping my, ripping my hair off. Uh, and I, I wouldn't have been that calm. <laughs> <laughs> You should have sweat my back. You uh, should have seen my back sweating. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, we don't get that part because we only look at the front of the speaker. That's it. <laughs> I know it, it um, sounds. It, I think it's always worth reassuring people that we have nerves too. I know people, uh, the most experienced advocates that I know, some of them um, w have prescribed tablets that they take before they go up on stage to stop their hands from shaking because otherwise they can't keep the shaking out of their voice. Um, I, that's, I know at least two people who do that. Um, I used to have a boss at my last job who will only wear dark coloured t-shirts and ideally more than one layer so that he doesn't show the sweat as he's kind of on stage and things like that. It's like even people who really are afraid of being on stage still do it because I, it, mainly, I think, from the rush at the end when you've finished and you've got that round of applause and everybody's, you know, you feel like you did a good job. Awesome. So, uh, well, thank you very much. Martin, do you want to cut me off? Because I had I had one last question. <laughs> no, no, go on. You still have two minutes to go. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. So I'm going to take that time then and I'm going to ask the both of you. Uh, so Python, object-oriented or functional programming? A uh, bit of both. <laughs> if you had to choose one, uh, object. Oh, I would choose functional if I had to choose one. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now go. Fight. 
Okay, so I think uh, that was a good way to close it all. Uh, thank you very much for being on the panel to just spend an extra hour with us. Uh, the things you told us were really interesting, especially for people who want to learn how to become a developer advocate themselves. So uh, thanks again for that. And um, is there any last things you would like to say? Like well, Mark? let's take a speakers. Let's take, <laughs> let's take let's... Speak our panelists. Uh, thank you very much, Martin, as well, for hosting us. And yeah, thank you for everyone that sent questions and that interacted. Now, if you anyone else wants to say anything else, thanks a million. If not, then let's just wave goodbye and uh, we'll s see you shortly. Uh, so thank you very much again. And uh, now, uh, as you all know, uh, Tanya is... Employer Microsoft is sponsoring this so to make those people happy we'll just play a short ad and then we will be back with the next scheduled talk. <laughs> And since this uh, ad is currently not playing, we we'll, might be able to fix that later. Um, we can, uh, and we're now on time, so it's it's time to start uh, the next talk. And uh, this one has been sent in previously, and it is uh, about to to show us why people contribute to open source projects. And this is a recording made for us by Francesca, uh, Francesca Morano. And uh, she's a WordPress, uh, WordPress core team um, member uh, at uh, Yo Yoast is the company. And uh, she's the co she called it the release of WordPress 5.3 and 5.4. And she's serving as the core team global representative and she's monitoring other women um, to get involved in making WordPress. And I will let her introduce herself. So please, uh, let's see, uh, enjoy the talk. Hello, Pyjammers. <laughs> Here I am to talk to you about contributing to open source and do it selfishly instead of selflessly. Let's go, we have a lot to cover. So my name is Francesca Marano and I'm the WordPress core team lead at Yoast, where we believe SEO is for everyone. We also believe in open source. Uh, we strongly believe in giving back to the community. In our view, that means giving back to the place we live in all together. So that's what my team does. Uh, we contribute full time to WordPress.org, the open source project. My path to open source contribution was completely accidental. Uh, I was born into tech, I always like to say this, because my parents uh, uh, started uh, programming in the late 60s and I grew up around computers when no one had one in their house uh, in Italy in the 70s and the programming and looking at them drawing flowcharts uh, to solve a very complex automation processes. But that was never what I wanted to do. Uh, becoming a developer was never uh, one of my uh, dreams. And um, so I went on with my life. I did a number of jobs. And in 1999, I took an HTML class and I started making websites and um, learning about it mostly for fun. In 2008, I started a blog. Uh, first, it was on WordPress.com. Then I discovered that was there was a self-hosted version of it. And with that, I could tweak and play around with HTML and CSS. So I decided to move my blog there. And at some point, yeah, tweaking was a lot more fun than writing. And surprisingly, people asked me, if I could do the same um, for their blog, which I say surprisingly because at the time I was the administrative director for a company. So making websites for a living was very far from what I wanted to do. 
uh, on my day-to-day -day life. So despite loving WordPress, despite making a living out off of it, starting 2010, I moved to freelancing uh, full-time and I kept up to date with all its changes. I never thought about contributing back to it because I thought that the only thing that WordPress needed was PHP developers. And well, clearly I was wrong. <laughs> a quick look at my path. I uh, usually don't really talk a lot about myself in presentations, but this one is really to show how a series of accidental steps can take you a lot farther than you planned initially. So I did my first contribution without knowing it. A client of mine needed a plugin. We translate. I translated it into Italian actually with her help because she was a translator. And then when we had the, the Mo and Po files, we just sent them to the developers of the plugin because it was done. So why not? In 2015, I actually discovered that there was uh, a structured way to contribute to WordPress by meeting WordPress contributors at a non-WordPress event. Uh, I first started translating uh, uh, to, I first started translating WordPress into Italian. That was my first step into contribution. And then I volunteered for the community team, which is the team that oversees all the official WordPress events around the world, now online, of course. In 2017, I was hired by, by Sideground, the hosting company, uh, to be their community manager. And this allowed me to give back more time to the project and work more closely um, in several teams and oversee a larger number of uh, conversations and learn more. And then in August 2019, when I was asked if I wanted to be involved in a release, I said, yes, sure. <laughs> so um, I had the immense pleasure and honor to be the release coordinator for WordPress 5.3 and WordPress 5.4. Uh, and recently I became uh, one of the WordPress core team representatives. At the beginning of October, so just a couple of months ago, I joined Yoast. Uh, the company always supported WordPress. A number of uh, our uh, team members and employees and our founder, they all have been part of multiple WordPress releases in the past. Um, so this summer they decided to put together a structured team of contributors and then they asked me to lead it and of course I couldn't say no. <laughs> so my work for the rest of 2020 and probably for a good part of uh, the first quarter of 2021 is actually behind the scenes doing what I probably love the most, which is mentoring other contributors to come on board and of course help my team uh, be as effective and as helpful for the whole WordPress project as possible. So right now uh, I am mentoring a group, um, well, actually a couple of groups of, uh, of people involved in the next release of WordPress, which is coming out on December 8th, which is an historical release for WordPress, but for open source in general, because it's completely led by women. So that's probably the first in the history of open source and it's a great release and I'm helping behind the scenes, lending a hand when I need it and mentoring uh, other people to do the same. So that's very rewarding. So let's dive into open source uh, contribution and why I think it's okay to be selfish. This book, The Cathedral and the Bazaar by Eric Raymond, is still, after almost 30 years, a must read for anyone who's dealing with open source or is thinking of uh, uh, getting to contribute. It's quartered everywhere. It's a short read. You can also find it online as an HTML, super simple HTML pages. I love it. And um, it's divided in lessons, and I want us to focus on two especially for now. Lesson number one is probably one of the most quoted parts of the book. Uh, and this is the starting point uh, for nearly every contributor I know. So every good work of software starts by scratching a developer's itch. 
and actually I don't think it needs to be a developer's itch, but it's anyone's itch. So you need to start somewhere and starting from something that you need a solution for is a great idea. This might be something that puzzles you or something that you need to solve uh, to move forward with your own project. It can be a missing translator <laughs> translation like it was in my case. Uh, so, or maybe you want to learn about something and learning by doing is still a great way to, to go. The second uh, lesson that I want to quote is lesson number 18. Uh, to solve an interesting problem, start by finding a problem that's interesting to you. So this one is corollary to the first lesson. And so again, what interests you? Basically, these two lessons make it clear that you are the master of your own contributor destiny and you should pick projects that are interesting for you and you are excited about fixing or improving or whatever. So yes, be selfish. Pick something that you are interested in. And if you think, if you pick something that you use daily, it will be easier to get started and it will be easier to continue. You can report a bug if you found something unusual or fix a bug. Uh, you might have solved something specific for your work. So why not share it with everyone else using this piece of software or you are attending an online event. Uh, so next time, maybe you will give a talk, which is a great way to increase knowledge for the whole project, or you can help by organizing an event. I have the utmost respect for everyone organizing online events right now. They, you are really keeping the knowledge flame alive. So that is, this is great. And I'm super grateful to be here today. And don't worry about making small contributions. So what you perceive as small contributions, I know you have, well, I had, at least in my mind, this grand idea of contributing to open source is uh, life changing, tackling super complex projects uh, and, you know, feeling that you're changing everything in one go. But actually, what I did uh, <laughs> when I started out was translating uh, into Italian uh, the names of the weekdays, the months, numbers, simple stuff. And you might say, that's not contributing. It is contributing because those words were still showing up in English in a plugin or theme or whatever I was working on. And that's a bad experience. That's a bad user experience. So by translating the number one or the word Monday, in every possible instance, you are actually making a big difference. So don't be afraid to pick also things that are not as high visibility and complex as writing the next API or whatever uh, big project you imagine in your life. And uh, don't worry about the next step. You might get hooked and become um, a contributor to your open source project of choice, or you might show up when you feel like it. And it's also okay because you're still doing something for the project. If you do enjoy it, the next step is to become uh, involved more actively and show up more continuously. That's usually the point where you realize what an impact doing small changes can have on the overall <laughs> project. And that there's probably an organized way to uh, coordinate all the efforts that people are putting into this piece of software or language. So in WordPress, for example, uh, there is a website called make.wordpress.org where you will find all the teams uh, working on making WordPress, the software and the community. Uh, Slack is used for, for uh, communication and GitHub and Track, which is uh, the WordPress um, track bug tracking uh, system uh, are used as well. Uh, you can attend you start attending chats or calls if there are any scheduled or you might even schedule one yourself, who knows? And even if you're, if you join by only listening at the beginning, it's great. Once you feel like you have something to contribute to the discussion, just please go and do it because, uh, um, 
open source needs to be made by a lot of different voices to really thrive and get better for as many different users as possible. And don't forget to be polite. I don't want to sound like the old auntie here, but uh, it will make it easier for you to have an enjoyable experience as a contributor. Coming into an open source project with a very uh, confrontational uh, mindset it doesn't really help because there's people that have been doing that for years and having someone come on board and say, I'm going to show you how it's done. It's never a good idea. So uh, also remember that in most projects that are people coming from all walks of lives are coming from different countries, different cultures. So it's very important to be respectful and polite with everyone. So on the way, on your contributor path, you will learn lots of things. Uh, for example, you might use tools that you don't use in your everyday work life or personal life. And uh, some might not be necessarily related. Some maybe you will not need them, but it's always cool to learn uh, new things, I think. Uh, and it could be processes and it could be skills. For example, by contributing to WordPress, my English got significantly better. English is obviously not my first language. And by having to uh, talk to contributors from everywhere where the shared language is English has helped me a lot. And I also gained some very important uh, life skills, such as conflict resolution, project management. Uh, I learned to mentor, I learned to delegate. I learned to be more assertive and I learned to be more patient. And these are things that I use in my everyday life, not just my professional life. And the results are tangible. The results are there. Uh, you get more knowledge and it's useful for your life or work and knowledge is priceless. Uh, you make new connections. You can get business partnerships out of it, you can get friendships and both are very <laughs> equally important in your everyday life. Or you could spot new opportunities uh, for your professional advancement. These, for example, are uh, the 18 teams that make WordPress the platform, but also the community, as I said. Uh, you can go to make.wordpress.org to see them all. And they represent an incredible variety. Uh, by contributing um, to them, you can learn anything from putting together a lesson plan for training WordPress users to experiment with the latest uh, technologies and techniques to edit a video because there's a WordPress TV where you can find thousands of videos from uh, uh, conferences from all around the world, accessibility, uh, best practices for translating, but also best practices for writing your plugins and themes with internationalization in mind. Um, community. Basically go and see how many things you can learn and how many things you can contribute to. And I think the tangible results are also very true for companies. So by making WordPress better or a language or any other piece of software, the companies in that ecosystem can make their own product better, their own processes better, and make sure the platform itself keeps improving and keeps getting better for everyone, the company, your company included. Um, you can have a discussion with like-minded people from other companies and exchange knowledge. Again, back to the knowledge, which is for me is basically the most important thing we have in life. <laughs> so. This is mentioned by basically every contributor I know, uh, the ability to brainstorm um, and chat out and nerd out uh, with people from all over the world that come from different companies and might approach the same problem in different ways is always appreciated by everyone. Uh, you can use it as a way to train your employees on the platform by allowing them to work on it and provide support and guidance. For example, when I joined Yoast in October, it became clear a few days in that there was a need to solve a very specific problem and we had to put together a temporary team um, to 
to help with a particularly complex issue that was also time sensitive. So the team we put together was made of the people from my team. We sponsored someone from outside that then we later hired to become part of the team. And we brought three people from the front end team to help us out. So um, one of the amazing React developers we had from the front end team that came into the WordPress team didn't know much about WordPress. So um, someone paired up with him and showed him how themes are developed in WordPress. Uh, and at the same time, he gave us uh, some practical tips uh, on React. So that was this beautiful exchange of information. So for two weeks, all the people involved in this specific uh, project got to learn from each other and got to learn much faster than they would ever do if they had to open a, a search engine and start doing their homework on their own. And finally, you can get some recognition. Now, different open source uh, projects have different ways to recognize uh, contribution from companies. Uh, in WordPress, we have Fiverr for the Future, which encourages organization in the ecosystem to contribute 5% of their resources back to WordPress. Uh, Matt Mullenweg, who's the co-founder of uh, WordPress and its project lead, uh, proposed this as a benchmark um, to maintain kind of a golden ratio between contributors and users. The idea is to give back at least 5% of your company resources to WordPress.org. And here is our page. We are a relatively small company. We're a little bit over 120 people, but we are the second largest contributor to WordPress in terms of hours given. And we have in this list, I think since I took this screenshot, we actually added more people because we also have one more person working full time on WordPress. But it doesn't matter. All the people that you see in this page give something back to WordPress, whether it's one hour a week or 40 hours a week, they all somehow help to make WordPress better for everyone. So I told you about being selfish, but when I started contributing, everyone told me I need to be selfless. I need to think of the greater good. So for me, the word selfless, self, less and selflessness are problematic. I also have a hard time <laughs> spelling them out, uh, mainly because I'm not an English, English native speaker. And that less at the end of the word sounds like you're erasing yourself from the process, but you're actually the most important resource in the process of contributing. So I prefer to talk about generosity. And this is where contributing to open source becomes about others. And I see this a lot in contributors. At first, we dive in head first. We are everywhere. We learn, we do, we attend, we propose, we fix, we give feedback. Uh, we're vocal, we schedule calls, we start projects, everything. And then you cannot do it all. So with time, a lot of people move into the background and they help newcomers go through that first step. So this is a virtuous circle. And this is how you make sure the project gets new energies and gets appropriate mentorship to grow. So we go back to Eric Raymond. And lesson number five, that is both about being selfish and being helpful. When you lose the interest in a program, your last duty is to hand it off to a competent successor. So if something doesn't interest you anymore, which is how you started contributing in the first place, it's your duty to be helpful and think of who is coming after you and help them take over. Here are, for example, how some example of how I applied this concepts in my life and how I was both selfish and generous in different contributions I made, not just to WordPress. So I get to mentor new contributors and people that want to start with public speaking. So 
if you come on board as a new contributor to Core or any other WordPress uh, team, if I can help you, I will always will. And because I, people helped me when I started out and I'm very passionate about public speaking. Not because I'm, I think of myself as a particularly brilliant, excellent, perfect public speaker, but because I think that representation matters. So I still, even when I'm like, I'm all talked out, I will still give talks because it's my dream and hope to see as many different faces on stage or on a camera uh, giving talks. So I love helping people starting out uh, in their public speaking because I love that everyone uh, can do this and I encourage everyone to do this because again, we are increasing everyone's knowledge by doing this. Uh, handover. So seven years ago, again by accident, it looks like my life is a series of <laughs> fortunate or unfortunate accident, depends on <laughs> how you feel about those. So I started my business in 2010 and at the time there weren't many female online entrepreneurs in Italy. Uh, so together with a bunch of girlfriends that were also starting their businesses or they have already started the business, we decided that we want to help other women in doing so in Italy. So we started a blog for female creative entrepreneurs and it's still read by thousands of people every month. And at some point it became too much for me because, you know, when I was freelancing, that was part of my job that I made sure that every week I dedicated some time to this. And then when I joined SiteGround and definitely now that I'm with Yoast full time, I didn't have time anymore to to uh, to work on this project. So instead of letting it die a slow and painful death, like a lot of projects do on the internet, I was able to hand it over to a great group of amazing women that took it upon themselves to continue this adventure. Um, so it's great that I was able to do so for me, but also for them and for the readers that will continue getting great information. I learned to delegate. This was very hard for me. Um, I am one of those people that complained about others never doing enough uh, and turned out that it was not others not doing enough, but it was me holding everyone to impossible standards and also not allowing others <laughs> to shine. So I'm now a lot more selfish. Instead of working 16 hours, I work eight hours and I delegate the other eight. So I'm also teaching someone and I sharing my knowledge. And finally, the most selfish thing I do, I compulsively document everything. Uh, so in case I lose interest, someone can uh, take care of all these projects. And I always say this and I truly believe it. Uh, documentation is the highest form of generosity in contribution to open source because by dedicating time to write contribution to write documentation you will make sure that the project outlives you because everything is on paper and people can take up and go with it however they like and for how long they wish to do it so after five years of solid contribution, I still think asking yourself what's in it for me and having a clear answer to that is a major drive to succeeding long term contribution. Knowing what you're getting back <laughs> is a major motivator. And it's not necessarily profit driven. Actually, I don't think it has anything to do with profit. So for me, the sense of accomplishment and pride uh, when you make a change, when you do something for open source is a big mood and answer. Um, this is my what's in it for me, looking at the WordPress counter and knowing that I, you know, part of those 50 million downloads, there is a little bit of work that I did or spotting a translation that I did many years ago or 
looking at talks I gave or knowing that someone gave a talk after I helped them out, those are incredible for me. Those are really, really things that keep me going. Validation, why not? Positive feedback about our ideas is great. I mean, all the management gurus have been telling us this for years, so how to cultivate high productivity teams and stuff like that. Well, positive uh, reinforcement is always great and that's what you can get uh, from uh, open source contribution. I also think recognition is important and it comes in different forms. Uh, for me, it's, this is not, for example, a main motivator, but it is for people, for other people, so it's great. Um, if you have kids, you might have used the reward system when they were little, if they finish their tasks, and it's an excellent system. All gamification processes are based on this, so they can not, all of them can be wrong, right? <laughs> and finally, it will help you build uh, your skills and put together a better CV in case you are looking for a job. Now, word of caution on this one. I put it last because if this is, sorry, <coughs> if this is your only motivation and your contribution is clearly and only selfish, I'm sorry, but you, this will not get you very far because companies that are used to hire from the open source contributor pool, they are very aware and they can really spot who's in it just to improve their skills and who's in it because they want to make the project better and as a side effect they're getting the knowledge the better skills and all these kind of things so to sum it all up i would like to finish with a quote from um, a wordpress core contributor and committer a former release lead and my partner in life, which I met at a contributor day. So contributing is good, even for your love life. So John Blackburn said, make it better and give it back. So no matter what pushes you to make it better, give it back so others can enjoy it and probably make it even better after you. So that would be all for me. Uh, thank you for listening. My name is Francesca Marano. I'm the WordPress core team lead at Yoast. I hope we can continue this conversation online. You can find me on Twitter, mostly on Twitter, uh, or you can shoot me an email. I'm always happy to chat about open source contribution, WordPress, professional development, women in tech, whatever. Throw it at me. I'm ready for you, pyjamas. Have a great day. <laughs> Bye. Okay, thanks a lot, Francesca, for this. And um, we will now attempt to help our sponsor, Microsoft, uh, get some more exposure. So, Lies, would you please click on the video if that's possible? We'll try it. We'll try out something different today. So, let's, let's see if... <laughs> Okay, so now we figured out it's not only happening when I'm online. Good. Um, so that I can just remind you that Microsoft is sponsoring uh, the uh, Pyjamas conference as a Kashmir sponsor. So they are our main sponsor and they invite you to look at their Azure and other options for uh, Python programmers, and we'll 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 try during the day to f uh, find out uh, why the video currently doesn't play. But um, I'm sure that that won't stop you from taking a look at the offerings they have. Okay, so uh, we are running a bit late, so let's get on with our next uh, speaker. Uh, we are having uh, we are inviting Ankit Mahato. And he wants to talk about uh, how a Noomber, a just-in-time compiler, can supercharge your Python code. So let's welcome him. Hey, Hi, and you're live. Yeah, sure. Hello. Uh, can you attempt to share your screen? So while you do that, I can...
uh, just uh, say that, that uh, you've worked nearly a decade in scientific computing and uh, machine learning on IoT devices, and you've helped out in PyCon India and SciPy and uh, are an open source contributor to Number and uh, Titus too. So. As a sh that should do as a short introduction. Let's see. Uh, I have your screen here, and, and um, so please uh, st start your presentation. Sure. So hi everyone. I am Ankit. I am a diehard Pythonista, and I currently maintain the Titus 2 PFA scoring engine written in Python. I have previously worked as a data scientist, software developer, and product manager. And throughout this journey, my core focus has always been to help people accelerate their data analytics and scientific computing pipelines. And today I'll be uh, talking about Number, which is one such tool which can help you supercharge your Python code. So let's get started with it. So to begin with, we developers, we love Python because it is easy to learn. The codes written are usable and readable. It has a vast ecosystem of more than 250,000 plus contributed packages. And it takes fewer lines of code to implement new algorithms and build prototypes rapidly and scale them. A feature rich Jupyter Notebook ecosystems allows us to have an interactive environment where we can write our codes, mathematical equations, display visualizations, and add narrative texts. Uh, this even promotes reprodu uh, reproducible research and scientific transparency. And this list goes on and on. But when I was working uh, on my master's six years back, uh, I was working on solving some uh, differential equations, uh, working on transport phenomena. I was hit very hard by the fact that when it comes to performance, the Python implementation was magnitudes slower when compared to traditional programming implementations like uh, done in Fortran or C++. And this made me question, if learning Python is so easy, why is increasing the performance of my Python code so difficult? Thankfully, times have changed. A lot of effort has been made in the last decade and two to accelerate Python codes. And you can have a look at this timeline, which I refer to as two decades of need for speed timeline, uh, which lists various options that uh, have been developed in the past and is currently being maintained, which can help us accelerate our Python code. So broadly, there are two ways to accelerate our Python codes. One is by using a replacement Python interpreter like PyP, which is difficult to implement has its own ecosystem of packages, which is significantly smaller and limited. The other popular alternative is to use C++ or C, uh, basically Python to C++ and C transpilers, uh, like Nuitka, Python, Cython, which have limited static analysis and ahead of time compilation, basically uh, the ahead of uh, time generated code is either under, speci under specialized or it can be bloated to cover all data types. Also, bo also both these alternatives, basically the transpilers or alternative implementations, they do not address non-CPU targets like GPUs, which today are gaining prominence and widespread adoption in the Python community. And among this, uh, this crowd, we have one library, which is Numba. Uh, which stands out. So it is easy to learn, use, and implement just like learning Python. And it often provides performance gains, which is comparable to traditional programming languages. As there is no ahead of time compilation step, so using it is quite simple as it can be directly plug, uh, plugged in your Jupyter Notebook and you are ready to go. So what is Numba? Basically, it is an open source JIT compiler that translates a subset of Python and NumPy code into fast machine code. Uh, one of the reasons why its name is Numba because it's an amalgamation of NumPy and Mamba. And Mambas are known to be 10 times faster than actual Python. So they are one of the fastest snakes. So that's why it is called Numba. And 
basically all you need to do is just add a jit decorator on your function which you want to speed up and you'll get performance gains which is similar to uh, c++ c and portran without switching interpreters or languages so to understand this uh, further let us go through this entire number of workflow and know how it works so basically first you start with adding the ng decorator uh, to the function you want to accelerate uh, ng stands for jit in no python mode which is the preferred mode of supercharging your code as it has zero involvement of the python interpreter in the compiled code and leads to the best performance so you add the ng decorator when the function is uh, executed for the first time in a particular session what happens is basically uh, it does a bytecode analysis of the python function okay based on the bytecode analysis the uh, num it generates a number ir which is the intermediate representation and the function arguments are also analyzed and the types data types are inferred post this analysis we write a rewrite the ir so uh, the new uh, intermediate representation is rewritten then it goes through the process of lowering basically uh, lowering is when you convert this low level uh, uh, basically it converts into a low level llvm ir from this high level number ir and based on your cpu or gpu target the requisite infrastructure is used which is llvm uh, infrastructure or nvvm infrastructure to uh, create the machine code and this machine code can be cached uh, if you include the cache option as true it can be cached and definitely this gets executed without uh, and this entire process basically happens at the back end and number has uh, various environment facilities of using this environment variables so you can at each and every step if you want to dig deeper into your intermediate representation or the generated codes you can dig deeper using this environmental variables environment variables you can uh, turn a uh, dump ir uh, to one and it will automatically dump the ir so you it is not that everything is a black box you can ins if you want to inspect you can uh, use this environment variables to inspect uh the generated codes in each of uh, each of the stages which i discussed in this workflow and now let's get started with using number and we'll begin with the most popular uh, example which is mandelbrot set will uh, in this example i'll go through some of the codes and see how we can actually accelerate this mandels the uh, mandelbrot set generation so let us go through the code so before we begin with the mandelbrot set i like to tell you what exactly it is uh, so you can see this uh, image right now yeah so this is basically a mandelbrot set visualization uh, it is a set of points on the complex plane which always remains bounded to a threshold value uh, while solving the quadratic recurrence equation it is an iterative process and the iteration at which uh, the complex point escapes a threshold value we basically try to color it uh, based on that iteration value and we generate this beautiful uh, visualization of mandelbrot set and this problem is quite quant compute intensive in nature and right now let's see how we can use number but before that let us uh, see how actually we can let me just yeah now it is clear so what happens is basically the first step is to import uh, the requisite library so this canvas is basically the library that i have written to just for the visualization purposes so i am just uh, abstracting the computation part from the gui part so this handles the gui aspect uh, which we'll see uh, right now and we will start with we uh, some uh, variables such as width and max iter so these are to set the domain size so we are setting the size of the complex grid as 600 cross 600 pixels and the maximum iteration uh, to for which we, we are going to check for each complex point 
is 100. So after 100, we'll assign all the points which are still in that threshold value as a single color, which is black. And we'll start with the definition of the function. So let's write the function. So this is a pure Python function. And you can see it is evaluating the Mandelbrot set, uh, the colors, basically the RBG value of each and every points on that particular pixel. And when, and it starts with this pixels, which is a list of list of tuples. And this tuple is basically represents the RBG tuple, the red, blue, green cha channel that we are going to compute for this uh, two dimensional uh, list. And now we are going to traverse in this complex plane. So, so basically this is done using for loops and here Y denotes the imaginary axis uh, along which we are going to uh, traverse and X denotes the horizontal axis, which is the real axis. So the complex number corresponds to each grid point is initialized over here, you can see. So based on uh, the boundary values, which is represented by B box, B box is basically the boundary points. Uh, we'll see where it comes into the picture. So we'll initialize the complex points for each and every pixel on that grid. And we'll start with the, uh, with the iteration and we'll proceed till the maximum iteration is reached. The threshold value that we are going to uh, restrict it to is two. So if a complex point after a certain number of iterations uh, reaches the threshold value as uh, two, then it we will just uh, uh, break that loop and we'll assign a color uh, using this uh, mathematical function, which involves calculating the cosine and taking the logarithmic of the iteration so we it will give you a beautiful uh, colorful uh, color pattern that's why we use it, we are using this mathematical uh, uh, mathematical function to evaluate the color and we will assign it to each and every point on the, on that grid and we will return it so it's straightforward you have the function the data layer we traverse the complex points and we compute and then we return the value so let's go ahead and run it So we have our Mandelbrot set generated over here. So it's a 600 cross 600 pixel uh, grid. And you can see it took around one in the title bar. You can see it took around 1.91 seconds to generate it. So the reason why I separated the GUI layer from the uh, basically computation layer is uh, so that I can interact with this set. So let me just draw a rectangle and zoom into a particular region. So right now I've drawn a rectangle. So you can see it took around 2.81 seconds to uh, generate the uh, zoomed basically value, which is uh, if you are zooming seven times, then it took around 2.81 seconds. So let's zoom further. You can see it takes some time, but as we zoom further, we can see that the visualization of the set is not that great. One of the reason is because we have restricted to the maximum iteration to 100. So let's see if we can increase that iteration and get a clearer picture. So let's go ahead and set it as 1000. So now the maximum iteration is 1000. Let's go ahead and run the function. You can see it takes some time to launch. Yeah. So you can see it took around 11 seconds uh, to basically generate uh, the initial uh, fractal, which took around less than two seconds when the maximum iteration as was set as 100. So you can see it is now compute intensive. And if we try to zoom into it, it is again evaluating the entire uh, computation. And yeah, it again, it took around 10 seconds. So you can see how uh it is less uh, you can see it is less user responsive it is taking uh, so much time to generate and basically the user experience is getting hampered so let's see if we can speed this up so let's do it using why not let's do it using number so what i need to do is 
I've kept the function as uh, the function is still same. Entire thing word to word, it is uh, it is same. All I did was I imported number as NB, and I added the number jet ng decorator. Let us now execute the function. Yeah. Now you can see it took less than one seconds to generate the initial uh, initial factor. So let's zoom into it. It took uh, it took less than again. It took around half a second. We can zoom further. Further. So now we are at ten to the power four uh, times zoom zoom level. So you can see we have generated. A, a good uh, recurrence pattern we have discovered it and it takes around half a second and it is quite a user responsive but is that it can we go further can we create a much uh, clearer fractal let's increase the zoom level to 6000 uh, maximum iteration to 6000 to get more uh, th so the higher the iteration value the more distinct the boundary will appear, and you can zoom even further into it. So let's uh, set the max iteration as six thousand. So it took around now. It took around two point five seconds. If we zoom again. We are go zooming further. So, yeah, so now we are sitting at a zoom level of 10 to the power 8. And it takes around 2.5 seconds uh, to generate this zoom level. So, and right now it's 4.9 seconds. So. 4.59 seconds. So can we increase? So we have achieved a maximum iteration of 6,000. It takes lesser time than the pure Python function. But can we speed it even further? Yes, we can. So number provides us with several options, such as uh, executing the code in parallel. So you can see over here, all I need to do is just add the parallel equal to two option. and the loop which I think can be parallelized can be just uh, converted from range to nb.prange function. So we can use this prange function to explicitly tell that, OK, this is the loop that can be executed in parallel. And Numba will automatically generate your uh, code, which can run on multiple threads. So you can easily parallelize your code and gain even further performance. So let's go ahead and generate, uh, run the function. So you can see the gain in performance is quite significant. So earlier, we, uh, what, uh, the thing that was taking computation that was taking around 2.5 seconds, now it has dropped to just 100 milliseconds. So you can see how you can easily parallelize your code and create high performance codes using number. So you can see I can zoom further. And it is quite clear that uh, our computation is uh, quite clear, distinct. We have got. 10 to the power 7 zoom level. And it takes less than half a second to generate, uh, which was taking around, uh, this was taking 300 millisecond, was taking around 4.5 seconds in the earlier run that we did. So you can see how you gained more than 10 times performance just by parallelizing the code. So right now, I have 16 cores. So that's why uh, I'm getting that kind of performance. If you have more cores, you will get even further performance. And the changes that I need to do was minimal. I just added parallel equal to two fl uh, true flag and uh, created a nb.p range function instead of range to parallelize that for loop. So can I do it further? So the another thing that number does is basically you can, instead of using, if you are doing scientific computing and uh, computational pipelines, you're building pipelines, you are already using numpy. So number was actually built to accelerate NumPy. So even uh, so, Python lists 
you can accelerate Python lists and Python native types, but uh, it accelerates the data. If the data layer is a NumPy array, it accelerates it even further. So instead of the pixel uh, array, if you use uh, the NumPy array, uh, the instead of list, if you use NumPy array, you can even further the performance. And the code changes is minimal. Again, the entire logic is still the same. So let us go ahead and execute it. All I did was change the pixel to as a NumPy array. And over here, the assignment of the third dimension has been changed. And we are uh, just calculating the cosine and uh, logarithmic and saving it as a NumPy array. So let's go ahead with that. You can see we have again generated the code. And it is taking 2.9 seconds, which was what we uh, achieved earlier. This is this is the pure NumPy code. So there is no number acceleration over here. It takes taking two seconds, four seconds to generate. Now let us see if we can speed it up. So we have just increased the maximum iteration. And just we did was now add a number JIT ng decorator. The code is still the same. And Voila, we get less than one second. So we can just zoom it and we are getting around half a millisecond or even 100 milliseconds. So you can uh, half second or 100 milliseconds and you can see how seamless our uh, zooming is. So this is a good part about number that you can turn your NumPy codes into fast machine codes and you can also parallelize it. So you can just add a parallel equal to true. Uh, and you can, if there is explicit uh, parallelization, you can do a P range explicitly. And also the thing is that NumPy is primarily designed to be as fast as possible on a single code. But what number does is automatically compiles a version that can run in parallel. If the code contains uh, element wise or point wise operations, array operations, if there are functions like sum, prod, these are reduction functions. If you have these functions, it automatically creates a code which runs in parallel. Uh, array math functions, be it array creation functions like zeros, a range, lin space, dot functions, um, then array assignments. So it can do that in parallel. And the reduce operator uh, can be also done in parallel. So what NumPy was primarily designed to be as fast as possible in single core, and what number does it? It takes it into multiple cores and it gives you even a fast, even further performance. So we uh, we just did parallel equal to two. It automatically creates a pa parallel version of this uh, NumPy code. And also we have explicitly we may mentioned that okay this loop can be run in parallel. So let's go ahead and execute it. You can see the performance has significantly increased. The the zooming is seamless and it takes around 100 millisecond to uh, basically 500 millisecond to actually compute it. So you can see, uh, you can see how NumPy, uh, if NumPy is used as a data layer, you can still accelerate your code. But what if you are using uh, NumPy pipeline and you, uh, and you are already familiar with uh, things like vectorization, uh, so what happens is basically in vectorization, uh, you can actually create uh, in NumPy, you can create a U fun, uh, which uh, uses the broadcasting rules to actually uh, run on the arrays and compute the results uh, in parallel. So uh, you can do that in number and in NumPy, you have this feature, but you have to write the U fun since C API basically. And if you are not familiar with C API, uh, Python can help you uh, in Python. Number can help you write that thing in Python and directly compile as a uh, NumPy UFUNC. So you do, there is no learning curve of C involved where you create a UFUNC in C and then uh, plug it in and use it in your scientific computing pipeline in Number. So it also, but in uh, NumPy, there is a NumPy vectorized decorator which uh, does similar thing, but it is neither optimal and nor it is efficient. So it is just for convenience. The vectorized decorator is just for convenience purposes. And the speeds that you gain are not that significant. So it is not creating a UFUNC. 
you can see it takes quite a significant time. It takes more than one second for this evaluation, then 2.5 seconds for this evaluation. So it takes quite a significant time. So it is not uh, running the codes in C. So what you can do is just replace this vectorize uh, num. If you are doing numpy vectorization, you can just replace it with number vectorization. So you can just plug in the number vectorization and it will create a corresponding uh, ufunc, uh, numpy ufunc, which you can plug it in. So over here, I have created a ufunc, which is get max iter. So it uh, does the same iteration process uh, and it returns only the iteration value. So I have just calculated the iteration value over here. You can see it's uh, it's seamlessly tied up in, the, in my numpy pipeline over here. So I am creating this, uh, calling this vectorize function, which is a u -fung. Then I'm calculating the pixel values and returning it. So you can see how seamlessly I can create u -funks using number vectorize decorator. So all I need to do is just run it. And, and you can see how you got less than a half a second per computation at each stage. So you can see how fast it is, the u -funks. So it is actually generating the fast you, uh, numpy ufunc, which otherwise you would have to write in using C API. So, and the best part is you can also parallelize it. So again, the numpy ufunc, they are not running in parallel. It is for a single core, but you can create numpy, uh, number vectorize decorator. You can target it to be executed in multiple threads. All you need to do is add a signature. Basically, this signature nothing but it tells the input data types and the return value of the output. Since vectorization operate uh, this u funks operate on scalars, so each and every pixel uh, point is input as a scalar, and you are computing the iteration, which is also returned as a scalar. And this happens in parallel. So you can uh, create and target it as in parallel, and you can easily execute it. You can see you gain a lot of performance. So you can see the performance gains is significant. It takes quite less amount of time to actually go ahead and uh, zoom into it. So it takes less than 300 seconds. And note that the maximum iteration is set as 6,000 instead of 1,000. That's why it, it is taking around 200 milliseconds. But if it was 1,000, it will take less than 100 milliseconds. So it is uh, it is very powerful, uh, these u funks And you can seamlessly plug it in without having any learning curve if you are using number. So let's go back to our presentation. So there is a, a real world use case, which is Blurash number. You can check it out. Since we are running out of time, you can just check it out. You can uh, type the Blurash uh, slash number project uh, in PyP, and you can uh, check it out. It, it does fast encoding and decoding, and you gain a lot of performance uh, if you are using number. So when should we use number? Uh, we should use number for numerical algorithms, which are array oriented or math heavy and have a lot of loops. Uh, when the data is in form of numpy arrays, we can definitely use number. Uh, when the performance bottleneck is a handful of well encapsulated functions, you can use number to speed up those uh, parts. And you can, and just like we saw, you can create universal functions in Python that broadcast on NumPy arrays uh, instead of writing that same thing using C. So you can do it in pure Python and you can create it uh, into a NumPy U fun using number. And you can generate, we saw how easily we can generate parallel codes targeting multi core CPUs using number. So it is uh, really beneficial. These use cases are really beneficial. Uh, and it will you will gain a lot when you use number. If you are already using Dask or Rapids uh, frameworks, so if you are using these, number can seamlessly plug in. They uh, the number team works closely with Dask and Rapids team. You can seamlessly plug in uh, number accelerated functions in Dask or Rapids. You can even uh, run it on uh, IoT devices like Raspberry Pi. You can uh, run number on Raspberry Pi and speed up your code. So the Mandelbrot set code that I showed you. Uh, it it got uh, I gained around 20x uh, speed up uh, when I uh, injected uh, on Raspberry Pi device. So you in Raspberry Pi, if you want to use number, you can use the Bericonda. Uh, 
Uh, and using Periconda, you can install Numba and run it. And that's it. So thank you. And I'm open to questions. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. And I'm, I'm amazed that you can actually run this on a Raspberry Pi. So that was a good tip. Um, we're a bit out of time, so uh, we will probably not be able to do a Q&A. But uh, if anybody has questions, uh, you can always go over to the Discord and uh, look for it there. Sure. So, and you can also reach out to me on Twitter at Ankit Mahato. Uh, and there you can message me and you can ask any doubts if possible. No problem. Perfect. And, and if anybody... Yeah, yeah, sure. And, and, and if, <laughs> you go. Yeah, yeah just uh, one bit. So if you, all the codes will be available at this website, realworldpython.guide. It's my website where I'll upload the codes and uh, the presentation that I demonstrated so, today. So if anyone is interested, they can just go ahead and visit it. Uh, in a couple of days, I'll upload it. So yeah, it will be available there. Thank you very much for that. And uh, like, if anybody needs to find out more about you, then uh, you can go to Pajamas Live, where we have speaker bios, and you can uh, like, if you uh, have problems remembering like who you saw, everybody is on there. So thanks again for the talk, and um, uh, I hope that you have a good night from now on because it looks a bit dark Thank where you, you are. Thank you for attending. Good, good night. Bye, Okay, and we're a bit short of time, at, but uh, we will uh, catch that up in the next 90 minutes, so don't worry about that. Um, I, before I invite the next speaker, I will just have to remind everybody that we are being sponsored by Microsoft, and they are the Cashmere sponsor, the main sponsor for this event, and we currently had some problems playing the videos from them, so we will not be doing this now, but instead go on with the program. As the next speaker, I would like to welcome Luciano Ratameo, who is a former journalist and full-stack programmer, and he's going to explain something about Django to us, like how to go from a request to a response. Uh, welcome, Luciano. Hey, nice to meet you. Yeah, so this, good to be this here. seems to work. I'm happy. <laughs> uh, let's see. <laughs> let's see if I have your screen. I can't see it at the moment yet. I I just shared, so it should be there in time soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. So there's yeah. there's a stream. Yes, you you you're watching yourself. So maybe you, <laughs> let's have your presentation first. Oh oh oh! Sorry about that. <laughs> Let me just. So you, this. yeah. So where are you joining us from? Uh, from Brazil. Uh, from Brazil, awesome. Yeah, there there's a really big community here. So yeah, good to represent. <laughs> yes, that, that's then. Then uh, you could still be in your bedtime pajamas then, because <laughs> no, I've been uh, wearing these for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm mostly a hundred percent of the time on pajamas, so. Uh, <laughs> so this, this, this is awesome. <laughs> okay, let's get let's go to business. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. So please explain to us how the requests and responses work in Django. Cool. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm Luciano Hatamero, as as he said. Uh, I, I'm going to talk about uh, the request, uh, the parts of the request and the response cycle on Django, uh, in which you can intervene and, and do uh, specific things. Uh, so yeah, for those who don't know me, um, the map is a little bit blurry, some somewhat. I don't know why. Uh, I'm a senior Python JS dev at Lab Codes. Uh, I work mostly with front end, but uh, I'm I go to all Python conventions because I love the Python community. Uh, as I said, it's really big in, in here in Brazil. It, there's a lot of people. Um, the conventions are beautiful. Um, so bad we we well, this is the best thing uh, we can do right now. So uh, let's let's go. I've been working with Django for almost a decade now. Uh, it's kind of crazy to think that it's been so long. Uh, but yeah, uh, and about lab codes where I work, uh, we uh, do design and development, uh, mostly with Python, Django, and JS React, but we have a, a, some uh, projects in different languages. Um, and we already made talks on PyCon, DjangoCon, EU, EuroPython. There are a lot of places. 
Um, so yeah, just go to labguys.com.br if you want to uh, talk with us. So uh, first disclaimer, this talk used to be longer. Uh, it used to be about 40, 45 minutes. So I won't be able to talk much about Django itself here. I'm gonna talk more about the parts of the request cycle in which you can do stuff. Uh, and if you have any questions or just want to hang out um, on web frameworks um, on the channel on Discord. So uh, just ping me there and I can uh, answer the questions later. <clears throat> So why have I made this talk? Um, I, uh, for the most time I worked with Django, I never knew that much uh, about how it processes a request, how it returns a response. It's always a bit hazy. It's kind of hard to find good available information about this as well. It, there's not like a graph or anything. Uh, I didn't have the time to make one, but I, I hope it's, uh, uh, it's the information is uh, good here so um, and this is the kind of thing that you won't use that much but it's good to to know if something comes up and you need to to do something like this so yeah uh, before talking about Django we need to talk a little bit about, uh, about how your server processes a request so if someone does like whatever.com and presses enter um, the request goes from the browser to the server the server mostly has like an outer layer uh, uh, with Nginx, Apache, or something. Um, this isn't Python related, so it, it forwards the request to a Python application server. Uh, we mostly use Unicorn, uh, but there are a lot of them. Um, and then after this, uh, this layer of, of uh, request workers, um, is, is done with their job. They forward the request to, uh, as, a, uh, as a WSGI object to Django. We're gonna talk about Django here. So a little bit about WSGI. Um, so how about Django, right? Um, Django, uh, well, we're mostly used to writing stuff on views. If, if we have any logic, any uh, domain, log domain logic, we do it on the view or the model level. Um, but there are a lot of places that, uh, that you can fiddle around with Django. Uh, when the because it's like a two-way uh, street, right? The request arrives on Django, uh, it goes to the view and then back. So on the way in, it passes through an, an WSGI app or handler or whatever you want to call it, uh, then passes through some Django code, then middlewares, uh, then some Django code, then the views. And on the way out, uh, it passes again through the middlewares, uh, then through context processors, if you have like a template rendering or something, most, most of the time you do. And then it just does whatever it needs to get the response out. So we're gonna talk about these specific steps they're really key for doing specific stuff. Um, so on the way in, the first part that uh, the request hits on your, your Django app is the WSGI handler. Uh, it's like really the outer layer. It, it's like right on the gateway. Well, it's called the web server gateway interface. So it's, it's the interface on the gateway, right? Um, but what is exactly WSGI? Uh, WSGI is Web Server Gateway Interface. It's like a standard, a uh, 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 way to uh, pack uh, uh, an object, a request object, and a response uh, handler uh, for all uh, Python frameworks. So all Python frameworks only need to uh, know about uh, how to deal with one specific type of object. Um, instead of each uh, framework needing to implement that part that, that just parses the request. Uh, so yeah, it's, it exists for a long time now, and it's, uh, it's so that Django, Flask, Bottle, everyone can just uh, deal with the same kind of request object. Uh, oh, the, the images aren't here. Oh. It's here now. Um, 
Well, Django, of course, uh, has its own WSGI handler. Uh, it lives on Django core handlers WSGI. I'm not going to talk much about this code uh, because it's a lot to, to unpack here. But uh, I'm, I'm going to just show you uh, a couple of things. Uh, you see this is a handler. This is a class, but it's a callable class because it has a death call here. And it receives environ and start response. This comes straight from the... Uh, the outer layer, the unicorn layer, for example, uh, this environ here has all the information about the request, and this start response is a function um, that you call to specifically to specifically handle. Well, here's the response that I want to to give to the browser. So, um, so two things here: this request equals self dot request class environ. This is just Django uh, picking up this object, this environ object, which is kind of the request object, but really in 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 a most raw state, <clears throat> and it envelops in a class uh, that represents the Django request class, um, more beautified and whatever, uh, and then it returns. It, it does response equals self.get response with the request. So this self.get response is like the whole Django. This, since this is the outer shell, uh, this get response here calls everything. Middlewares, Django code, views, whatever. It calls everything. Uh, so uh, why would we change the WSGI handler or app? Um, exactly because they allow these eager responses without going through Django because you have the raw data from the request there available to you. So you can just, for example, if you don't want to, uh, to serve your app for a specific country or to a specific IP or something, of course you can do that on, for example, the Nginx layer, uh, really on the outside. Uh, but if, if there's something that you want to do or if it's something that you want to test, for example, it's Python code, so it's it's easier to, to deal with. Um, so yeah, they allow eager responses without going through Django, without wasting all that computational power. Uh, so they prevent unnecessary processing sometimes, if you write things right. Uh, and they give you access to the raw data from the request. This is not like a beautiful Django request object. This is like a lot of plain data, a lot of plain strings. Um, so yeah, uh, they're useful for this corner cases, uh, but they are corner cases, but when you need to do that, it's like really performant if you just intercept the request right at the gateway. Um, so all the projects, when you do like Django admin, start project, your project name, right? It creates like settings.py, URLs. And one of the things it creates is this uh, WSGI.py um, uh, object here, uh, 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 file here. Uh, this is where it lives. Um, and if you want to change it, you can just or change this, uh, uh, this module to do whatever you want. Or there is a specific key on, uh, on the settings.py file that you can just uh, it's. I think it's WSGI application. You can just point it to another Python module, and it's good to go. Um, yeah, so that's for the WSGI. So after the WSGI, you go through some Django code on the way in, uh, and you hit middlewares. Middlewares are, are called middlewares because they're in the middle, right? They're between the views and the gate uh, of your app. So... Uh, they're kind of like windows between the request cycle and the response. It, it's called on the response as well, spoiler. Um, uh, before and after your views, so that you can interfere with the request response flow to do whatever. Um, they're executed for every process request. So they're good and they're bad, depending on what you're doing. Um, a good example on the usefulness of the middlewares and how they are implemented is uh, the Django contrib of middleware. This is the authentication middleware for Django. This is like really important stuff, right? 
Um, so what it does, uh, first you see this authentication middleware here. This, this is the class that's, that, that defines the middleware. And it has one method called process request. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, methods that you can, uh, you can use. Uh, and it, each, uh, each one is called on a different part of the request cycle. So um, this one specifically is called always on the way in. Uh, because it, it's processing the request, not the response. Uh, so what it does is it, it puts on this, it appends to the request object a user attribute, which at the end of the day is like the database user if the user is logged in, for example. Um, so you see it's really useful because you always want the user. If, if, if you're making a Django app, you're probably gonna need to deal with user. Uh, so uh, this authentication middleware already appends to the request that user. So why would we change or, or add middlewares exactly to uh, access this, uh, these common objects? So let's say you're doing an e-commerce and you want always to have the shopping cart or whatever. Um, you can write a middleware to do exactly this so, uh, but for the, the shopping cart, for example. Uh, the user is the biggest example because it's, it's obvious that everyone wants the user. Um, uh, and for specific request manipulations or integrations, so for logging, for error catching, uh, for uh, communicating with, for example, if something goes wrong, you send data to Sentry or you send an email to an admin or something, Middlewares are good for this kind of thing uh, because they're right in the middle of the way in and the way out of the request. So if something goes wrong, probably middlewares are going to catch. Um, and for post processing, this is a little bit vague, but I just wanted to, to put this here because uh, all their middlewares, their, their code that runs in the middle. So if you want to do before the view or after the view, uh, this is the place to do it. Um, but they have a couple of issues. Uh, the first big thing you need to be aware is that they are executed for every single request. So uh, it's a lot of processing. Um, and they are called between layers of Django code. So if, if, you, don't, if you want to respond eagerly, for example, uh, I would probably go with the WSGI handler instead of using middlewares because they, they already wasted a little bit of computational power to get there. Uh, and they are called in a specific order. This is something that people kind of forget. It, it, well, it is on the docs, but uh, it's, it's, I think it could be intuitive or not, depending on, on how you think about it, because they are called, uh, their list of middlewares on settings.py, uh, and they're called on the way in, they're called from top to bottom, and on the response, they're called from the bottom to the top. It's kind of weird. Um, yeah, so you have the WSGI, you have the middlewares, you have the view, you do stuff on the view, you hit the middlewares on the way back again, and if, you want, if you're answering like a template uh, response, you have the context processors as well. They're like the, one of the last things to be called before the response is done. Um, they're really useful for really specific cases because what they do is they, add, they allow adding variables to the templates context. So for example, if you have a really redundant object, you always want, want it to be there and not exactly on the view level, but on the template level. Uh, this is the, the part that you, that you need to uh, intervene. Uh, and they are really simple. They are pure functions. Uh, most of the ones that I wrote have like three lines of code uh, because all they do is receive, receive is a function that receives a request and returns a dictionary, and that's it. Um, they work really well together with middlewares as well because middlewares make th could make things available to the view, um, but sometimes it's not on the format that you want to deal with on the template, so you can just make a counterpart. And, and the example is exactly that counterpart for the authentication middleware. 
This is uh, on Django Contrib, all context processors. Uh, and it's exactly the counterpart to this uh, middleware here, this authentication middleware. Um, because what it does is uh, the middleware puts a user if it's there, but on the template level, you don't want to always ask, well, is there a request.user before you, you just asking, well, is this a super admin? Is this a staff user? Is the user logged in? You don't want to have that check of, it, of if there is a request.user before you do anything. So what this does is it's, it checks if uh, the request has a an user attribute this user attribute was populated there on the middleware if there was a user. Uh, if so, uh, it, it creates a new variable uh, called user with that uh, content. But if not, it, it puts in, instead uh, an anonymous user, an instance of anonymous, anonymous user. Sorry, that's, that's hard. Um, and this anonymous user here has all of the attributes and methods that we used to uh, use on the template level, like is staff, is logged in, I mean, is authenticated, or uh, is super admin. Uh, so uh, you can make all the checks that you want without having to do a, an if every time. So it's, it's really useful for that. And it, and it answers, uh, it, it has the permissions for that user as well if, if you need the permissions there on the template. So you see that's really simple and straightforward to implement, but it's really useful if you have that specific type of need. Um, and yeah, uh, why would we use them? Uh, they're for redundant uh, objects that you need on the template level or for fallback variables. Uh, so for example, the request.user, if the request.user is not there, you put an anonymous user instead. So that's a fallback variable. Um, to be used on the template. It, it, it's only available for the template. Um, and they prevent repetitive view code because for example, if in all of your views, you need a specific object on the context, instead of putting a decorator on the view or instead of uh, needing to write tests for that specific context, you, uh, so you simplify the, the testing as well. You can just write a context processor and test it. They are really simple, pure functions, so they're easy to test. Um, so yeah, just a quick recap. Uh, change your WSGI app to eagerly handle and respond requests. They're really useful for that. Not that much for anything else. Uh, and it's kind of a fiddly part of your Django app to, to touch. Uh, and use middlewares for mandatory request response processing or custom manipulations or integration. So for logging, for appending uh, data that needs to be there, uh, this kind of things. But be aware that it, it's uh, CPU intensive because it runs on every request response. Uh, and create context processors to prevent repetitive code inside your views and makes making testing them easier. So yeah. Uh, I know it was a lot, but that's about it. I'm gonna be on the um, uh, Web Frameworks Discord and ping me on Luciano Hatamero on Twitter if if you want to talk with me. So yeah, that's it. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the talk. And let's see. Um, yeah, to remove the screen share from this so that we can share the next one. And uh, I saw a cat, and I think in your description, you said you're a big fan of cat GIFs. Yeah. <laughs> Who doesn't love kitten GIFs? It's oh, they are, they are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this uh, this worked really well, considering that we are on almost uh, the opposite sides of the world. And yeah. that's, that's what makes pyjamas so interesting to see. Okay, the whole Python community can just come together for this and be there for a full day.
Okay, thank you very much. And uh, as you said, you're going to be on the Discord. So mm -hmm. if somebody else uh, has questions, uh, I think somebody here complained about that uh, you should be speaking Portuguese instead of English. So that person, <laughs> yes. uh, that person uh, could go to the Discord and just ask you to do the whole thing again in Portuguese. Oh, um, I could do that anytime. Just call me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye. And um, at this point, then, uh, we would normally play a, a, a short message from our sponsor. And we've had some technical difficulties with uh, these clips, but I will not give up. I'll try this again once more. And the good thing about this is, of course, that uh, we will now uh, have very short clips and not the long version of the clip. So uh, it, it, it's not all bad. So um, I'm already preparing our uh, next uh, presentation. It's uh, a recording and uh, let's see. So uh, the next speaker we have is um, Let's let's have a look at the schedule. Banu Kamampantula, and uh, he has recorded a talk uh, about a personal code search engine, um, because code discovery is, as he says, a critical dis uh, aspect of developer workflow, uh, as developers spend a lot of time just looking up code. So, um, without uh, further delay, I will now uh, start his presentation. Hi, my name is Bhanu. Today I'm going to talk about creating a personal code search engine. This will be useful for small teams and also for individual developers. Developers looking for the, uh, a relevant code snippet to solve this specific problem is an interesting topic for me personally. Why, sir? Developers of different experience levels have different ways to solve their problem. Someone with a healthy experience of, let's say, 10 years and above are more likely to solve a problem quickly. Let's consider a scenario of, let's say, someone wants to cash an endpoint, right? How do you, how do you cash your, uh, let's say, static files or maybe data files or some endpoint? Someone with a decent experience, let's say 10 years and above, are likely to figure out a solution fairly quickly without any external help. Mm -hmm. Developers who belong to a second group, or who have, let's say, an experience of five years and above, are likely to rely on some online results, probably also look through their old repositories and stick together a solution, probably longer than what the earlier group did. The third group, where you have um, developers who are fresh or probably have uh, experience up to let's say three or four years are likely to stumble upon a solution after some amount of online searches and finding a relevant code snippet and then fine tune it. In each of these three cases, uh, the, the common thread is that you have to find the right snippet. Uh, for that, you have to look look somewhere or maybe you already know the solution after and fine tuning it to that specific use case right uh, this is where i think general search engines uh, fail to solve code specific searches uh, and we need fine tuned solutions which can solve this problem what's up with that i'm proposing uh, Different organizations have different needs, right? Their code bases have evolved over time. They have certain coding standards, guidelines, practices that they uh, that they use. So, code search engines also need need to capture these aspects. Uh, how is it? Let's consider a scenario where you want to uh, search. We'll continue continue with the same example of caching an endpoint. Taking, taking the ex example closer to home, um, I'm going to show you what we do internally at Graminer, where I work. We use GitLab uh, to uh, host the code, manage the source code versioning, use the CI CD for deployment and integration. 
for this specific purpose, uh, I'm going to demonstrate how this search works in, in GitLab and see uh, what is lacking there. So this is where I am, code.dam.com. This is where your server is. My username is bhanu.k. And let's say I search for cache. You will notice that you won't find any specific results because it expects you to be in a specific project. Let's say I search for a project called Linux Starts. There's something I worked on. And you'll start noticing some results, right? You'll see some uh, cache, appraise, and git, git, git ignore files markdown files but i'm specifically interested in let's say markdown <coughs> oh, sorry yaml files or, or python files yaml is where uh, you see the results from so i know okay this this file is probably i'm interested in. but this experience is naturally unintuitive because you the moment you type you expect to see some results what i'm going to demonstrate is uh, is actually explain how the proposed solution is. Before I'll show you the proposed solution. This is the deployed version. Let's say you search for cache, right? And it's going to fetch you results from different projects that are indexed, right? You see each project here is IDP, process monitor, dynamic charts. Each are pre-indexed. I'll, sh I'll show you how this indexing is done. So, this is where we expect uh, developers to use the code search engine to find snippets relatively quickly and copy paste them and bring it to their own editor, right? You can also search for, let's say, other uh, instances, not cache. Maybe you want to search for Google Auth or membership, depending on how the YAML keys are, right? So this is going to be the end output. So. The, the approach is that they're going to download the code bases for different projects because that's what those are our, our, our gold standard uh, for this approach, right? So you in, you download the code, index it basically using TFIDF, uh, term frequency and inverse document frequency. Uh, store that and hit an API whenever you search, right? Whenever you, uh, as I showed you earlier, you could type let's say, uh, cache, membership, or log, and it hits an endpoint, which is where we serve a pickle file. Search uh, it again, search, and then find the relevant queries and get back the results. All of the work is available at github.com, become a pantala, discover hyphen workshop. For this purpose of the talk, I'm going to use three files. When I say process Python, my modules, IPython notebook, search yaml ipython notebook and a python utilities file in the search yaml uh, ipython notebook what i'm going to show you is use an existing index that we have already uh, pre-indexed or uh, pre-created and then hit the query against it right in the case of process python modules what i'm going to show you is how do you create that index which is specific to python files because the way you create indexes is what is critical to the, the code discovery aspect. So I, 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 I had an overview. How does this approach work? Before that, I need to show you how the YAML file is actually structured. Right? I have a couple of files here. Let's say open YAML file. it's visible so i have different sections here import log schedule test and url for this specific purpose they're going to use the url section the moment i type for cache i'm going to get these results right this specific yaml endpoint this endpoint is nothing but you can imagine this as roots right whenever you type let's say uh, slash uh, edit i'm going to serve this file edit.html it has a google google authentication against it for this specific one if, I, if you're going to serve static files let's say image for the landing page saying slash um, some pattern dot png i'm going to use this specific one for the for the cache um, for this specific purpose you have two types of cache one is caching at the server level the other one is caching at the at the browser level. 
So when you when we type cache, we expect this handle to pop out. Right? So let's see how that part is done. This is you. This is implemented in this search ML dot ipython notebook. So let's open that. Just give it a brief moment before it loads. Okay, let's see load. Yeah. So I import the necessary uh, modules, which are uh, from the SciPy's pass uh, module. And I, I load the specific module and and, and and JSON to just load the called key spa. So in order to use um, the index, we first need to have the pickle file, the relevant uh, matrix file, and the call keys file to actually look up which, project, uh, which specific project the keyword is matching with. It. This vectorizer is nothing but uh, uh, a T TF ID vector on top of the corpus, of, which is nothing but the input code. I'll show you how to structure that code. Um, the way it works is you, uh, let's say for the question cache, which is what you typed in the URL earlier, we have to create a, uh, a, a question vector first, which is nothing but you you fit this question for the given saved vectorizer, right? Once you do that, you'll have to compare this against, against uh, the existing uh, matrix using cosine similarity. If you're not familiar with cosine similarity, don't, no worries. I'll just show you briefly how that's done. Let's say for two different vectors, uh, you're going to calculate the cosine similarity as the, the, the dot product between them. So five times two plus zero times five plus two times zero. It comes to five times two uh, this step. So if you look at the document part of it, let's say in our case, documents are going to be the uh, YAML, YAML patterns or rather the YAML uh, code. And each uh, column here is going to be the uh, individual string, which is part of the larger YAML file. Uh, in this specific example, the, the cosine similarity is going to be the sum of all the products. This times this, this times this, this times this, this times this. The summation of all of them is something like uh, 0 0.26, right? So that's the cos cosine similarity aspect. If you want to briefly look at the TFID effect tracer, we are using scikit-learn for this. This TFID effect tracer is nothing but a collection of raw documents of a matrix of TFID features. So TFID is going to be calculated for every single word which is in your column in every single document which is in your row. So you'll have a, a humongous list of, uh, I mean, humongous matrix of rows and columns. Right. Um, no, that's out of the way. Let's see. Uh, we, we noticed that you the uh, question met, question vector itself is one by seven seven forty four. Seven forty four is the number of words you have, and it is only one because you are only looking for the word cash. It is your uh, row. The moment we calculate the cosine similarity, is going to look up against the existing matrix, which has uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, seven documents and it's going to give you cosine symmetric values against each of this you so the maximum of which is is, uh, is from is 0 0.1 and is 0 at index this kind of matches this project cluster slash gramix.yml uh, this gramix.yml is going to have the same picture that i showed you earlier in this gramix.yml file but from a different project. Right now, I'm showing you here Grammar Stars, but this is a perfect match for cluster project. What we're going to do next is for a, for the URL keys inside the YAML file. Uh, URL keys mean all the dictionary keys is nothing but dictionary uh, a key value pair. This is a key, and this is the whole. This whole thing is a value, right? Keys of zero is nothing but that specific project cluster dot cluster slash ramus.yaml. 
and we're going to save that all those values right and the moment you look for the uh, the specific match you're going to do a we're going to pick this specific project and rebuild the index so that this time the index will only have the doc, uh, documents from this specific file. Earlier, what we did was um, the the original matrix here will have the whole YAML file as one document and so on for different YAML files. But the moment you have a hit, what you're going to do is break that down further because we have to identify which specific block the code is coming from. It, which is why, where we do the next level of indexing. So these are the individual YAML components. Uh, and when you unravel it, or, I mean, when you when you unravel it and calculate the uh, maximum of it, which is to see where the match is, you'll get the indices 654. Is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Right. So uh, seven, six will be from zero to uh, six, which is the seventh item. So the matches are six, five, four, just seven, five, and four. So you'll have this match, this match, and this match. And you'll notice that each of this will have a cash, uh, cash keyword in it. These are the matches. So what you see here are the uh, in, uh, are better indented for the purpose of UI, uh, UI experience. Uh, this is essentially the same code that you see in the IPython notebook and served here over an endpoint, right? You do the same for different examples, right? Let's say we look for the keyword uh, formander and this will again uh, look up the, the first level of search is against the parent YAML files. The next level of search is you look at the uh, individual YAML components. And here you get the index 2012, which will which will again uh, be, be part of that file. Keys of six would be um, yeah would be the seventh item in this project keys.json. So this is how you would search the YAML file. But how would you create an index, right? Um, for the purpose of demonstrating the uh, index creation, I'll show you how it's done in Python. You'll, it's, just, it's a similar approach in, uh, in YAML. We go back and look at the Python process modules file. Let's give it a moment to load. <coughs> This uses a this uses an independent uh, sorry an intermediate file pyutils.py. I'll show you how the utilities are, are structured here. In the case of Python, what we want to be able to do is to find the right uh, right function. We need to be able to index the function by itself, right? So for that, we need to identify for every function what its name, its function name, what what is its doc string, and what is its um, what are the different functions that are called within the function and different methods that are called in the function. So let's get going. I'll I'll just uh, load the libraries PyoTales and OS. PyOTS is nothing but my own custom script. It has a bunch of utilities to identify the camel case for a given string. Let's say your, your doc string may have doc string with, uh, with let's say, um, S caps uh, as a single word. It, then this will break that into doc and string as, as separate tokens. Same for snake case. Uh, and we have different utilities to uh, uh, identify the identify and process the doc string, uh, its name, functions, and so on. So I'll show you whenever we we, we come across that. For this specific thing to work, we need to be I, we need to be able to identify a single Python file or maybe multiple ones. Let's start with a single one for a given repository. In this case, we are using scrape.py, which is part of uh, the discover 
uh, library. You we, we first identify the uh, path, then and then we load the module. What does loading module do? You go to PyUtils and look for load module. Uh, Whenever your session is ongoing, when you do a load module, whatever code that you have uh, in that specific file, escape.py, is going to get executed and be available uh, for you to uh, access it. Right? <clears throat> so the moment you do that, you have it saved under discover mod. With this done, we want to identify the uh, all the functions in that specific file. For every function, then name, docs, and method calls, and function calls. So let's find out all the functions. You do it by uh, script is an old file. Please ignore. It. You can just say pyotils dot file find functions of this code mod. What that will do is look for the method, uh, the function find find functions, and it will just iterate through different functions and and list list it out here. So you have all these functions in the specific uh, Python file, just script.py. Then for every function, we need to identify these properties: name, box string, function calls, and method calls, right? Because these uh, these will become our search arguments. Whenever you search for a keyword, it's a cache, and if cache matches any of these uh, attributes, name, box string, function, method, function, method calls, it's going to serve serve as a hit for our keyword. The moment you do that, um, so you, for every function, you it's the same 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 call that we have done here. We need to be able to annotate it. Annotate is nothing but it's it's another uh, method. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, uh, another function which has a dictionary of uh, the dot name functions in the process. and this internally will call uh, other functions in the file. <laughs> So you you do that, you'll find that fun, uh, for this specific function call, fun calls, uh, this is your whole doc string. This is its name, its functions, and the method calls. You, you do the same for all the functions here. And once you are done with it, <clears throat> this is only listing the method calls. So let's ignore that. Once we do that, we need to identify we need to get to a point where we have a document matrix, which is rows by columns. Here, every row will be a uh, will be related to a function. So we use a name, dot string, method calls, function calls to create a singular string for this for a given function. So this whole thing will represent the first function in our uh, in our list of functions. Notice that this is just string concatenated by a space. Uh, if you have any uh, any camel cases, snake cases, they would have been converted and so on. Now, the way to create an index is you take this whole whole document's corpus and create a vectorize out of it. Uh, and create a matrix out of it. So what TFID of vectors it takes is, is basically you give it a corpus and you create a TFID of uh, feature vector for, out of that. So this is where we we actually began with in the in the case of yaml right when we were using the search yaml uh, ipython notebook that's where uh, we actually had uh, that's where we actually started with so we use the question lowercase uh, i'm going to search for the lowercase i expect camel case snake case and this to come up because this string lower exists in these functions Right. So you you create a vector out of it and calculate the cosine similarity against that. Right. So you'll notice that this specific keyword lowercase matches against matches in so many functions. One, two, three, four, five. At least five of the functions have the uh, have matches with the lowercase. The maximum of which is with the twelfth index. So we can just look through. Uh, and see what is it that at the at the twelfth index that that give us the uh, right function. These are some more examples right? <clears throat> for annotate camel class and our glob. Uh, we'll get our glob. This is being used in fine modules. 
this is this is what the result you uh, you get for this specific keyword so this approach is powerful because you will only need to search for the files that you need and not all the other files like ignores uh, markdown files and so on so depending on what you want to search and what you're interested in you can find in this approach right so what are the next steps from here the moment you have the search index the next step would be to make it more 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 user friendly because you just don't want to get an index right you want to be able to serve it against some endpoint in our case we are using something called gramix gramix is a data science platform which is built on top of tornado web framework so uh, that is not going to be covered in this specific talk uh, I leave the documentation with you. You can go to lambda.com slash guide. That's where you'll find Gramix. You can find uh, find ways to install it and use it. I, I, I did score what is what it is. It's a it's a web server, web and data server with some handy utilities uh, for uh, for data related problems. So in our case the way we are going to uh, use this is the moment you have a hand the moment you have a file that you want to serve against or maybe uh, fetch the files you can use something called form handlers which is uh, which will let you access data uh, give it a moment to load okay these are again uh, part of the grammar.yaml file. So if you hit slash flags, it will hit this flags.csv and fetch you the entire file. You can have, again, filters on top of it. Uh, so you want to limit it or write SQL queries against it and so on. SQL queries only for the database related uh, uh, URLs. So this is what we use to serve our uh, endpoint over here. So when you uh, when you do a queue equal to membership, it's going to go to the backend, hit the index that we already have saved, and uh, and and fetch the results. But right now, you'll see that this is indexed on seven projects. We can index it on more projects. Uh, these are the projects that we have indexed these on. <clears throat> right. I hope you like the talk. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, please do raise. And um, you, you can find the material here. Please do give it a try at diamond.com slash discover. And you can find me, uh, uh, I mean, you, you can email me at let's say, at .com, or you can find me on Twitter at Thought right. All right. I hope you liked the talk. Uh, thank you for your time. Bye. Okay, so I should be back. That worked quite well. Thanks, thanks again for uh, sharing this presentation with us. And now I can see waiting in the background our backup host. And I think it's so nice that we have so many volunteers. So I will just uh, invite Dee to come in and say hi. Hello. Hey. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so you're doing all the work sitting there waiting for backups and things to go wrong and yes, <laughs> so so if, if like my home internet connection breaks then you'll take over and right. present the pajamas so where are you Canada. joining us from yeah wow so it's also on the other side of the world so I'm if you have not watched the beginning I'm from Germany so yeah, that way all the time it's are really nice too. Have you, have you, because it's 24 hours. Yeah. It's uh, like here it is. 
Exactly. Here's the day is almost over. It's dark already, yeah, and this is natural well, you have a bright day, here. so that's nice. Yeah. yeah, it's it it it's perfect. Uh, so how did you get into this uh, pajamas? Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, and then you just sign up. The organizers was asking for volunteers, and I thought, uh, let, let's let's try this. Um, I'd been on Discord yep. for the for some other Python communities, and so I thought, the more the merrier. You get to hear how different people code in different parts of the world as well, even though Python isn't like specific to a country. Um, but uh, just just seeing. How do yep. people code and approach problems? Yep. And, and it's so much fun to have a, a, a live 24 hour stream running. You you run into all these interesting problems that when you just watch the thing, you say, oh, this this could not be happening. But <laughs> like, like at the beginning, when uh, uh, like 30 seconds before the talk was about to start, somebody just dropped off and said, oh. sorry, my internet is gone. <laughs> And these things, then you have to cover. Oh well, it's. Uh, I will just uh, load okay. up the next talk, which uh, is a pre-recorded one, and uh, uh, so I will give you like thirty seconds to just um, mention our sponsor. Are you? Have you been informed about who's sponsoring our um, pi um, talk, pajamas? Um, no, gen in general, we have just one sponsor. Oh, um, you might have the to jump one. in for that. Okay, I will jump in for that. Okay, so thanks very much for showing your face, and I hope you're going to have a lot of fun watching the next few talks. And I'll say hi, bye to you, and uh, then I'll make sure that we continue with our scheduled program. But nice meeting you. Oh, that was fun. I hope I didn't scare her too much. Um, so let's uh, share another screen and get ready for our next talk. Uh, so. Um, this uh, is a talk by uh, Jesse, uh, uh, Jesse Newman, and uh, he has pre-recorded this for us and wants to uh, show us how to effectively write unit tests. So uh, to make that possible, uh, I will uh, load this talk and it's loaded. And I will then uh, hopefully share the screen and you see the end of the previous talk and now we're going to start with the next one, hopefully. Um, and I just talked about like how things do go wrong and so here, here's one that actually went wrong and Let's see if this plays now. No, and okay, so uh, this is a nice problem. Let's have a look if I can fix this quickly. Um, because um, although we had checked all the files that they would play in um, Chrome, this one th is, seems to have decided that it doesn't want to. So that is interesting. So. Um, the good thing is that um, we already had uh, the um, where does it go? Um, we already had uh, several versions of these talks, so um, maybe uh, this is fixed. If it's not fixed, then this will not be such a big problem after all, um, because. Um, one of the things that is fun to do is to fix these problems while they occur. And here we go. So I'm going to uh, now waste some more of your time and do this, uh, make this sure that we actually MP4. Uh, yep, yeah, there we go. So uh, the fun thing with this is uh, you you run into interesting problems when you do stuff. And one of these problems that we identified was that Google was, uh, uh, some of the videos would not play if they were in MOF format. And um, 
Let's have a look at this again. It seems that the um, uh, Google video link, let's have the shared video link, uh, is not helping me out. But no worries, this will work out. Um, because uh, we have something as a backup and uh, a good thing is this video talk is a bit too short so it will not be a huge problem to play this a little bit late um, now where did this uh, where's the uh, I'm actually what I'm going to do now uh, first thing is to, I will give you a chance to see me sweat in uh, full for in in, in uh, uh, like fully because I need to uh, go into um, Google to make sure that I can actually access the videos and I will go to my drive and look at this uh, shared with me video folder again to find out uh, what went wrong with this and uh, here we go here's the talks folder so let's see that that opens and let's have a look at this one and yes in this folder we have the correct version that does play and uh, hooray for the internet uh, in, because I should now be able to uh, Jesse, Go into the welcome to Gemma's Comp. So to introduce myself, I am an Algo engineer working at Hudson River Trading, which is a high frequency trading company based in New York. And part of that, I worked at Google for six years on Google Search, Google Maps, Google Drive, doing front end and back end work. So that's kind of my background. And so today we're going to talk about unit testing. Um, so the way this presentation will work is first we're going to talk a little bit about like why you should write unit tests like how is it going to benefit you personally um then we'll talk about what are the best practices for writing unit tests and finally we'll go through some python features that will make it very easy for you to accomplish those best practices while writing your unit tests okay so um i hate writing tests everyone hates writing tests so i'm going to try to convince you to do it anyway so how does testing benefit you Good testing increases the lifetime of your code. So this is for a variety of reasons. As we write code, um, you know, there's, there's this concept of like legacy code and it's code that like doesn't necessarily work all the way anymore. And it's bad for like a variety of reasons. Um, and you can try to prevent your code from becoming legacy code by writing tests. So people are going to have to improve your code if they break it because there is a test telling them that they cannot land their change. So that is really gonna help your code last a longer period of time in a good state. Um, also, like as people are doing maybe like migrations, they're like converting from Python 2 to Python 3, they're upgrading pandas, um, and people are going to need to make these changes throughout the entire code base, um, they're gonna be making changes to your code potentially. And so um, not only is your code less likely to break when that happens, which is going to make it longer lasting and more reliable, but in general, it's a little easier to get other people to do that work because your code is well tested. So your code is just going to be more up to date as people make these changes in your code base because other people are more confident making changes to your code because it is well tested. If the code is not well tested, that's the kind of case where people are like, hey, you're gonna have to upgrade pandas in your code because I have no way of knowing I did it correctly. So yeah, you're just like getting ahead of the game here, making other people handle your work for you and increasing the lifetime of your code. The next thing I'll say is that good testing increases the impact of your code. So people are more likely to use your code if for one, it's reliable, um, but also if it's just like, you know, if it's well tested and maybe they like, they need to add new features to your code. They're like, like we wanna integrate with your code. We wanna use your API, um, but there's a few things we need and can we add these ourselves? Um, yes, if your code is well tested, they can add them themselves and they're gonna feel much more confident doing that. Um, additionally, people are gonna be more comfortable integrating with your code because tests serve as really good documentation for the code. They are essentially copy and paste examples of like how the code works. So that is great for getting other users like on the systems that you're writing. 
Um, good testing lets you take on more projects. So you've created this really impactful project that has a really long lifetime, and so now you're stuck maintaining it. So how do you get out of spending too much time maintaining your code so that you can take on other projects? So one, you get new hires to work on your code um, or other developers. And other developers are gonna ramp up on your code much easier because your code is well tested. They're gonna feel more comfortable making changes. They're gonna feel more comfortable like moving to larger and larger feature requests um, because they're less scared of breaking the code. Additionally, your code is just gonna break less often because there are tests. And so that is less maintenance work for you um, so, you know, if you write tests now, you're, you're really setting your future self up for not having to spend forever maintaining it. So that is my recommendation. Um, so for this talk, we're really only going to focus on unit tests. Um, and so just because we only have 25 minutes. So there are a lot of different types of tests. I'm really only going to talk about two right now. So one is unit tests. That is a very small and self-contained piece of code that is being tested. So for example, um, typically it would be just one chunk of code inside one class. Um, if that code calls other classes, you're not testing what those other classes do. You're just testing the small chunk of code. And because it's so small and self-contained, it's very fast to run these tests and it's easy to debug because if it fails, you know exactly where the error is. There's just not that many other places the error could be. Integration tests is kind of the next step up in terms of making your test bigger and bigger throughout the system. So that is gonna test the way that different chunks of code work together. So it may go through a path of multiple different classes. So these are still important um, and you can even get bigger and bigger, um, but that is not what we're talking about. We're just talking about unit tests today. And so I just wanna make sure we're like clear about what that means and that it is not the only kind of test. So what makes a good unit test? Um, I have five things I'm going to talk about, about how, about what makes a good unit test. So one, unit tests should clearly explain what behavior they're testing. So I'm gonna have three different examples here on ways to do that. So our first example, we have these functions and each function is named very clearly. So we have test get username where account ID is none. Test get username where the account ID is in the database. Test get username where account ID is not in the database. And so it's very clear what each of these tests is testing. This means that anyone reading through your code who is like, I wonder what happens if the account ID is not in the database, they're gonna find it pretty immediately. Um, and if something breaks and you see, oh, there's an error being thrown in test get username, account ID not in database, like you know exactly what the problem is right away. So being very clear about what your tests are doing is really gonna help you out. So other ways to do this. Um, adding comments. Why won't my slides change? There we go. Okay, um, adding comments to your tests. So uh, sometimes people like to put all of the tests related to maybe get username into one test. That's a perfectly fine way to organize your tests. Um, if you do that, I recommend adding comments so that every assertion you're doing, it's very clear what it is that's being tested. Even better than that, I recommend using very good variable names and test like strings or like test objects. So to show what I mean by that, so we have in here, um, if we call get username on the string valid account ID, um, it's pretty clear to someone reading this, like we're checking what happens if you get a username when you have a valid account ID. If we call get username with the string invalid account ID, it's pretty clear what's going on and we can see, oh, and it throws a value error in that case. So you can combine all three of these, you can have great, like well-named tests with lots of comments and good variable names. Um, absolutely do all of it. Um, but those are like different ways that you can just make sure that it's clear what your unit test is testing. Number two, unit test should cover all edge cases for each public function. So I really want to, we'll go into the public function thing later, um, but for all use cases and edge cases. So we have this example function, play tic-tac-toe move, it takes in a player, it takes in an X and Y coordinate, and we wanna write a test for this function. Um, the function returns a Boolean indicating if the player won the game or not in response to the move. So um, when thinking about this, I'd really recommend you think about what are all the valid use cases for this function. So in this case, um, in a tic-tac-toe game, you can win horizontally, you can win vertically, you can win diagonally, you can play a move and just not win. Those are all valid ways that this function could be called. And so those are all things that need to have their own test. 
There are also invalid inputs. For example, um, the player that moves is not one of the players in the game. You place a piece on a square that's already been played on, or you place a piece, but the game has already been won by some player. So these, these are all things that, um, you know, the, but that's not the correct way to call your function. And you want to make sure that you're throwing the correct exception in those cases. Three, unit tests should test all public facing functions and avoid testing private functions. So let's take a look at this example. We have this public facing function, remove odd numbers. It calls a private function is even. Um, we only want to test remove odd numbers. We do not want to test we do not want to call is even. We only want to test that remove odd numbers does the correct thing. And if it uses the private function is even to do that, then great. All that matters is that, you know, for these inputs, we get the correct outputs. Um, the reason you don't want to have a test that's called something like test is even function is because it's really more of an implementation detail of remove odd numbers. And you are not testing implementation details. If someone refactors the code, you don't want your test to break. If your test breaks due to a refactor that does not change the logic of the code, like the same inputs are still given the same outputs, you just shuffled stuff around a little bit and now your test is failing, that's that's a false negative test. Like your test is failing even though nothing went wrong. Um, and when people get those a lot, they start not trusting when they see test failures. They're like, oh, well, things fail all the time and it's nothing um, and you don't want that. So you know, be very careful about testing the correct things so that you don't test things that, that, you know, are not, don't test implementation details. Okay, number four, unit test should contain as little logic as possible. So I really like this. Um, so we have this function have same domain names and we're gonna write a test for it. So we, in our test, we have these different domains and these different pages and we combine them into strings and then we call have some domains on it. So if you looked at this function, you would probably think that what is being tested is that we're calling have same domains on the strings google.com slash maps and google.com slash calendar. And we're confirming that they're equal. That's what the assert does and it's returning true. Um, that is actually not what this does. We, there's a bug hidden in this test. Um, and we will see on the next page what that looks like. So what we have actually created are the strings slash maps and slash calendar. And that's because os.path.join does uh, some kind of weird stuff when you have slashes in the strings. So, you know, this test is gonna pass, but it's also gonna pass um, in a lot of cases where it shouldn't, where like you break have same domains and it keeps passing. Um, that's not great. You know, this this is going to cause a lot of just bad tests. Um, so what I recommend doing instead is to be very explicit, very verbose about what it is you're testing. So rather than like constructing these strings, you should just pass the string in directly. Um, in this particular example, you know, we started out with a long function and we ended up with a short function by the end. Um, that is usually not the case in real life. In real life, typically the reason you're adding logic to tests is because your test is super long and it contains a lot of duplicate code and it makes you sad to look at. So you go and add a bunch of logic to try to like shrink the test and make it a little just like more concise and less duplicated. Um, and that instinct makes sense when you're working with like real code, but it is not the instinct you want when working with tests. Um, because introducing logic is where we get bugs from. And if there's bugs in your test, we've ruined the point of the test. Uh, we or we can't test the test. So you really want everything to be extremely clear. Um, in addition to that, it really serves as better documentation. You know, in the previous example, I would kind of have to think pretty hard about what it is that's being tested. In this example, it's extremely clear without having to dig into the code at all. Um, and that's that's great. It's very self-documenting. It's very clear what's happening. It's a lot harder to introduce bugs. Five, unit tests should not test code outside the scope of the test. Um, so the text on these slides, we're actually gonna dig into a little bit on the next section. Um, but the main thing I will say is 
so we talked about we want our unit test to test like a little small chunk of code, right? Um, very self-contained. So we need to keep it self-contained. And that's something we need to figure out how to do. And typically you do that by mocking stuff out, which is a thing we're going to learn how to do. So in this particular example, we have this um, function, get username, that is making an HTTP request. Um, making an HTTP request in a test is bad. Do not do that. Um, it's going to be slow. It's going to be flaky. You know, your network connection goes down and now your test is failing, but like, that's not what you're testing. You're not testing your network connectivity. You're testing the, the logic and the code. Um, and so, you know, you, you just made the scope too big and it's going to slow it down a lot. So that's the kind of thing that like is outside the scope of the, of the, a unit test. Um, and really calling into any other class is usually outside the scope of a unit test. So let's go a little more into detail about how you would mock something out though if you wanted to so python testing tips um this is that same function but bigger um we've get username it takes in an account id which is a string it uses that account id to make a um request dot get http request um it passes it then as a parameter and then it gets the response it confirms that the response is successful and then it gets the json out of the response and checks the username um and sees sees what, what it is and returns that okay um i also want to call out this is located in our module project.data.fetch data which is going to be important on the next slide on the next next slide um so we're going to learn how to patch things so unit test.mock has what is called a patch decorator. And so when you put a patch decorator on top of your test, what it is going to do is it's going to find the function located at that location. And so it's going to go into the module project.data.fetchData and find the function request.get. So you, you have to construct that string referencing the exact location of the function you want to mock out correctly, or it will not mock out the correct instance of the function. So that is why it's important to know what module the code that we're testing is in. Um, so when you do that, when you do that at patch, it's going to automatically inject a parameter into our test. Um, and so the parameter has injected, we're going to call mock client get, and it's of type magic mock, which is just what gets injected. Um, on a magic mock so mock has a few different um attributes one of those attributes is return value when you set the return value that represents whenever client.get or request.get gets called um it's going to return this return value object so you can set attributes on that so that if you want to access it you can so you know and on the previous slide, let's go up to it. We access, you know, request.get returns a response, and then we access response.ok and response.json. So in our return value, we need to set ok and json. Um, so functions on a mock will always return another mock. And so that's why um, when we're setting the json attribute, that's a function, so we need to set that function's return value, and we set it to this dict username to name one. What this does is, on the next line, when we call get username with zero zero two four four three, it's going to call our get username function. But when the code gets to request dot get, um, it's not going to do a request dot get. It's just going to automate automatically return this mock that we've created. And so then we try to access the mock's OK parameter, it's just true. When we try to access the mock's JSON function, it returns username name one. And that's actually going to happen no matter what you pass in to get username. Um, so we should figure out how to be a little pickier about that. So the next thing we'll talk about is side effect. So, you know, you have your return value where you can say what you want to return but what if you don't just want to 
turn something? What if you really just want to replace it with a whole function? So you can do that with side effect. So side effect, you set equal to the function that you want to replace requests.get with. And so we have replaced it with this fake get function. Um, inside of fake get, we make a mock, we set those attributes on it, and we return it. So these two slides do the exact same thing. But what if we want to do something cooler than the exact same thing? Maybe we want to check that the parameters it was called with are correct. Um, so at the top of the side effect function, you can see that, you know, we take in the URL and parameters because that's what request.get takes in. And we are asserting that they are what we expect them to be. Um, this is important to do. When you are mocking out a piece of code, you want to make sure that, like, you called that code correctly, right? And so we're making sure that we called request.get with the attributes we expected. And so that's what this does. Um, final thing about side effect, it's overloaded. If you want to do something weird, like the first time I call this function, I want you to return username one. The second time I call it, I want you to return username two. You can do that by setting side effect to an array and it will iterate through it each time you call it and return the next thing in the array. Uh, let's talk more about mock. So we we mentioned this a bit. So you can just create a mock and you can set these attributes on it. So a weird thing about mocks is um, username one, since it's a mock, I can actually call any function or any attribute of this and it would return another mock. So if I was like, I want username one dot hello, it would return a mock. If I'm like, I want username one dot get fake function name, it will return a mock. Like it just always returns a mock, no matter what. So um, this is just a different way of writing that previous slide. There's other ways you can make mocks. Um, but so if you want to have something a little more specific, so let's say, well, we're mocking out request.response, right? We don't want it to have all these fake functions on it. Like we really only want to have functions that actually exist on request.response. So we can pass in the class we want to mock out. And that's going to make it so that if you call a function that exists in request.response, it'll return a mock. If you call a function that does not exist on request.response, it'll throw an error. So um, there's probably, I mean, maybe you, you want a little more flexibility than that. And that is why we have seal. This is new in Python 3.7, and I'm really pumped about it. So you can say, like, like let's say you have a use case for one of the things you want to do is you want to assert that a lot of these things do not exist on an object or something. And so you can't have mock pretending things exist that don't exist. So you can use seal. What seal does is it says, okay, any attribute or function that you have not specifically defined prior to this point is out. So if I tried to call like username one dot hello now, um, that's not gonna work because I didn't define hello on username one and I have sealed the mock and said it cannot create any further functions or attributes. Uh, assert called with and call args. So we had on this previous slide, um, you know, we did side effect and then we asserted some things about the parameters in particular um, that the URL and that the params were correct. So this is such a common use case that there's actually a little bit of easier ways to do it. Um, and you do them with assert called with. There are a couple other asserts. There's like assert called once with, there's like, there's a whole variety of them. Um, but the most simple one is assert called with. And what you do is you give it the parameters. And if those are the parameters the function was called with, then it asserts true. And if they're not, it asserts false. And I should clarify, when I say the parameters they're called with, you have to do it in the exact same way. So when we called request.get, we gave it a string. And then we said params equals this dict. So we named one of the parameters, but we did not name the other parameter. And so you have to do that the same way for this assert to pass. Um, yeah, so it, yeah. Okay. Um, there's also call args. So if you need more flexibility, um, for example, maybe you want to make some matchers, you want to um, really just dig into what the call arguments were and only look at a couple of them or something. Um, we have this call args attribute. Um, if you want to compare against call args, what you used to have to do is create this call wrapper around the parameters you wanted to compare against. That or like 
index into call args and you ended up with this like really gross looking code, but we have new in Python 3.8, um, these args and quargs attributes on top of call args so that you can access them in a much prettier way. Okay, we have three minutes left on the last part. Um, okay, async. So async, you know, everyone's writing asynchronous Python. Um, it's very awesome. So this is just a rewrite of our previous get username function to be asynchronous. So it's now async def instead of def. Um, we're putting it in a client session instead of doing request.get. Um, we're awaiting everything. So this is our asynchronous version of that function. So how do we test this? The way we test it is with async mock. So unit test.mock added async mock in Python 3.8. So when you do this patch decorator thing, um, you want to include new callable equals async mock. And that tells it that your mock should not be a magic mock, it should be an async mock. And then every time you create a mock, you basically just want to make it an async mock again. Um, and so that will let you do your test asynchronously. So yeah, basically we have, you know, we create our async mock, we set the parameters on it all in the exact same way. And then we call get username with a wait because that's how you call asynchronous functions. Um, and this test works. So the only thing I wanna add is we have this pytest.mark.asyncio decorator in here. So what, what is that? So we didn't really talk about pytest, but it's a really common way of running your unit tests. Um, so if you are using pytest and you have some asynchronous unit tests, they are not gonna work by default because um, you can't call asynchronous code from synchronous code. So in order to make sure pytest is running your async tests correctly, you add this decorator to your test and then pytest has just got it from there. It knows exactly how to handle it once you have that decorator. Okay. Um, thank you so much for joining Pajamas Comp. Um, it was great to meet you. Um, this is pre-recorded. I didn't meet you. It was still great. Um, but yeah, so feel free to connect with me online if you have further questions. I'm on Twitter. I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, have a fantastic December. for later viewing on the oh yeah thank you very much uh try this again thanks <laughs> thanks uh, for the talk jesse we've had minor technical problems but so far we didn't have to click on our pre-prepared uh, technical problems picture which would have been this but um nope we're still on track for this so things are working and we are also almost on time and our next uh, speaker is a live speaker so at least the video is not going to mess up and um he's the cio of mouse mouse palm media it's jason mcdonald's the author of the upcoming book that simple python and he's always the joy to talk to so jason welcome <laughs> and hey, let's see if we can it's hear something yes hey um oh do, yeah, do uh, we're still alive here. So after, like, I can hear you perfectly. That's it, it's it's working. Okay, good, good, good. All right, let's let's see if the screen share works now. Let's so see, the next thing, the screen share will work uh, probably because I will click add to stream now, and uh, Yay. as you can see, uh, it, it's so nice. So, um, as we are already one minute over the planned starting time, I will let you get through this uh, right away. Uh, start a... with, uh, you're thinking about objects wrong. There you go. <laughs> and so is everyone else. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, I was preparing for this over the weekend, and I decided I hated my slide deck, so I deleted it. And I went ahead and just went with Visual Studio Code for this. This is a new thing for me. So, um, uh I probably don't need to reintroduce myself here, um, so I'll just get into it to save some time. Um, as Martin mentioned, though, I, I am the CEO lead developer at Mousepaw Media, and it's worth mentioning that um, I have been training interns for quite a, quite a number of years, so a lot of the stuff I'm, I'm going to be talking about is based on teaching them how object-oriented programming was supposed to work, uh, because the thing is... If we want to find someone to blame for thinking about objects wrong, blame university-style Java. 
uh, it's it's not Java itself. It's the way the universities teach it, and it's kind of uh, just kind of replicated over the past you know twenty some odd years. Um, and it's it's a very backwards way of of thinking about the problem. See, the problem is we missed Alan Kay's point when he started talking about object oriented programming and objects in general. Um, we we kind of misunderstood what he was getting at, uh, but. Thankfully, we can correct it with the existing tools we have, especially in Python, um, because um, it's not really a change in tools, it's a change in thinking. So uh, you can you already know all of these techniques. I'm not really going to show you any new techniques today, probably. Uh, maybe it'll be new for some people, but most of this you probably already know. Uh, but if you're more more advanced developer and you're watching this, stick around because I, I am going to actually make an immutable class at the end. So if you've been wondering how to do that, I'm going to show you. Uh, and as, as Martin mentioned, I'm also the author of Dead Simple Python, which is I love that book cover. That that just makes me happy right there. Um, so Dead Simple Python is a book all about um, the uh, learning the Python programming language when you're coming from another language. So like C++ or, or what have you. Uh, JavaScript or Ruby or Java. And so it helps you learn idiomatic Python. And I, I, there's some stuff in here that I learned in the process of researching it. So even if you've been doing Python for, you know, what, 10 years, you'll, you'll still learn something from this. So. Uh, this is coming out May 2021 from No Search Press. Very excited for that. Uh, also, all my notes are going to be on GitHub. So you can find them at github.com, codemouse92, talk underscore thinking about objects. I'll stick this into uh, Discord later as well. All right. So I'm going to cover three different components of, or I'm going to basically tackle this problem of objects in three different angles. Um, and uh, those angles are blueprint, boundaries, and behavior. Blueprint, boundaries, and behavior. So starting with blueprint being software architecture. Alan Kay, in a message to the Squeak mailing list back in October 1998, said, I'm sorry that I long ago coined the term objects for this topic because it gets many people to focus on the lesser idea. The big idea is messaging. Um... Messaging is kind of what I'm going to be focusing on here, largely. Messaging is the key of how you need to be approaching object-oriented programming. And the cool thing is this means it's no longer at odds with functional programming. You can do functional patterns with objects uh, as long as you bear this in mind, as you're going to see. But see, the problem is tutorials have historically tricked us into flipping the logic, which is where we get this university-style Java from. Because we all learned object-oriented programming basically the same way. So I'm just going to kind of throw up an example here. Uh, so <clears throat> we've all seen this terrible thing. Uh, we're we're going to create a class, you know, boys and girls. Uh, it's called animal. And, and then we're going to get more specific. And we're going to create a cat, which inherits from animal. And uh, um, it's going to have a name. And so we're going to name the cat. Uh, and the cat needs to be able to meow. And so we'll say print meow. Help if I can spell. Uh, and it needs to be able to eat. So we'll have it eat food. Um, and uh, we'll use an F string to be trendy here. Uh, eats food. Great. Okay, so now we can create our cat. And our cat's name is Fluffy. And the cat meows. And the cat eats uh, salmon. Okay, this is insipid. My, my soul burns with this example, if I'm totally honest with you. If I just run this. Okay, meow, and it eats salmon. Okay, it's cute. It's also wrong. Is it even, I've immediately gone completely off the rails in terms of how object-oriented programming is actually supposed to work. Uh, because the, when you're writing tutorials, this flips the logic on a, on its head. And it's a it's a solution in search of a problem. And of course, part of that's because writing tutorials is hard. I just spent two years doing it with, with this book. Uh, you know, writing examples is very difficult because you have to think, what do I want to teach and how do I present that? So what problem can I use? Um, which can be annoying. So uh, to get around that then, um, sorry, we have to think about the design of the behavior of the code first. Forget classes. Design the behavior of the code first. So let's get this out of our 
site. And I'm gonna I'm gonna build an example here. I got to delete these. I'm gonna I'm gonna rework these. Um, so let's let's bring this up here. So we have um, we have uh, this this animal adoption scenario. I'm gonna build present animals who are up for adoption and then automate the adoption process. Most of this is gonna be stub functions, but you know, bear with me here. So I need to think about what do I actually want this code to do? Um, well, I want to be able to do two things. I need to be able to display animals and I want to be able to adopt an animal. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, uh, let's see, display animals. This is where objects come in. We have to think about objects as units of state. Objects are messages by K's description, or units of state, if you're thinking about functional. Uh, so we start thinking about the messages that we need to pass between the functions. So for example, we have display animals, um, and we have a, a list of, of animals, which is called adoptables. Um, we need to have, um, we need to be able to adopt an animal. Uh, self, an animal, or not self, what's wrong with me? Animal adopter, and we'll say adoption pool. Okay. Um, and then when we adopt an animal here, we need to verify the adopter. Um, we need to process the, the, the payment for all the adoption expenses. That's also on the adopter. So those are the that's the message we're passing, as it were. We need to register the animal. So we need to register an animal to an adopter. And we need to mark adopted um, some animal. Okay, so I have these here. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna go ahead and put these up here. Oh, it'd help if I could type today. There we go. And we'll just make those blank for the moment. But we have our we have our stubs here, and uh, this is now demanding some things. So let's just pass none for the moment. There's only one argument on the first one, not three. Okay, so if I run that. So the important thing here um, is that classes are not an organizational structure. We're thinking about this behavior uh, without regard to classes whatsoever. And um, uh, it's it's running, it doesn't do anything yet, but it runs. Uh, so we're thinking about uh, about the behavior first. Now we can start thinking about the messages, that is the classes, because uh, the uh, classes are defined by their constituent data. So I'm gonna go ahead and create one of these. We have to have an animal. So an animal, let's think about what the constituent data is for this. An animal needs to have Let's see. Uh, let's do our initializer. Um, it needs to have a name, a gender, an age, a breed, and a species. And I'm going to just quickly turn these into attributes here. So, Control D to, whoops, let's select one of these commas. Control D to select all my commas. It gives me my multi cursor. And then I can do extend my multi cursor there. And. Copy that self that name equals. One other attribute I want to be able to add in here is notes. I want to be able to store some notes, but we're gonna figure that part out later. Uh, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna supply it now. Where am I? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so this is this is our animal class here. Um, one of the important things to note is that the constituent data is going to inform the structure. It doesn't actually have to be a class. Could it be a dictionary? Could it be a named tuple? Hey, don't cringe. They're neat. Could it be a data class? Um, so example of, of one with a data class, let's, let's take a look at adopter. Um, this adopter, you know, I, I don't really need to do anything special with this. I just need a few pieces of information. That's all I really need. So data class is a good fit for this. So a data class, and this just creates an ordinary class, um, you know, with this data class uh, decorator. There's some cool features with this if you read the docs. But I'm just going to create a few fields, 
And these are all going to wind up being instance attributes once the decorator does its magic. So there's an adopter. I have name, government ID, address, phone number, email. Pretty simple. Um, I know that I don't need anything more because this is just an adopter. I don't need any special functionality on this. So I have my adopter. Um, another common mistake that we make when we're structuring code, though, is we start thinking about, well, how can inheritance work its way into it? Again, it's because of how we're taught. You know, we, we think somewhere instinctively along the way, well, you know, we have cats and dogs. So we should we should create a cat uh, class and we should create a dog class. OK, here's the problem. This doesn't help us. In this example, the cats and the dogs don't really have any additional data. We say, well, they have additional behavior. But that's exactly the problem. It, inheritance needs to extend the meaning, not just the behavior. Because, again, classes are defined by their constituent data. Everything's about the data. It's all about the data. So we don't need to do that. Now, inheritance does come in handy in many ways. Let's make a doctable stop pie. Um, I'm cheating a little bit here. There's really no major need for this, but, you know. Um, I'm going to use an abstract base class and make an adoptables class. And the reason I'm making this is because I'm expanding on the meaning. I'm expanding on the data. It's not just a collection. It's a collection of animals that are up for adoption. Um, so I can foresee some additional uh, ways I need to work with that data, um, some additional attributes of that data. But, you know, I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of guilty of finding a, a, a problem to fit the solution here, but, um, you know, I only have 25 minutes. Nope, that's supposed to be a list. So I'm going to create a collection here, and it's got adoptables, uh, or adoptable, and then I'm going to append an animal. Okay, it's basic, very basic sort of thing. Uh, but I inherit from collection, and the nice thing about inheritance is it allows you to make a promise about the data via the functionality. You're not making a promise about the functionality, mind you. This is where it's easy to make this mistake. We think, oh, that just means it implements iter. No, it means that it is iterable. This is about the data. The data is iterable. Uh, it's also, it, we know that the data has, you know, it contains things. So we can check if something is in the collection. And it has a length, a number of elements. Self.adoptable. All right. So, there we go. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, period that would be great. Okay, so this is just making promises about this constituent data. It is, the data is a collection. That's why we're using the inheritance. So moving on then to the second point before I go any further is brief word about this, this issue of boundaries. Um, Alan Kay said the design should be such that there are clear fences that have to be crossed when serious extensions are made. So he's mainly talking about language design here. This is to the squeak mailing list, but I believe this applies to objects as well. Fences are better than walls in general. And a good example of this was this underscore. There is nothing actually stopping me from being able to go, you know, animal dot notes. I can do that if I want to. Uh, but this underscore indicates I shouldn't be doing that, that this is managed by the class. An object should know how to handle its own data. And that underscore says, hey, I'm managing this. You shouldn't mess with it. But here's the problem. Data hiding, which you see in like Java and C++, whatever, is usually a mistake. It overcomplicates things. It interferes with extension. It interferes with testing. It interferes with debugging. One of my interns uh, was working in C++, needed to test how um, data was being transformed by a, by a setter into the internal attributes of, of, of an object um, as part of one of the unit tests and had to work around the data hiding. And it was a royal pain. So... You know, in general, data hiding just does not help. Flags are better because it means that you're leaving it up to the user to decide, hey, do I need to cross this boundary? Can be crossed, but they have a warning. They're, you know, taking their, their you know, taking the bugs on themselves at that point. Um, and this is why I prefer this to data mangling. I could do uh, name mangling if with the double underscore score at the beginning if I want to, but I really only use this for like critical managed stuff that like there's no conceivable reason why this needs to be accessed. It could really mess things up. I 
pretty much never do that. Um, in general, don't do not do that. Okay, so then moving on to the third point here. I think I'm doing all right on time. Uh, behaviors. Uh, this is really the behaviors of the class itself. The key in making great and growable systems, says Alan Kay, is much more to design how its modules communicate rather than what their internal properties and behaviors should be. And again, we saw this with MAME here. We're thinking about um, how these are communicating with one another rather than thinking about uh, what classes do we want. We figure out the messages first. So I can... Uh, do some of this here. Um, note I haven't really written any getters or setters yet. Well, okay, I kind of have one here. Uh, but, you know, I don't really have many getters or setters. Java would have you write a getter and setter right off the bat uh, and do it for everything. But if you could just access the attribute directly, why bother? Uh, getters and setters have specific purposes. Getters are for data transformation and data filtering. Um, so an example of that would be if we wanted to add a string function to animal, so that way we can print out the animal nicely. This string function, I'm just going to copy from my notes here to save some typing. Okay, so this is just going to transform um, the name, age, gender, breed, species, and all the notes into a nice little compact string. So this is performing data transformation. It's also technically performing data filtering. We're selecting certain pieces of data to display, although arguably I've displayed them all. Setters, by contrast, are for data validation and data transformation. Example of this is, is adoptables. If I um, have a, um, where's my notes? So if I want to be able to mark an animal as adopted, I have to be able to validate this thing is actually in there. Ask forgiveness, not permission. So I'm going to remove the animal. Um, but, oh, go away. But if, actually, I'm just going to steal this here. If it's not there, then I'm just going to print a nice little error message and I'm going to need sys for my standard error. So this is a setter because it's performing data validation uh, this is an example of performing the transformation because it is uh, taking the information, turning it into something else. In this case, appending it to a collection. Properties should not be counted out. Properties are neat. Um, with, uh, let's see, where was that one? That's on animal. So with this notes thing, property. I like properties because it gives you a nice uniform interface. Instead of having to remember which thing is a setter uh, method that you have to call and which thing is just uh, an attribute, you can just provide what look like attributes and call it good. It doesn't work if you have to pass a bunch of arguments, but in some cases it, it works out really super well. I think this is one of those because maybe this shelter has a policy that you never remove previous notes. Um, I have seen places that do that. Um, you just add new ones. And we're going to transform the data in some fashion, you know, capitalizing the note before appending it to the list of notes. So properties are okay. Um, again, I'm trying to find a, a, a solution, to, a problem to fit the solution, but you get the general idea. <clears throat> uh, and if we really need to remove from this, we can access notes internally, but I just want to be able to add, add new ones. So you'll see what this looks like. Um, so because I'm kind of running out of time here, I am going to actually just hijack the fully written version of main. So you can just see briefly what I did here. And that is, here we go. So, um, most of the time you just see I'm accessing the attributes here, but you know, here's, uh, here we're creating Fluffy. It's a one-year-old female Maine Coon, hates dogs. We have Butch, a one-year-old male uh, coyote mutt mix. I owned this dog, okay? Coyotes are enthusiastic, friendly, and dumb as rocks. The coyote mixes are just dumb. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to display those animals, and then I'm going to adopt them. So let's see if all went well. Um, uh, it would help if I actually named something. Oh, yes. I actually have to create adoptables. I just need a global instance here. And that should... Yeah, there we go. 
So you see it prints out the data and then get the payment information, register, et cetera. Now I promised really quick, I think I can just get away with this. Um, I promised I would make something immutable and I'm going to do that with animal because I want to actually use a set and adoptables rather than a list. But to do that, I need to have it be hashable and you really don't want it to be hashable unless it's also immutable. So let's do that. So with animal, the way you can do immutability, and immutability is great because it cuts down on your errors, um, changing things that you shouldn't be changing. It's an extra level of, of protection in my mind. So I like immutability. I like to use slots for this. Now, you can just list all of your attributes and call it good. I could just, you know, just do this. And then I could, I like adding weak ref because I like being able to get non-reference counting references, non-counting references. Uh, this would be like fully immutable thing, but I'm going to add in here dictionary as well. So we can add this notes and this age because those two things are going to change, but the rest of these things should not be changing. So this is going to be partially immutable. Leave off dictionary and make sure all your attributes are in there if you want it fully immutable. Um, and then I'm going to do set adder, self name value. And the way this works, there's a bunch of different ways people do this, but the, my personal favorite way is you check if the attribute is already there. Um, and then you also check if it is found in slots. Um, if it is already there and is found in slots, then you raise this attribute error. Otherwise, you call object set adder. Now, here's the thing. Some smart alecs like to point out that this is not actually immutable because you can always use set adder externally to override this. Yes, true. But if you're going to do that, you deserve whatever bugs you're going to get. You know, Python's all about fences rather than walls. We are all intelligent adults. Uh, if you're going to bypass things, maybe you have a good reason. Testing, you know, for example, being able to, you know, inject something during debugging or whatever. But most of the time, you just shouldn't be doing that. We also need delete adder. I have actually never seen anyone do this outside of a, a set adder. So <laughs> this is just wrong. Okay. Um... All right, and then if we're going to do this, I'm going to go ahead and hash. Make it hashable and comparable. I'm not going to go over that, but uh, we're going to make it make it hashable, make it comparable with one another. Because I've done this, then I can change one thing here. I can change this to a set, and it still works. We can still add notes, and yet the rest of this is actually immutable. So, like, name, gender, breed, and species cannot be changed once it's defined, and if I try... I can just say, uh, Butch, maybe he gets a, maybe someone wants to give him a tougher name. He says, oh, let's name him Butcher instead, you know, and now I'm going to get an attribute error. It's read only. So effectively immutable. It's as close as Python will let you get to immutable without, you know, actually inheriting from a name tuple or some such horror, but there you have it. So, um, I am going to be taking questions in a sec, but I want to make sure, and I have all of this on GitHub, like I said, including the principles here. Um, you design the behavior of the code first. Classes are not an organizational structure. They're units of state or messages, and they're defined by their constituent data. Uh, constituent data is going to inform the structure. Does it actually have to be a class? Could it be something else? And if you use inheritance, that should be extending the meaning, not the behavior. Uh, boundaries, data hiding is usually a mistake. Just use flags. An object should know how to handle its own data, but a user sh is probably a better expert than you on whether or not they need to get around the fences. Uh, getters are for data transformation and data filtering. Setters are for data validation and data transformation. If it's just a bare getter or setter, except in the, that one weird case of properties, just don't write getters or setters. Traits of, consist of constituent data define the behavior. So things like special methods, is it iterable, mathematical, comparable, um, immutable? You know, these things are determined by the data. Anyway, that is, uh, I believe, how object-oriented programming is supposed to work. And the cool thing is it's completely compatible with functional paradigms. Um, so you don't lose your mind as much. So I think I have a couple of minutes for questions here before I have to turn this over. Yeah, um, I, hey, uh, by the way, thanks, thanks for the talk. And <laughs> so you didn't have to... Uh, 
give sacrifices to the demo gods, but you have a lot of animals in there, so maybe they were happy with that. Uh, <laughs> we we don't have a real question here yet, but we have at least somebody who has to admit that uh, uh, you managed to hurt his head, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, Richard. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, it I've... didn't hurt too much. Yeah, yeah, the, the property's kind of an unusual thing. It's fairly controversial, but if, if, if people don't agree with my use of properties, they can throw that out and keep the rest. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, uh, well, we, we did the practice on yesterday, and I, I thought when, when you watch this for the first time, you really get a bit confused, so it's worth just looking it up again and playing it at your own speed to just find out what you just learned. Uh, here's a question. Oh, nice. Let's see. Uh, there we go. Um... Uh, any favorite resources in uh, OOP in Python you recommend? <laughs> Mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally blunt. The whole reason I wrote that simple Python is because I had a really hard time finding good resources that explained some of these inner workings. I mean, a, a lot of this came out of, um, you know, a dead simple Python. I was researching the inner workings of how things were actually being assigned and how an inheritance was working, method resolution order, and all this jazz. And that really changed how I was thinking about objects. Uh, because I was coming from other languages, you know, other object-oriented programming languages originally, where it was kind of more the university Java style, and that's what I was used to. And then I realized that Python does not work that way, and arguably none of the other languages should either. Even if they do have data hiding, that whole university Java style is kind of backwards. So once I understood how Python did things, then idiomatic patterns became more obvious, and then that, those kind of got retroactively, you know, worked their way into my... Uh, my C++ style. Hmm. We have time for one more question. This time, the, this time a real question from Richard. Uh, would you not also use a private flag and property to implement effective immutability? Well, you could, but I would say that's more managed than immutable. Immutable means that once it's defined, that it's not going to change in memory. And, um, you know, granted, what I have is, is effective immutability because there is that workaround. But the difference is that you know, because you ca because you actually get an attribute error when changing on an immutable or an effective immutable, and that's what you want. You want an attribute error. So um, having the property really just gives you managed data, like I have with notes, um, but it's not going to give you um, the same sort of thing. Now, I will say really quick that you can. Um, you don't actually have to define the uh, the initial values of all of these things in your initializer when you're doing this this you know this immutable thing i have it it doesn't wait for it just to be initialized there it's once there's any value assigned to whatever your immutable you know whatever your slot value is once there's a value then it can never be changed so you can assign it one time um so how you use that is up to you but yeah i want to make sure it's clear is the difference between immutable and managed okay thank you very much i think we don't have any more time for question but i'll be uh, in discord <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, you can go over to Discord uh, or follow the next talk here. Uh, thanks again, Jason. Thank you. Bye. And so uh, I'm just going to invite Chok to come, come in again. Uh, and she's going to take over presenting now um, from me. Uh, so I think you have endured me long enough. And also the next talk is done by another Martin, but uh, Chok will tell you about that. So, Chuck, take over. Right. So, um, yeah. So, well, Martin, do you, you want to go or you want to stay? You can stay. I don't mind. Yeah, I stay for a few more seconds, here. but I will not press any more <laughs> buttons. <laughs> uh, okay. So, uh, yeah. So, we will have our next speaker is also called Martin. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Actually, I, I'll tell you a fun story. The first time I met them is actually at a EuroPython in Basel, I believe. And uh, so we had a had a lunch together, and then both of them show up, and they both introduced themselves as Martin. I was a bit confused. <laughs> yes, hi, Martin. Yay. Hi there. Hi there. Hi, Joe. Um, hi, Martin. Long time not seen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, uh, so Martin is uh, the organizer of GeoPython, and also he is, uh, well, I think your area is mostly GeoPython, right? <laughs> yeah, of course, GeoPython and, of course, EuroPython and many other things. Yeah, so uh, maybe you have already seen Martin in another conference, because I know that he presented <laughs> in a lot of different conferences. And um, so, 
Yep. Uh, oh, all guys here as well. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, now it's getting crowded. Uh, I'm, I'm yeah, going to say goodbye. <laughs> okay. So, okay. We only have one Martin left. So, yeah, uh, Martin, uh, if you're ready, then uh, I would show your presentation and you can take us away. I'm ready. <laughs> Good. So, I'm talking about oh. Python. I do a little bit introduction in a few modules. Um, I will just show the uh, Jupyter um, Lab or Jupyter Notebook here. And everything I show is on GitHub. So the link is um, here. Um, you can actually, I will put it in the chat later too. So the first thing always, if you use Geo modules, um, unfortunately, they don't come installed with Conda, for example. So we have to manually install them. And um, it's very important to create an uh, environment for them, because if you try to install it in the base, you will probably fail. So here is uh, the recipe to install everything, uh, creating the uh, pajamas environment, for example. And the second drawback is Geo modules is also uh, they're a little bit behind in version. You can't use Python 3.0. Um, nine or eight um, at the moment. You have to stick with 3.7 for a while. Always go um, two versions um, down, then you are quite safe. The reason for that is um, this module, actually uh, Rasterio, which depends on GDAL, and GDAL is really a, a tough um, thing to compile and, and have it ready for all the platforms, including Mac OS or Linux, etc. Also Windows, of course, even on Windows, it's really hard to, to get this um, done. So after installation, um, this takes a couple minutes. Um, yeah, actually, I did it this way. So you have the pajamas environment. So um, I also installed JupyterLab. So you activate it, you, you start JupyterLab with this environment, and that's what you get. Uh, and the first module I want to show you is called Shapely. Um, Shapely, here is the documentation of it, basically supports um, something called um, simple feature access. It's a standard to represent points, line strings, polygons, etc. So of course, points, simple, polygons, um, not that simple. Line strings, there are two, um, two versions. One is this line string here. And the second one, I didn't make a graphics of that one, is the so-called linear ring. Um, that's just the same one, just closed. Um, polygons are always closed, of course. And you can't have special cases um, of polygons. Um, only uh, this kind of polygons are allowed. You can't, for example, have intersections in the polygons. If, if you have something like that, you have to create two polygons. And then you have a so-called multi-polygon. So we have, um, from every geometry here, we have a multi-representation. So we have multi-line strings, multi-points, and multi-polygons, um, and so on. And uh, what I forgot to mention is, of course, you can also have polygons with one or more holes. Um, many countries, for example, they, they have some, some sort of, of enclaves. For, Switzerland, for example, has two enclaves, so we need those holes. So that's basically it. So let's construct something using Shapely. What I did, I, I could actually do something, uh, just draw something, um, digitize the points, and create my polygon. I created a hexagon just for fun, um, 60 degree. Um, and some sinus, cosine, cosine, voodoo, and then you get um, the, the hexagon. So let me execute that. You see the first point. I made a radius of 10, so it's it's okay from the size. And okay, these are the, the points of the hexagon. And something important, if, if we define a um, polygon in Shapely, the first and the last point must be the same. So we, we have to add uh, the first point at the end, again, I just do that with appending the, the first coordinate. And um, so now we, we actually have the first and the last point um, uh, defined as with the same coordinates. If this is not the same coordinate, then we can't really um, create what we do now. There will put be an error. So I import Shapely geometry, and inside that is the class polygon. Um, you can use the same for the other things. For example, you could um, write um, a, 
a point or line string, linear ring, etc., and just do that um, here. Okay, so that's done. We have the coordinates. So let's construct this polygon. So I import it. I create my hexagon out of these coordinates. Yeah, and then I can display it directly in, in uh, Jupyter. So this is um, our hexagon. There is no coordinate axis here and there, with the scale, it, it's, it's used for debugging mostly, this, this view here. Don't, don't use that if you want to see it uh, really uh, uh, with the dimension and the size, etc. So we can call some things like the length or era, etc. There are many other um, things you can do with those um, geometries. Um, but let's create another polygon, um, something simple like a triangle. So I create this triangle um, with some coordinates. It's just inside this, this polygon from the coordinates. And if we uh, output it now, we see um, this one is much smaller than this um, hexagon and it's, it's displayed with, a wrong, with really a, a wrong scale. So what we can do is we can use matplotlib to have a correct scale, then you just uh, use the exterior. That's the most simple way. There are other ways you can um, use uh, some some shapes in, in matplotlib too. I'm not going to do that now. I'm just um, drawing my two polygons here. So the hexagon and the triangle. And we see the triangle as promised is inside this hexagon. So what we can do now from Shapely, we can call some functions like the difference. So I take the hexagon, I take the difference and this argument triangle, and then I get a new representation. That's a new uh, shape. We can also do an intersection, union, difference, and symmetric difference. I, I will show you the difference between difference and symmetric difference in a, in a second. Um, but let's just do that. Um, I will move this triangle a little bit more outside because it's not, not fun to have an intersection if, if we have a triangle inside. So I move this uh, triangle to be around here. And let's do the difference. And you see, no, it's not Pac-Man, but something similar. You see here is this part of the triangle, which is a little bit moved here. So we get a new shape if I take the difference. I can also take the intersection of the both then I get a triangle. However, this is this, of course, the intersection is this, this um, part here is this triangle. So that's the intersection. I can um, make the union here. I can um, have the symmetric difference. And now if we take the symmetric difference, we see I get this one. And uh, it's just uh, another kind of difference. Um, the symmetric difference just, um, takes away the intersection between the two shapes. And this one is a little bit special because this one is not one polygon. This one is uh, the result of here. It's a multi-polygon. So we have actually two polygons next to each other. Now we can um, write the well-known text out of it. We can store it as a new shape, of course, or just see how it looks like. And this representation is called well-known text. Here's a link if you are interested in that. You can look at that. I can actually quickly open it. You see some examples of polygons, how they are defined with this text-based representation. You can even load this again using this text. I'm not going to show that uh, now, but it, it's, a, it's a nice representation to have a text-based um, result out of it because text is, is in the geo world still a very important thing. Um, because it can't be printed, so you can print out your, your polygons and you keep it. That's, for example, important for country borders, so you can actually print them on old-fashioned paper if you, if you still think that's important. There are also some binary operations on shapes. I just show you this quickly. There are something like contains, intersects, within, equal. I just show you this triangle intersects, it intersects the, the hexagon. And this result, of course, is true. And uh, we could do that also with within. You can also uh, specify points inside polygons and all these things. What I wanted to show you now is, of course, this, this Shapely uh, library. And, um, and this Shapely library is, is, um, is used by many other um, modules. It's actually um, uh, quite a popular thing um, based on GEOS, the geometry engine open source, which is written in C, but I'm not going too much into this detail now. If you're interested in Shapely, you can um, 
check the documentation. I show you one more thing. Um, it comes with many, many, many different operations. And one um, uh, very important um, thing is triangulation. And if I take this hexagon, I triangulate it. I can specify some tolerance. And I can specify if I want to return polygon or line string. So if I do that, I get uh, four triangles, actually polygons, but it's it's now four triangles. And I can just display them with matplotlib and we see this hexagon or whatever shape um, I use is triangulated. So that's really quite handy if you need some triangulation uh, algorithm. As I said, there is much more in Shapely, um, but of course, um, due to the limited time of this presentation, I can't show you all. Okay, so, um, oh, I think this one is, again, I don't know why I put that, that's actually a mistake. So there is one more thing. Um, we can uh, convert this Shapely geometry to well-known text, and we can also convert it to something called GeoJSON. GeoJSON is a very popular format to represent um, geometry, to put it on maps. That's why it's called mapping in, in a Shapely. So this one is a GeoJSON representation. So we just um, remember that just uh, in contrary to the polygon, uh, to this well-known text, polygon, etc. It's same coordinates, of course, but it's a different representation. This GeoJSON is important. We will come back to that soon. The second module I show you today is Folium. Folium is used to um, create web maps. It's based on the Leaflet JS, so JavaScript library, but it has a, has a, a Pythonic interface and with two lines of code, actually, um, one line of code and the import, more or less. I could skip this um, M here. Uh, we can open a map. This one is a geographic coordinate. I will show you how it's uh, created in an instant. A folium also supports some thing called markers where you can put some markers here. Just add those markers to the map a position here and add what, what's here. I took two hotels in Zurich. And um, yeah, I can also change this icon. Um, I'm not going to show you the details here, but we could make um, icons here um, using font awesome. So you can have the font awesome. You could actually uh, change that, for example, to beer, and then you would have an uh, icon here with this beer symbol. There are uh, hundreds of different um, icons available in Font Awesome. You can also export this uh, created map to uh, HTML. Um, we'll show up here this map. I have to trust this one is just HTML, basically. This map. This is quite handy if if you um, have a web service, for example, and you want to create maps with with a search result, for example, or something like that. And um, yeah. Okay, so let's take our hexagon from before and put this one on the map. You remember I stored this as GeoJSON. Actually, let me show that quickly again. Um, GeoJSON. It was this one here. Um, and um, that's our hexagon in the GeoJSON format. And now Folium supports GeoJSON with the Folium GeoJSON um, function. And we can have our hexagon here. Maybe you wonder why it's located here, because we use geographic coordinates. The center is 0, 0. So um, yeah, that's 0, 0 here. And we had 10 degrees distance. And as promised, uh, the geographic coordinates 0, 0 is here. Um, plus 90 degrees would be here, and plus 90 in uh, latitude would be uh, on top here, and minus 90 down here. So it goes from minus 180 to plus 180 degree, and this represents our our map. Okay, so much about this uh, map things. So let me show you another uh, module called GeoPandas. But first, let me use pandas. I have a CSV data set here of all cities or big cities with a population of 5,000. Um, this one was downloaded from geonames.org. So uh, I can just open that with GeoPandas. We see that um, uh, it's too many columns. So let me just uh, reduce. I give the co some columns a name, and I reduce that one to the most important columns. So 
We have the name of the city, we have the latitude, longitude of the city, we have a population of the city, and the type of the city. This type is actually um, the kind of, of place. It's documented in geonames. I'm not going into details here. We can do standard pandas things here, for example, um, query Paris. We see there are many different Paris here. So let me um, convert this that only the, the PPLX things are the, the main uh, cities are in this data frame and uh, here only the main cities are, are here. So I remove this, these things. And um, now I can create a so-called GeoPandas data frame. Uh, basically, a very simple set, GeoPandas is just pandas with a, a column called geometry. And this geometry column contains um, a shapely geometry. So what I have to do is I have to um, convert this one in this case because it's not a geo format. So I create a point. This is a shapely point, so a shapely geometry point. And I use longitude latitude out of it and just create a column out of that one and set the geometry of the geodata frame to this geometry. It takes a couple um, of microseconds, whatever. And um, now we have this um, GeoPandas data frame with the you see your point um, inside. So let me drop that long because we don't need that one anymore. And what I can do now is um, just, um, yeah, I, I, actually I can plot this, this um, the points quickly. So we see in the data set, we have all the, the places here um, from this data set. Um, we recognize some, some things of the earth. So let me create a point. Um, I'm located in Basel, Switzerland at the moment. So uh, I create a point with the coordinate of Basel. That's the longitude and then the latitude. Be careful about the order. For example, volume um, requires it differently. So first the latitude, then the longitude. Um, and most other libraries use the longitude first and then the latitude. So that's um, yeah, how it is. So I can uh, calculate distance to this point. So uh, this one is a new row, actually, this, and I can just put it as a row in GeoPandas and um, display that one. Let me actually display that um, here first. And we see this one um, is, is now here, distance, just this is just distance to, to Basel. And we can actually, um, sort to that and we see this, these places are the most, uh, the closest one to Basel. So such uh, uh, queries are possible, of course, something very easy um, because we have pandas functionality that can do some normal pandas thing. So let me get all cities um, with a population greater than 5 million and with a quick uh, conversion, I can um, put them on volume, just going with so apply um, functionality here in pandas or geopandas. I create a marker on my map and then I just put the, the cities, our big cities here on the map. You see, of course, in China, we have many big cities. So I uh, yeah, can click here and see population. Okay, so um, here, uh, quick, I have four minutes left, so I have to hurry a little bit. Um, I can also download some live data. For example, here I download the GeoJSON from the USGS earthquake data set, which is located here. So I can just download that one using requests. Um, it should be here. Um, uh, and here we see the GeoJSON with all the earthquake information. Oh, let me go down and I can just import that one as GeoPandas files and with, with read file, GeoJSON is directly supported. Um, and if I display the head, I see this one is GeoJSON imported. Again, let me simplify it to the uh, columns which are the most important for us at the moment. So we have a timestamp, we have magnitude, we have place, and here we see the geometry. Um, there is something I didn't mention before. We have a point Z because we have a three-dimensional three coordinate. Here is the Z. Um, value, which is uh, in meters, um, usually, yeah, okay. So let me convert quickly. I can make a histogram here. This is basic panda stuff. So we see 
Luckily, we don't have really big earthquakes at the moment. Uh, so that's a good thing. One thing, one pandemic is enough. We don't want earthquakes now. So I can convert this timestamp to a more readable um, time. So we see this is um, uh, from December 5, so quite um, new data. And we can actually remove the timestamp here and then plot the, the earthquakes. However, this is not nice because uh, just earthquakes without a map in the background um, is, is not what I really want. So let me read this data set here. It's from Natural Earth. Um, it's, it's a public domain data set which contains all countries uh, stored as a so-called shapefile. So I can again with GeoPandas read that one. And now um, with, with matplotlib in the background of GeoPandas, I can just plot this one, store it, and use it as axis in the earthquake plot. So I can combine these two. And we see here countries black and the, the earthquakes red. I don't know why I chose these colors, doesn't really matter. If you want to display them with a different size, um, I mean, if you have a, a larger magnitude and have a bigger dot here, then we should use GeoPlot or another library, which is better suitable for, for this kind of visualization. I'm not showing that because I'm already running out of time. So well, let's quickly sort this. And what was the biggest earthquake recently? Yeah, 6.4. Um, this is UTC, so a couple hours ago in Alaska, so that and one in Russia. So 6.4 is quite um, high, but not that high. So um, I remember one time I had this in the presentation and then there was a, a magnitude eight just a couple of minutes before I made this presentation. That was quite, um, quite bad, yeah. Okay, so uh, some more GeoPanda stuff. Um, you can try this yourself with plotting. I'm skipping this because I'm running out of time. I show you one last thing with raster data. Um, there's a module uh, called Rasterio. It's based on GDAL, the Geospatial Data Abstraction Library, which is a C library, a very popular and very old C library. And Rasterio is a Pythonic interface to it. GDAL itself also has a Python binding, but it's really um, too close to C. Um, it's nicer to use Rasterio. So you can open a, a image, so a raster image. In this case, we have um, three so-called bands. There are some hyperspectral bands of satellite imagery. They have more than three um, so-called bands. But here is just RGB, um, and we have a width and height. It's a quite small picture. We have a so-called coordinate reference system. This means it's in geographic coordinates in WGS84. Um, and then we can check the bounds of this. So we see it's, it covers the whole Earth. There is a so-called transform where we can transform pixels to the coordinates. So for example, if we take pixel zero, zero would be minus 180, 90 degree. So it's a uh, top left and we can do the inverse. So we can um, transform uh, a geographic coordinate to pixel. So we, if we take this point from before in, in Africa, it's in the middle of, of the image. Remember, it was 3618, so it's in the middle exactly. And then we can take, let me take this, um, uh, my coordinate where I'm uh, located at the moment. Um, so this one would be the pixel coordinate of this. Okay, we, we can cut, uh, we can cut this one and convert to integer or round it up, doesn't really matter because the image is so, so small. Uh, we don't even need to round here. So let me read all the data, um, RGB. And then with NumPy, I can uh, call the DStack, so I can create um, RGB um, triples out of it, because in Rasteria, we only read bands uh, separately. This, this is very important if you have hyperspectral data, for example. And you can just plot it using um, imshow from um, matplotlib, and we see here the image and this one. Of course, we can do much more. We can, now we have the pixels. We could um, do some some uh, other calculations. It's just nice to have a quick way to present this. So uh, I'm a little bit over time already. Um, one small thing, something very new. 
I'm the organizer of a GeoPython conference. We just really recently decided to um, make a second online edition next year. GeoPython 2021 will be in April, end of April next year. If you're interested, you can uh, follow us on Twitter. Um, there is also a register interest button here. Um, and this is our new, every is, is the six, already number six of GeoPython conference. Every year we have a new um, logo here. And this one is quite the latest edition. Um, the web page is um, currently under construction. So um, you can go there, but it will just go to this register interest page at the moment. OK, so thanks for your interest. And I have hopefully time for questions now. Yeah, thank you, Martin. That's amazing. That's great. So uh, there is one question in the chat. So uh, Frankie asked, does Folium have the ability to use dynamic element or do I have to uh, do I have to use native leaflet JS to do so? In other words, without reacting the entire map? Yeah, exactly. There is um, actually it's in, in volume. It's not um, possible. There is another module for uh, leaflet. It's it's uh, integration into into. Um, I think I made the installation here too. I'm not sure if I deleted it. No, I actually removed it. There is a, a integration for um, Jupyter Lab. It's Pi uh, leaflet something. I have to look it up. Um, this is more dynamic, but um, volume itself is not dynamic. So um, unfortunately, um, it's really static. It's more for creating static maps, and you can't have moving uh, things in, in this one. But as I said, there is this other module, Pi Leaflet something, uh, which is a, a extension to Jupyter. I, I don't really like it too much in a certain way because my productive stuff doesn't really run in Jupyter. So you know what I mean? So I, I usually uh, stick with volume because of that, uh, or I would use native JavaScript. Right. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much. And then a really good uh, sneaky ad at the end for GeoPython. And actually, uh, I think it's a very good advertisement. And uh, maybe I will open a channel called Events Yet to Come uh, on this course. So maybe Martin, you can share more information about it so uh, people will know about it. That was so, great. Yeah, just uh, hang out in this court. And I, I believe that people may want to have a discussion or ask you questions uh, with you. So yeah, thank you so much. Thanks again. Yep. Bye. -bye. Bye. Right, so for our next talk, is actually a um, yeah, it's a recorded talk. Uh, so before I play it, I would actually go to, to uh, let you have a look at uh, what our sponsor. <laughs> I think you have seen it many many times already, but uh, why not play it again for people who just joined and uh, they may not have seen it? So there's a QR code that you should check it out. Right, so yes, uh, so yeah, this is uh, Moshi's talk and it's uh, about Pi Ham cost. <laughs> it's very interesting. Uh, actually, I've never heard about it before, but I'm sure that uh, Moshi can uh, tell us more. And uh, without further ado, I would now play the talk. Enjoy. My name is Moshi Zadka. My website is cobadizer.com. And today I want to talk to you about Pi Ham Quest, how to check exactly what you want to check. I would want to start with an acknowledgement of country. I live in Belmont, in San Francisco Bay Area Peninsula, which is the ancestral hom homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone people. So before we talk about how to check stuff, let's think about the context. What is a unit test? And, and that's a very, at times, charged debate. What is or is not a real unit test? So let's talk about the things that people think of when they hear the word unit test. 
so one feature that is very common in unit is isolation. They work isolated from the environment, isolated from the operating system, isolated from the network, isolated from other stuff. They're fast, right? You expect that your unit tests will finish quickly. And, and, and weirdly, this is the least useful thing, but is the reason that unit tests are named it that because they test a unit. There is a small system under test. There's a small part of the code that actually has to function correctly for the test to pass. And often that is the least useful feature of unit tests, so though some people care a lot about it. Um, and I'm gonna talk about how to write unit tests better. And these are the things that make unit tests unit tests. Um, but hopefully we all have them and we all want them to pass. So let's think about how, how they tell us stuff about our code. So there are many ways to write Python unit tests. You have first the runner. The runner is something like nose or PyTest or Virtue that will look for your tests and actually run them. Now, when you write your unit test, you have to write your test cases somehow. Some things like nose or PyTest will support just plain functions as test cases, or maybe just classes that look exactly the way. Some things um, lean more on having some support inside the code for unit tests, like inheriting from unit test test case or other test cases like test tools, test case. And finally, you, in your unit test, you wanna say what you expect to be true. Yes, just running the functions and checking that they don't raise exceptions is a little bit useful because they're not raising an exception. It's hooray, probably your code is not, you know, complete garbage. You probably didn't just bang on the keyboard and then check it in, but it's very little, right? Usually you wanna say, and that function returns three, or at least that function returns something that is greater than five or whatever. You want to assert things about the values coming out of the unit test. <coughs> I'm sorry. And we call those assertions because we assert that these things should true. There's many ways to assert depending on exactly how you write your unit test. Uh, for example, PyTest uses assert rewriting. So when you see the assert, um, you, um, the assert statement, it rewrites the bytecode to produce bytecode that will actually give useful data about the assertion. Unit test test case has assert underscore a whole bunch of things like assert equals, assert greater than, assert contains a whole bunch of stuff. Then there's like test tools, test case has assert that that is a little bit more flexible. And these are all the things you need. You need the way to run them. You need a way to write. You need a way to run them. You need a way to write the unit test and you need a way inside the unit test to say what you expect to be true. A lot of these solutions, as you saw, showed up in more than one place in my anatomy because they're all in one. PyTest, test tools, unit tests, basically expect to own all three parts, which is sometimes useful, but sometimes you want something you know more a la carte where you can pick and choose your bits and pieces. So you can choose an a la carte runner, like say nose or virtue, and the only library I'm familiar with, which gives you a la carte assertions, is Hamcrest. So what Hamcrest does, it doesn't care about test cases. It doesn't care about unit tests. It doesn't care about how you run them. All it cares is how to say what you expect to be true. And be because it focuses only on that goal, only on the goal of how to allow you to express what your expectations are, it does a pretty good job at allowing you to express what your expectations are. And I'm gonna dive into how it does that and, and how it can make your unit tests more precise. And I use the term precise, but I use it kind of imprecisely. What, what does it mean for unit test to be precise or, or to be good? So how do you measure the quality of a unit test? If, if I claim that this might make your unit test better, we need some metrics, some value to assign so unit test, what does it mean that a unit test is better than another? So 
there's two ways for a unit test to be bad. One is false alarm. And depending on which field you come from, there's a lot of other names. I find at least false alarm, you cannot mistake it. You know what it is. It is an alarm that is raised incorrectly. Um, so some people call it false positive. Then you have to remember that positive means that it fires, not that it's good. But false positive is a very common term of the art. And even more thing that you have to just memorize is type one error as opposed to type two error, which we'll talk to in a while. But you have to just remember false alarm is type one. There's no good mnemonic, except for the mnemonic um, that I'm gonna give you now, which is if you remember the story about the boy who cried wolf, um, when the first thing he does is cries wolf when there is no wolf, and that's a type one error. And that's asserting things that don't have to be true, right? Like you say that there's a bug, you say there's a wolf coming, you say there's a monster, um, you, you raise an issue, you mark the PR red, and there wasn't a problem. The PR was fine, the test misfired. So that's bad because you're wasting someone's time fixing a test. Well, if there was no test, they would not have to do any more work. Their code was perfectly fine. So this is not a good unit test. It does not give us value. Um, the other kind of uh, unit test that failure that can happen is missing alarm. Um, and again, depending on your field of studies, there are uh, different terms of art here. Um, you can call it false negative or type two error, which if you remember the uh, mnemonic I just taught him, the second part of the boy who cried wolf story is when the boy cries wolf when there's actually a wolf, but nobody believes him. So the alarm he raises is not useful. That's a type two error that like there's no alarm that nobody is looking for the wolf. Um, but the wolf is there and, and very dangerous. Um, and, and the bug in your code uh, is just about to be checked into production and harm uh, potentially a lot of uh, a lot of people who use that. So that's not good. Um, and basically, you can think of it as not asserting things that have to be true. If a function always has to return uh, three when it gets two and returns four when it gets two, we could have asserted it. We could have got, given it two check that it gave three, said it has to be three. Not it has to be greater than two, right? Because that would accept four. But if we expect it always to be three, or if we expect it always to be between three and 3.5, we can say it has to be between three and 3.5. And if we didn't do that, if we didn't make a unit test strict enough, then we have potentially let a bug through a unit test. And since they have one job is to prevent bugs, if, if I didn't care about bugs going into production, I wouldn't bother writing the unit tests, right? The only reason to write a unit test is to prevent the bug from going into production. So they, you know, like, like the the um, the alarm that doesn't uh, go off when, when a burglar hits the house, right? It failed in its only job, which is to alarm when something bad happens. Um, so that's bad. And I noticed that it's kind of weird because you can trade off between two, two, these two badnesses, right? If you assert very, very, very specific things, then you let very few bugs through, but you also fire on everything. And you can think of it as like the uh, extreme case is assert one equals zero. I can guarantee you that no bug is creeping past that unit test system. However, uh, there are also a lot of non-bugs that will not creep through this unit test system, they, all of them. Um, so that's not useful. And the other um, uh, extreme case is just not having unit tests. And I can assure you there will not be any false alarms. But on the other hand, like you're not going to catch any bugs in this unit test because they always pass. So um, when we talk about the quality, right, if we only concentrate on one, then we can just go the other extreme. We have to somehow say we care about both to measure the quality of a unit test. Um, and luckily there are already uh, metrics that measure while trading off uh, um, missing alarms and, 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 and false alarms or type one and type two errors. Um, and one popular one comes from the field of um, artificial intelligence and classification where it's very similar. You, you wanna say what you classify as 
you know, in the category, what is false, but not the category, what is true and what is false. Um, there you have an equivalent uh, problem uh, to solve. And they uh, came up with something called the F0, oh, sorry, the F1 measure, the F1 score. Um, and the generalization is the F beta score. So uh, let's talk about the F beta score. And so this is how we we'll measure the, the value of a unit, uh, unit test suite. Um, so you get beta. And beta is the trade-off term. If beta was infinity, then I care ultimately about missing alarms, but I don't care at all about false alarms, and I might as well just do a third one equals zero. Um, and if beta was zero, I don't care at all um, about um, missing alarms, but I care about false alarms, in which case I just don't write any unit tests. Um, so clearly, like, infinity and zero are bad values. One says that I care about them equally. So, uh, um, a missing alarm is just as bad as a, as a false alarm. Um, there's other common values too, means that you care about missing alarms twice more, twice as much, uh, false alarms. Um, and what I want to say really is that like almost no matter what's the beta, you want to see how you can improve. Now, if you're given a specific beta, you have a specific goal, but there are many things that can just improve the F score for all possible betas except for zero and infinity. And, and we should probably concentrate on those and not concentrate too much about how to trade off between them. But it is important to think that if you really want to measure the quality of your unit test suites, um, you, should, um, you should figure out how those two values matter for your development team and, and, and where would you put the beta. Um, and uh, the actual formula is, not super interesting. Um, this is a formula you can just copy it off of Wikipedia, um, or you can, uh, but then it's like mathematical notation. I transformed it into Python here. Um, but that's, that's a formula, right? Like you, you feed in the number of true alarms, the number of false alarms, the number of missing alarms. It's very important to count true alarms correctly. If you only count true alarms in CI, you're probably miscounting them because a lot of true alarms don't get to CI. They will get cut when the developer runs, say, something like talks on the local machine. So if you actually want to count, you should be very, very careful that you're counting the, the correct data. Uh, f false alarms are a bit easier because false alarm you'll see in CI because the test has to change. So any diff that touches a test um, that didn't have to be, that didn't have to change, that the um, overall interface didn't change, um, that's, uh, you can think of that as a, as a false alarm. Um, and a missing alarm is also kind of hard to measure, but you can think of any time you get um, a, a bug cut past the unit test suite, you can count it as a missing alarm. So it, it's it's possible to actually have this measurement as a, as a development organization or a development team and see where you are on the F score. Um, and, you know, like that might matter for your KPI. And I guess um, the reason I'm concentrating too much on that because I'm trying to talk about how to make unit tests better with Hamcrest assertion. And I, I, I want to make sure that I commit to a specific standard of better so I can't uh, um, equivocate. This is better. Better means that at least for a lot of betas, and, and again, like you have to think about your beta when you actually write assertions, but whatever your beta is, Hamcrest will let you uh, improve your F score. And usually you can think of just F1 score if, if beta is one. And that's probably like, unless you are very, have very, very specific constraints, that's probably what you should be aiming for at the, at the first approximation. Um, so I wrote a little uh, decorator called show assert because one of the cool things about Hamcrest is because it doesn't depend on unit tests, I can show, well, most of the time you write these assertions in unit tests. Um, my, my talk will not show unit tests uh, because I'm not, this is not talk about unit tests, this is about assertions in unit tests. So I wrote a little um, context manager um, called show assert um, that shows you the assertion errors and kind of formats them nicely. And specifically, it's like highly optimized for slide decks. So it does like weird formatting so that it will fit on the slide because sometimes you have to. Um, anyway, the, the most simple assert is equal, right? We, we can assert that one is equal to two and one is not two and properly um, uh, um, uh, Hamcrest will yell at us that it's expected to, 
and it was one. And I, I noticed that this is one of the coolest things about Hamcrest, and, and we'll see how it matters more with Hamcrest. There's asymmetry. Because what you got, which is a specific value, you, you cannot argue with that, right? You, you might not like it, but that's definitely what you got. You call that function with parameters, and it returned one. That's a specific value. However, there's the expectation. The expectation is not necessarily specific, right? Like in this case, it is specific. I, I want it to be exactly two. But the expectation can be two or three are okay, right? If, if you wrote it in, in, in PyTest, you can write assert one equals two or equals three, right? Um, or, you know, my, maybe it's close to, right? There's like all kinds of things that you can say that are not necessarily specific, that are constraints, but they're not complete constraints. Um, in this case, it is a complete constraint, but these are the symmetries. There's what we got, and then what we, we say about it in, in a lot of assertion libraries make them equivalent, right? If you think about assert in, um, in, in, in PyTest, for example, right? Assert X in Y. Which one is what you got from the test and which one is the thing that you're checking against? It's symmetric, right? But, but there's really two kinds of assert X in Y. There's, I got X from the test and it has to be in Y. And I got Y from the test and I know that it has to contain X. And those are different things to assert and you probably want to grade different errors on them. Um, so in PyTest, it's, it, I expected two and you gave me one and one is not equal to two and, and that's not good. Um, so, uh, like I said, containment is kind of interesting, right? I want to say that one, two, three has an item five, and um, it does not. So, uh, Hamcrest is annoyed and said, uh, I expected the sequence containing five, and you gave me one, two, three. That does not have five in it. Um, so, you know, said. <laughs> um, then there's you can also do assertion that one of two things is true. And in this case, I, I'm choosing equal to two or zero, but I can choose any two assertion and say, um, has to be, this has to be true. I, I'm not sure which one has to be true. For example, think of something that might or might not pass through a cache or something that might be dependent on a random value or value that's very hard to predict. Whichever is the case, you can still say, definitely one of those two has to be true about it. Um, then you can say, I, I want all of these to be true. And I notice that in this case, it's not that one and four will have any specific um, relations. One may be before four, four may be before one. In this case, there's no, just no four. And, uh, and you notice that it clearly tells you which part of the assertion was false. It expected both of these things to be true. And specifically, a sequence containing four was not. Uh, I think it was containing four, and that's very, uh, very unfortunate. And 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 by Hamcrest will will tell us exactly the problem. Uh, now the things are composable, so I can say that um, this sequence, which is a sequence of sequences, has item that has an item that has five. And by Hamcrest will correctly says I expect the sequence containing a sequence containing five and gave me sequence that all the sequences do not have five. So um, this does not pass the master. You can also say exactly what things there are. So for example, um, I expected a sequence containing one, two, and four, but item two was three. It tells you exactly which thing got wrong. Um, well, you can say, I'm not really sure what the order of things in that list, but definitely all these things. So. I expect one, two, or three um, to um, contain in any order uh, four, three, one, but um, that means that two uh, is not matched, meaning that I expected only four, three, and one, and I didn't get, and I didn't expect two, so I'm very sad. And um, Pi Hancrest is, is uh, commiserating with me, well, not telling me exactly what went wrong. Um, but one of the cool things of composability is that you can literally write your own Boolean expression. So you can write an X exclusive or. So let's write a little exclusive or. It's kind of a fun exercise. Why do I think exactly one of condition one and condition two have to be true? Right? They can't both be true at the same time. So I just say that both um, 
condition one and condition two. One of them has to be true, and um, one of them has to be false. And I, I can just compose it with not. So I literally have the ability to write really, really complicated Boolean expressions. Uh, this is just like a, a fun example. And I can say assert that um, one, two, three, exclusive or has item one, I hate item two. And it tells me, well, like the first part worked, but um, one, two, three is a sequence containing one. So it doesn't match not a sequence containing one or not a sequence containing two. And sorry about that, um, your test did not pass. So this is, again, uh, an example for like something very, very specific. The only thing I know is that it has to have one or two, but not both. And that's very common, right? You, you, you might say, you know, only one of the things in this sequence should, you know, um, should, 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 should be like, you know, kind of expensive, right? You can buy, you can buy an expensive thing and a cheap thing, but not two cheap things or two expensive things, right? So that, that's, you know, realistic in, again, depending on your exact flow. Um, and um, let's talk about floating point numbers. Um, so uh, we assert that 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 minus 0 0.1 minus 0 0.2, which looks like it should be zero, but it's not zero um, because floating points numbers are weird. And, um, but Hamquest knows that it's they're weird, it expects it. So it gives us an assertion that is close to, um, but I told it to be close to one and not close to zero. So it's almost one away. So even though it's a very, very small number, it's not zero. So if I had done close to equal to zero, it would fail, but equal to zero is the right thing. Or maybe I forgot to add another one here. Um, but but because the floating point numbers are weird, you usually want to check that they're approximately equal to something because it's very, very hard to constrain them to be equal to something exactly. Um, and then you can do stuff like string contains in order, hello world, I. So you notice that all the I's are after the world. So um, even though it looks like it should work, uh, it doesn't because the string has to contain them in order. And, and that's, you know, sometimes very important. For example, you can use it to check that uh, some uh, string manipulations are correct. And we'll talk about this a bit later. Um, you can also check dictionaries. So you can say, I want value to be close to 0 0.5 to within 0 0.3. But of course, one is a whole 0 0.5 away from 0 0.5. So it does not match. And PyHamQuest correctly fails our assertions. Um, by the way, all the assertions in this talk uh, will fail because I feel like this is like where the fun begins. Uh, not in real life. In real life, it's probably not fun, but in the talk, uh, the only fun we can have is uh, if we let the um, assertions fail. So one really nice thing about uh, Huntcrest is that it, you know, if none of the matches that currently exist satisfies you, you can write a custom matcher for any arbitrary condition. So let's first write a, a simple funny one just to kind of get our, um, our feet wet. Let's check virality. This is not efficient. Uh, I did not have room here to write an efficient algorithm, but this is the obvious algorithm for checking virality. We just go over and check if any of the factors, um, and we say that we expect the prime number. There's no parameters here because virality is just, we, we, we could have done like mutually prime, but I didn't want to do that. So is prime, return is prime. Um, so this is, are very common, and, and let's see how we use it. Um, we can assert that six is prime, and it tells if we exhibit a prime number, and, and, and we've got six. We could also have, like, you know, worked a bit more and, and say what's the factor is, but I don't want to um, get too complicated. Let's do a more interesting, because when, when is this going to come up? If you care about prime numbers, you probably already have great ways to, to work on that. Um, Let's do something that uh, matches whether um, a sequence has some items in this order, but you don't care about the other items. You just care that it has these items in that specific order. Um, so let's see. Um, so I, I couldn't write the whole class in one slide, so I'm going to have to do that so that we can build the class incrementally. Um, so 
uh, we build the class with um, a sequence of batches, and then I want to match the sequence one by one. So um, I take an iterator over the sequence, and, I, and whenever I match things, I move on to the next matcher. And if I run out of things to check, then I know that um, one of the matches didn't match, and otherwise I can return true. And when I describe, I just say there's a sequence containing thing, followed by thing, followed by thing, followed by thing, followed by, and then the last thing. So that's a description of, of the matcher itself. Um, you can also, like I said, describe uh, mismatches, but this is already getting uh, pretty long. Um, the last thing is you always want to make sure to, to do the wrap matches, and that allows people to do like sequence of one to three and not sequence of equal to one, equal to two, equal to three, which gets a bit uh, a bit long. So this is a very common kind of um, uh, quality of life enhancement to any common matches that the check recursively matching. Um, and let's see how we use it. Um, so we want to check that uh, 152 has items in order 13, which it doesn't because it doesn't have a 3 at all. Uh, and it doesn't have items in order to 1 because it has a 2 and it has a 1. But by the time it got to 2, it already discarded the 1. And you know that this is a DQ. Um, you can't access, you don't have random access to DQ. The only thing you can do is iteration. But because I build my stuff on the sequence interface, I just iterated over it. I can iterate over any sequence, so this this just works. Um, um, so the, the last cool thing I want to show is like a few kind of more realistic examples, slightly more realistic because it's pretty hard to show really realistic. But let's say that we want to check um, kind of complicated string output. So it tells greetings and the ultimate answer, and those things might change, right? Those things tend to change a lot, right? Like some someone says, oh, you know, like that. that you know, uh, um, you shouldn't say the ultimate answer. You should say the, the great answer. Something like that. Right? But I don't care about that, right? Like the strings are probably going to be correct. What I care about is the details. Do I calculate the details correctly? Um, and this is where a string contains in order. It just you know works great. So what I want to know, what I, I know is that I need. I want the user. After that, it has to tell it the answer, and then it has to tell it the important concept. Um, so here's how the function would work, right? Uh, greetings pajamas, the ultimate answer is 42. And if you multiply by 10, you get the important concept of 420. And what I'm going to make sure that um, I have pajamas, I have 42, and I have 420. Those are the important things that I want to make sure that I calculate correctly. So we just do, um, we, we check when we greet someone. Uh, whether the output contains uh, someone uppercase. And because we forgot the uppercase when we wrote the code, uh, this will fail and say it didn't work. Um, so this is um, this is an example for um, how it's really useful to show, you know, especially if you do any string templating, this is this can come in really handy. Um, and of course, you can combine assertions. So you can say it has an item greater than three or it has an item greater than less than one. Of course, it doesn't have any, so it, it fails. Um, you can do pretty complicated things with data structure. So you can say the hello greeting um, has to end with uh, with with, with a, a exclamation mark, but the goodbye must not. And um, it says the value for hello didn't match. The value for goodbye was absolutely fine. Um, so what are the takeaways? You should test what you're guaranteed to get. You should not test what you're not guaranteed to get, and Humcrest can help you tell the difference. But it's not per, it's not magic, and you still have to work. Thank you all for listening, and I hope that this will help you write better unit tests. Right. So it's awesome. So I always like to talk about tests because I am a person who loves tests, but who um, failed to write 
proper test of all the time. <laughs> so uh, we have reached the end of this session. Uh, now it's about time to take a technical break, which is uh, where we will resume in the next stream. Uh, again, if you're using our playlist, it's super convenient because it would just go to the next stream. Uh, it was the talk will start at half 7 p.m. UTC, which is uh, around 29 minutes from now. Uh, before you go, I want to let you know that we now have a competition. Yay! So. Um, it's uh, thank you, uh, Linux in London. Uh, they donated uh, two uh, JetBrain license uh, to to us for this competition. So we will have two winners who uh, can win a, a year worth of uh, PyCharm. Uh, it, it could be other things as well if you are using other uh, tools that you could also buy from JetBrain uh, with this uh, code. But uh, I guess most of us will be maybe interested in PyCharm. But PyCharm is worth uh, sixty nine pounds. Uh, I mean UK. Hi. So. Uh, 69 pounds per year so um it's a very good deal uh how to win so uh we will do it in a very uh, fair competition so all you need to do is to dress up in your favorite pajamas i i still have to get changed i will get changed during the break and take a selfie um take a selfie and then you uh, upload to uh to our discord channel we have a channel called pajamas showdown so you upload your selfie there and people can go and vote so vote with a thumbs up only thumbs up emoji will count okay so that the picture uh, the two picture got the most thumbs up uh the person who are in the picture or, or, and post it, I, I guess it's a selfie, right? So uh, you would win the JetBrain, uh, you know, prize and we will contact you via Discord to get it. So um, please uh, join it. It's a very easy to and fun uh, to join competition. So I hope you join it. And even if you are, oh, I, I'm, I don't feel like joining it, that's okay. Go in and vote. There's so many crazy pictures there already. So please go in, have a look and vote your favorite one. Actually, it's not limited how many you vote, but uh, of course, to make a difference, you have to pick uh, only one or two favorite ones. So um, yeah, so that's it from me. And now I will play uh, the ad <laughs> from our other sponsor, uh, Microsoft. Uh, they are very generous and have a lot of uh, free uh, lectures, free courses that uh, so you can uh, check out the information on their QR code. Uh, so make sure you check that because that may be a perk that you want. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I will play it and I'll see you in the next stream. Bye.